board is now in session. Ryan's ready to. Okay. Um, um, before I commence with the development review items, we do need to go into closed session for purposes of a personnel matter. So, for pursuant to the general provisions article of the Annotated Code of Maryland, specifically Article uh, Section 3-305B12 and Section 3-305B7. Um, we need to go into closed session to cons consult with council and to discuss a personnel matter. Is there such a motion? Um, move approval, Madam Chair. Commissioner Washington. Is there a second? Do I have a second? Okay, thank you. Um, 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 uh, Madam Vice Chair? <laughs> I need a motion. I mean, a, a vote. Ma Vice Chair? Okay, Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Washington? Aye, and I believe Madam Vice Chair has her phones on mute. Okay. Her, her mobile phone, if somebody can get to her. Okay, we are. Thank you. Um, thank you. Commissioner Geraldo? Is Commissioner Geraldo on? No. Okay. Okay. Can you? Can okay. You well. Actually, you know what? Unmute all, Kenneth. Okay. Okay, Commissioner Bailey, try it now. Commission, Commissioner, I mean, Vice Chair Bailey? I think she's saying aye. Okay. Video, like. We can hear Chair saying aye. Okay. It's not an aye. Okay. I don't think draw her on the line yet okay thank you all right so we're gonna uh, um, resume after at 10 o'clock for development review after we come finish with um, the closed meeting thank you and okay thank you I didn't know who had masks, and I was able to retrieve some, a few. Now I have them up. Them up. Okay, well then give me that. Hmm? Okay. Madam Board, uh, was, I, we need a, a motion to come out of closed session. So move. Is there second. A, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, uh, that's all, everybody. Aye. Okay. Uh, so we're back in open session. We need a motion to ratify the action taken in closed session. If, Don't if, move, Madam Chair. That's Commissioner uh, Commissioner Geraldo. Geraldo. Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Is there a second? Your Honor seconds. Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion, Madam Vice Chair. Unmute. Unmute. Hit unmute. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we hear you now. <laughs> we hear a little too much now. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll go to a, um, a Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Madam Vice Chair. Unmute. Hit unmute for a second. Commissioner, Madam Vice Chair. Her screen is muted, Madam Chair. Somebody needs to unmute her screen. I think she did that. They're saying. She just has to hit the right button. She has to hit unmute. Madam Vice Chair. It's on your head as, as on in the video footage. Okay. It is on mute now. Did she dial back in? Okay. Yeah, it's unmuted now. Yeah, she's unmuted now. 
Okay, for the moment, the motion passes 4-0. Okay, right. with, um, without um, Madam Vice Chair. Okay. Um, we, will, um, we will assist the Madam Vice Chair, um, but while I do that, I want to say uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Hewlett, and I chair the Prince George's Planning Board of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission. The Planning Board is now in session for Thursday, April 9, 2020. Out of an abundance of caution and adhering to the social distancing direction, directives resulting from the global spread of the no, novel um, COVID-19, this is the Planning Board's third virtual meeting use, utilizing online, phone, and video capabilities. During this, uh, these unprecedented and challenging times, the Commission is committed to promoting a healthy environment for the public, for our applicants, for our staff, and while we continue the business operations of Prince George's County. Um, before I begin the rest of my remarks, I'd like to take a, a moment to give a shout out to our planning staff, to um, our tech folks who are really enabling us to go forward, and we really, really appreciate them working with us so that we can go forward. Um, I would like to remind everyone of the new participation guidelines. All participants must pre-register to speak by 10 a.m. on the Wednesday, each Wednesday before the planning board meeting at pgplanningboard.org, pgplanningboard.org. Similarly, all materials must be submitted, the comments and supporting documentation, by 10 a.m. the same Wednesday before the planning board meeting via email to the planning board office. PGCPB at mncppc.org. That's PGCPB at mncppc.org. For the registered speakers and presenters um, connecting through a computer um, or tablet or smartphone, you can join the meeting with the link provided via email from the planning board office. Online participants may also be prompted to install GoToMeeting software to participate in the process. To listen or participate in the meeting using, using a phone line, participants may dial in the call-in number provided via email. I am asking, and I will ask repeatedly or occasionally throughout this, for all participants to please mute their phones when not speaking. If you are the person speaking, you can unmute, or we will unmute you, but do not. But everyone else must please mute. Uh, do not put your phone... Put your phone on hold. Okay, somebody is not muted now. Okay, so to eliminate audio feedback, make sure you have one connected device with sound should be in the room at the same time. Okay, so we're going to pause for a moment while we fix this echo. on the transportation, new transportation stuff. But Derek said we can't take stuff out of turn. Well, if he has to go, he has to go. Derek can handle it. Okay.
as long as somebody's on hold. Let's go. Someone back, back on? Okay. Oh, thank you. We were able to fix that. Okay. Um, again, um, so again, only one connected device with sound should be in the room at the same time. The public can continue to watch planning board meetings streamed live via HTTP colon slash slash mncppc.iqm2.com. Again, HTTP colon backslash backslash mnc ppc dot iqm two dot com. Um, if you wish to become a person of record, you may sign up on our online web by visiting pgplanningboard.org. Um, I want to take a moment to um, uh, indicate that we not only do we appreciate the, the flexibility and ingenuity of our planning staff and our um, tech staff here, but we want to thank everyone who's participating. That's the citizens, the public, the applicants, everyone who's working with us, the, the experts, um, everyone who is working with us in this new normal, which we hope is a new temporary normal. Um, but anyway, uh, we want to thank you for your cooperation and for your flexibility and support as we continue to move the functions of Prince George's County forward. I would also announce that we're going to take health breaks as needed. I'm the only one sitting here pre uh, presiding over this hearing, and as needed, there will be health breaks. Um, I also, we, um, also, we commence each planning board hearing with a moment of silence, so I'm going to do that. I'd like to first um, acknowledge the passing of Gail Francis, who was a longtime county employee and the former director of finance for Prince George's County, and just an awesome human being. We also particularly want to remember the ever-growing number of victims of this widespread COVID-19 virus. In the United States, we're hit, I think we just about hit 435,000. I think we're at 434,891 and almost 15,000 deaths. In, in Maryland, we have uh, over 5,000 and in Prince George's County, we have over um, 1,344 um, um, uh, cases, of confirmed cases and at least 32 deaths. It's just awful. We want to acknowledge the um, passing of John Prime, who was uh, um, one of America's greatest singers, songwriters, and a legendary country folk singer. Um, Wallace Rooney, Grammy-winning um, jazz trumpeter. Jay Benedict, actor known for Aliens. Um, we also want to acknowledge Earl, the passing of Bill Withers. The music industry lost so many. Um, he was a three-time Grammy-winning singer and songwriter as well. Bobby Mitchell, age 44, Hall of Fame NFL player, who was the first African-American to play for the Washington football team, um, um, which was the last NFL team to integrate. Um, singer known by the one-name moniker, Christina, whose song Things Fall Apart. Uh, hers was COVID-related. Um, actor Alan Garfield from the Cotton Club, Beverly Hills Cop 2, The Conversation. Uh, How uh, Wilner, 40-year SNL sketch music producer and Grammy Award winning, um, produced albums for others as well. Um, I said Butch Graves, the entrepreneur and founder of Black Enterprise Magazine. And uh, Maeve Kennedy Townsend McKean and her son Gideon, who, as you know, Ma Maeve was a public health official and human rights attorney, the daughter of former Maryland Lieutenant Governor Kathy Kathleen Kennedy Townsend and her son, and we know the story of how they were, they died in an unfortunate uh, boating accident. Um, and there are many, many others of which we are unaware. So I do want to, for, for those of you in our viewing audience, those of you who are participating, we extend our hearts 
and our sympathy to any of you who may have suffered a loss in your families or in your circle. May we have that moment of silence, please. Thank you. Again, it's the month of April. It is Arab American Heritage Month. Um, we celebrate all the contributions of those of Arab American um, cult culture background. Um, we also, it is also Autism Awareness and Acceptance Month, Landscape Architecture Month, Alcohol Awareness Month, Child Abuse Prevention Month, Emotional Overeating Month, uh, Celebrate Diversity Month, and Jazz Appreciation Month. Um, this is very serious because particularly with the Child Abuse Prevention Month and Alcohol Awareness Month and actually emotional overeating, these are things that we are seeing um, a greater incidence of during this COVID-19 crisis along with an increase in domestic uh, violence. So please, um, I'd ask that everyone please take care of yourselves. It's so very important to take care of your families and get outside and walk when you can, covered up with your um, cloth face covering. Um, but please get out and, and, and do what you can for your families and stay positive, stay hopeful, um, stay uplifted and do what you can because this crisis is not going away in the near future. And we want everyone to stay safe during this time and, to, and that means physically but that also means emotionally in terms of your entire well-being. Lift one another up and I, I just have to say that um, for the sake of everyone. I again remind everybody that it's um, uh, census. It's, it's imperative that we do that we have census um, that you complete your census form and you can go to my2020census.org and complete your census. That $363 million that we lost as a result of the 2010 undercount <laughs> and Prince George's County <laughs> was amongst the highest. $363 million, that money could have gone to help us with hospitals, to help us with first responders, to help us with transportation, to help us know how many people are in a particular neighborhood so that we could have sufficient resources for that very neighborhood. All of that money would have helped us in a crisis like this, even though this crisis may or may not have been unforeseen. So it is imperative now that we do not have that same problem. Please complete your census form. Um, with, uh, with that, I also want to do a, a give kudos to the Department of Parks and Recreation um, for their Grab and Go program because beginning this week, they're going to provide lunches for families and individuals in need Monday through Friday from 12 to 2 p.m. at three distribu distribution sites, Marlowe Heights Community Center, Oak Crest Community Center, and Glen Arden Community Center between 12 and 2. You come, you drive by, you grab your lunch, you keep going. So that's one of the ways that we're trying to help out during this um, uh, pandemic. So kudos to the department as well. Finally, um, I would just say, uh, is there, is there uh, anyone here who wishes to oppose the staff's recommendations on items for, on item 4D or any board member who wishes to do so? Okay, and also I, want, I do want to say happy Passover to everyone as well. Um, any board member who wishes to oppose the staff's recommendation on item 4B, 4D, excuse me, or any board member who wishes to discuss? And then, if not, I need a motion from one of our board members while everyone else keeps your phone on mute. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington. After consideration of the record for item number 4D, I move adoption of the staff findings and approval of the items on the consent agenda in accordance with the recommendations of staff. This, uh, this is Commissioner Geraldo. I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I'm going to do a roll call. Madam, um, Madam Vice Chair? Aye. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner uh, Geraldo? Aye. Okay, the ayes have it 4-0. Um, and what I should have done, but you can tell from there, I did to do a roll call to make sure that we have all five members, and we do. So we have all five planning board members, as you can see. I am now going to go, the, 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 one of the challenges with this um, virtual is that we have to load everything up, and we can't really switch things around. So although we have a 10 o'clock scheduled hearing, we're going to go to item five, and then do our item six, which is our scheduled hearing. Um, okay, so item five. Mr. Bishop, and then we'll follow by item six. We're going to go in order. Okay. And Good morning, Madam Chair. 
Members of the Planning Board, for the record, and her Bishop with the urban design section. Item 5 is the DSP proposing the construction of a new single family oh. detached dwelling unit. It should be noted the DSP is required to be approved by the Planning Board for a new dwelling in the Capitol Heights TDL. Next slide, please. You know what? Can we keep going? Can we keep going with those slides? Because this is, um, as I understand it, this is just um, the creation of, of of the one dwelling unit, right? Can, can we go past the next? Right. Go on to the next slide. And also, while you're while you're moving along, I was remiss in not doing um, going down the list of people who who we need to um, identify for this case. So Wesley Hackley, um, the homeowner, are you present? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Is, are, Hello. Is that Mr. Hackley? Okay. Is that Mr. Hackley? Yes, yeah, Mr. Hackley. Okay, I just yes. want to check that you're present and on. And Brian Barnett Woods, are you on? We'll say that again. Brian Barnett Woods, are you on? Good morning, this is Brian Barnett Woods. Okay, so you're both on. That's all I had signed up other than Jill Kosak. Ms. Kosak, are you on? Present. Okay, thank you. All right, Mr. Bishop, if you can continue with this one dwelling unit in in the middle of the block and okay let's go um, uh, so this is the the property is on the north side of balsam street west of park drive next slide please The property is in the R55 zone and within the urban neighborhood single family detached character area of the 2008 approved Capitol Heights Transit District Development Plan and TDO. The site can be seen here outlined in red. Next slide, please. Did it freeze? Next slide, please. The aerial shows the vacant site. Next slide, please. The site is generally flat and does not include environmental features. Next slide, please. This slide shows the master plan rights of way in the vicinity of the property. Next slide, please. This area shows the bird's eye view of the undeveloped site. Next slide, please. This exhibit is the site plan of the proposed improvements on the site with the new single family detached dwelling located at the center of the site. Next slide, please. The architectural elevations show the architectural character of the proposed building and staff notes that it is compatible with the surrounding homes that exist in the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So, um, Mr. Bishop, can allow me to ask you a question. So in this particular case, it's one single family lot in the middle of in the uh, in the middle of the block in the R55 zone in an established neighborhood and in the TDOZ. Um, it's a current. It's, we had no word from Capitol Heights. I don't know if we have it since then. Um, it it didn't quite fit the standard because it's not really capable. It does does not meet the standard of covering 35 to um, 75 percent of the lot. It's only 25.5 percent of the lot, um, but it's consistent right. with the neighborhood. And you can't, and even though the um, guidelines call for a sidewalk that's a one house in the middle of a block and there's no sidewalk to the left or no sidewalk to the right, so it wouldn't make sense to have a sidewalk in front of one house. So therefore, um, for all the reasons that you have set forth in your staff report and, and all of the analysis that you've done with regard to um, their um, constructions, uh, 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 their construction of the single family unit and the guidelines, um, we have your recommendations on item page 12 and 13 of the staff report. Was there anything else that you feel compelled to add at this time? No, ma'am. Thank you. Let me see. Uh, let me see if the board has any questions of you, uh, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, 
Unmute. Okay, while, uh, while we're going forward, um, um, Commissioner DeWarner, any questions? No questions. Uh, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Okay, um, Commissioner Geraldo? I have no questions, Madam Chair. Okay, um, let me see if uh, Madam Vice Chair is on and, and has any questions. I don't think she has any questions at this time. Um, Okay, so let me see. Let me proceed with um, Mr. Hackley. Mr. Hackley, do you have anything you care to add? I have nothing to add. Okay, uh, that concluded um, everyone on my sign-up sheet. Mr. Barnett Woods, did you have anything to add? No, nothing to add. Okay, and Mr. Bishop, was there anything you wanted to add? No, I have nothing to add. Okay, it, um, I'll entertain a motion from the planning board. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, and I would like to move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve the alternative transit district development standards as outlined in staff's report, items A, 1, 2, and 3, and approve uh, DSP-180 along with the subject conditions as outlined in staff's report. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Geraldo. I second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I'm going to do a roll call for the um, vote. Um, Madam Vice Chair? Okay, uh, Commissioner Washington? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Dwarner? Aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. The ayes have it, 4-0. Okay. Um, okay, so now we're going to go to um, item 6. Um, before I go, before I ish read my statement, my comprehensive design plan statement, I do want to confirm that I have all the people that I need for this case. So I'm going to start with Adam Bossi. Are you on? Yes, present, ma'am. Jill Kosak? Present. So for this particular case, since it's a comprehensive design plan, we are joined, I believe, by the um, People's Zoning Council, Stan Derwin Brown. Mr. Brown, are you present? Yes, I am. Okay, thank you. Um, Eric Key, are you present? Yes, I am. Okay, um, I, I think that's all I had for the sign-up on this, uh, for this case. So um, with that, I'm going to read my statement that um, this hearing is being held under the General Enabling Authority of the Land Use Article Annotated Code of Maryland. I need people to turn their mics off, though. Okay, so this is the comprehensive design plan for 9306-81 um, um, for Glassford Village, Lot 6, Block F, Key Project. This hearing is being held under, under the General Enabling Authority of the Land Use Article Annotated Code of Maryland and conducted in accordance with the specific requirements and procedures of Sections 27-516 through 532 of the Prince George's County Code and the Maryland Administrative Procedures Act. The purpose of this hearing is to consider the applicant's submission of a comprehensive design plan proposal and to consider that plan in relation to the criteria set forth in Section 27-521 of the Prince George's County Code. Um, all persons who wish to participate should have registered at this time. And for this particular case, we, we do need, um, I don't think there's anyone here to speak, but if, the, if uh, Mr. Key, um, in the presence of Almighty God, do you solemnly promise and declare that the testimony you're about to give before this board is the truth to the best of your knowledge and belief? Mr. Key? I do. Thank you. Um, I don't have exhibits, um, and uh, so, uh, and I will remind everyone in this case and in all our cases, we have so many today, I want to ensure that p people are not unduly repetitive. Um, that, so that we can get through all of our cases. We're going to ask for people to be mindful of their time and be as succinct as possible. Say, you, due process affords you the right to be heard, but not ad infinitum. So we want to make sure that you um, get the opportunity to be, be heard, but please be considerate and respectful of everyone's time. Thank you. Mr. Bossi, you're on. 
Good morning, Madam Chairwoman, members of the Planning Board. For the record, I am Adam Bossi with the Urban Design Section. As you mentioned, this case before you is Item 6, Comprehensive Design Plan CDP 0906-H1, Glassford Village, Lot 6. This is a homeowner minor amendment request to the CDP to allow for the construction of a deck within the portion of the rear yard setback of the existing single family dwelling. Uh, please also note that given the minor nature of this request, a resolution has been presented to the board to consider today, and that is item seven on your agenda. Next slide, please. The property is in southwestern Prince George's County in planning area 84, Council District 9. Next slide, please. Subject properties on the west side of Lightfoot Street, approximately 80 feet south of Poolin Street. Next slide, please. Uh, the property and the surrounding neighborhood are all in the residential low development zone. Next slide, please. There are no master plan rights away associated with the property. Next slide, please. Topographic map shows that the site is relatively flat and located within the middle of the existing neighborhood. Next slide, please. This aerial image provides a little bit greater context of the site's location within the Glassford Village neighborhood. Next slide, please. Similar to the last few si slides, this overall image of Glassford Village subdivision shows the subject site located in the middle of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. Looking toward the rear of the subject property, we can see the backyard area where the applicant is proposing to construct a deck. Next slide. Uh, the homeowner minor amendment request is to reduce the rear lot setback from 25 feet to 20 feet to allow for the construction of a 20 foot by 20 foot deck attached to the rear of the home, which is outlined in the red. Next um, slide, Mr. Bossi? Um, yes, ma'am. Mr. Bossi, in this particular case, we're talking about a 20 by 20 foot um, deck, and we have all of that in the staff report. It's very, very detailed, and you need that, uh, they're asking for the minor amendment to reduce um, the, reduce it from um, the 25 to 20 feet um, in terms of the setback and um, it's self-explanatory with all the um, documentation that we have in the staff report and that, that has been presented already. Is there anything else that you ha need to add besides the one condition that is set forth on page um, 8 of the staff report? No ma'am, that's all. Okay. Um, thank you. So the, so the recommendation is for approval with the one condition set forth on page 8. Um, um, does the board have any questions? Let me start with um, um, Commissioner Dorner. No, ma'am. Um, Commissioner Washington? No questions. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? No questions, Madam Chair. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure, Madam Vice Chair? Okay, so if there are no um, no questions, Mr. Mr. Key, do you have anything you needed to add? No, nothing to add. Okay, Mr. Brown, do you have any questions of either Mr. Key or Mr. Bossy? No questions, thank you. Okay, um, so therefore, is there a motion? I'll entertain a motion from the planning board. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, and I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve the minor amendment to CDP-9306-H1 along with the associated condition as outlined in staff report. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Geraldo and I second that motion. Thank you. Um, I'm going to call, was, was there any discussion? I'm going to call the roll. Um, Madam Vice Chair? She votes aye. I see her. She votes aye. Okay. Um, uh, Commissioner Dorner? I vote aye. Um, Commissioner Washington? Aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Um, the, the ayes have it 5 0. Thank you. And then we need item 7, which is the resolution for Glassford Village. Um, is there a motion from the planning board? Move approval, Madam Chair. Commissioner Washington? Commissioner, Commissioner Geraldo, I second that motion to approve the resolution. Um, we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion amongst the board? Seeing none, um, Madam Vice Chair? She votes aye. 
Okay, you can see her. Okay, uh, Commissioner Dwarner. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Thank you. The ayes have it five zero. Um, we're going to go on to item eight, which is um, um, conceptual site plan one nine zero zero two St. Barnabas Road mixed use. Before I do that, I was remiss in not mentioning that in addition to taking periodic breaks, we will break at some point for lunch. I will see how far we can get first. Mr. Okay, so we go to conceptual site plan 19002 St. Barnabas Road, uh, St. Barnabas Mixed Use, excuse me. I'm going to go do a roll call. Henry Zhang? Yes, ma'am. Jill yes, Kosak? Present. Okay. M Matt Tedesco? I'm here, Madam Chair. Good morning. Good morning. Chuck Schneider? I'm here. Thank you. I'm here. Okay. Um, um, Tom Masog? Present. Ben Ryan. Present. Um, Nat Ball Ballard. Present. Alex Viegas. Present. Thank you. That concludes the sign-up list that I have. I would also note that there is one exhibit that was submitted prior to the deadline, and that is applicants' proposed amended condition. Okay. Um, all right. So with that, I'm going to go to uh, Mr. Zhang. front of you. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the planning board. For the record, this is Henry Zhang with the Nine section. The item A in front of you is a conceptual site plan uh, for up to 60 powerhouses, 250 multi-family dwelling units, up to 94,000 strong units of commercial retail. Excuse me, let me make sure everyone else turns off their mic and mutes it. Uh, Thank you. Okay, Mr. Zhang, you may continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, the site is located in Plain Area 76, Council District 7, and it specifically is located in the southwest quadrant of the intersection of MD414 and then Crayman Road. Uh, the site is bounded on uh, north, west, and east by the right of way of uh, FD414, Temple Hill Road, and Trayman Road. To the south, the site is abutting a junior housing and a single family detached home in the core or zone. This site is zoned MST through a zoning map amendment A 10047. And then the subject site is developed with uh, exist, existing uses. You will see it on the air map oh. uh, of some CSC zone uses. The proposal will demolish all the existing structure on the site. Uh, this CSC proposed a three phase development. You will see on uh, slide number nine which will consist of phase one multi-family up to 240 dwelling units. It's located mm -hmm. at the northwest corner of Bunbrook Road and Kramer Road. And then phase two is basically uh, up to 50 townhouse units. It's located in the rear of the side. And then phase three, uh, basically it's uh, commercial retail uses up to four to six hectares at the intersection of uh, FD414 and Pennsylvania Hill Road. Uh, you will see on uh, slide 11, uh, they have a illustrative uh, map rendering that just shows the relationship of the three faces and the specific layout of the site. Uh, uh, this is a CSC. Uh, this is done only for illustrative purpose. The uh, detailed siting and the layout of the site will be revealed at time of detailed site time. And then the last slide of this uh, of this show is basically uh, development quality images, which will sh which show you uh, the different quality of the commercial building, residential building, as well 
as the trade furniture. Uh, this, this, the You know what, Mr. Zhang, Mr. Zhang, yeah. I, I want to make sure that we're keeping up with you. So this is the slide you're referring to, and please um, call out the number of the slides. I'm going to ask that for everyone to call out the number of the slides so that people following with a hard copy can 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 stay with us. Okay. Okay. Thank I have slide number 14, which is the last slide, okay. which shows the development quality images uh, for commercial building and residential building. Uh, this. CSC has been reviewed for conformance with MXP zone regulations as well as site design guidelines. All the findings for approval of this CSC has been met. Detailed discussion provided on page, on page 5 to 13 of the chapter 4. Uh, this CSC in general conformance with Woodland Wildlife Habitat Conservation Ordinance. Uh, there are other uh, ordinance such as landscape menu and tree canopy coverage uh, ordinance will also apply to the site but they will be revealed at the time of the uh, DSC. Uh, no agencies opposed to approval of the DSC. Uh, their uh, comments have been provided on page 14 to 16 of the staff report. Uh, we receive the applicants uh, proposed minor revision to the condition number two that was submitted prior to uh, Wednesday at 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, excuse me, a.m., 10 o'clock a.m. Staff recommend approval of CST-19002 and type one trade conservation plan uh, with two conditions uh, stated on staff report page 17. This concludes the staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Zhang. Let me see if there's any questions. Okay, um, um, Madam Vice Chair? Madam Vice Chair? No, no question. Okay, I'll come back to her. Um, um, Commissioner Dorner? No, ma'am. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? No, the only question I have is there, and I don't know if this would be at the appropriate stage, is whether or not there's any provision for bicycle racks. Okay, we'll come back to, uh, um, can we, Mr. Zhang, can you answer that? Yes, uh, for the record, this is Henry Zhang with the urban design section. Mr. Gerardo, uh, the bicycle rack things will be reviewed at the time of detail pipeline. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, um, Commissioner Washington? Uh, just a clarifying question for Mr. Zane. Um, I did not hear him affirm whether he was in agreement with the applicant's proposed condition. Minor change. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, the staff had a discussion with the applicant and would agree with the changes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, there you are. Oh, okay. Okay, so let me, all right, so now let me go ahead and see, um, Mr. Tedesco? All right, uh, Matthew Tedesco on behalf of uh, the I have the speaker on, I uh, have my microphone no. muted because I don't want to hear me either. <laughs> Wayne has, because she's over there having herself. Okay. Okay, Mr. Tedesco, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. For the record, Matthew Tedesco, on behalf of the owner and applicant, 1323 East Street, Southeast LLC. Um, with me this morning is uh, members of the Rogers. Okay, somebody has their somebody has their mic on. Please, everyone else, please mute. Please mute. Call, caller 22, whoever that is. Do we know who that yep. is? That's who? Mark? Okay. Mark? Okay. Sure. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, thank you. Mr. Uh, with, with, with me this morning. <laughs> Members of the Rogers consulting team, Mr. Alex Villegas and Nat Ballard. Uh, Madam Chair, we don't have anything more to add to Mr. Zhang's presentation and staff report. We are in agreement with the staff recommendations as well as the um, recommendations for conditions with the minor 
very minor change um, to condition two with respect to adding the uh, consider the following language that's been presented to staff in an agreement. And with that, Madam Chair, we're happy to answer any questions, but we would uh, respectfully request that the board approve this conceptual site plan with the change to condition two, and that we would just also ask that um, in addition, the time of the resolution that any findings that need to be modified pursuant to that revision to condition two be made with the resolution, which we have shared with staff, although did not memorialize in exhibit one. Okay, so it, 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 it's, it's very limited because the change is so minor. It just says that, the, so it went from at the time of detailed site plan, the applicant shall, and instead of, uh, and instead of ending there, you've added, shall consider the following, and it's the same conditions, and, it's, and that's fine. Okay, so I've, I've labeled your, even though it's timely submitted, I've labeled it applicant's exhibit number one for purposes of, of reference, and um, if with, so we have it. With that, was there anything else that you needed to add, Mr. Tedesco? No, Madam Chair, I'd just would like to, again, thank staff um, for its review of this application and, and certainly echo my thoughts, comments from the first hearing, which is to thank everyone at DRD as well as the Planning Commission for hosting these live planning boards. With that, we uh, respectfully request the board's approval. Thank you. Um, let me see if there's any questions from the board members. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington? No questions, Madam Chair. Um, Commissioner Dorner? No, ma'am. Commissioner Geraldo? I have no questions, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Vice Chair? No questions. A thing of beauty. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, so... <laughs> Uh, we're glad to have you. Um, no no question. Yes, very good. We're glad to, to hear you better now. Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, with that, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, and I would like to move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve CSP-19002 and TCP-1-003-202. Two zero two zero, along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and as further modified by applicant exhibit number one. This is Commissioner Geraldo, Madam Chair. I second that motion. Thank you. I'm going to um, do a roll call for the vote. Um, um, Madam Vice Chair? But aye. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Commissioner Washington? Aye. The ayes have it 5-0. Um, thank you. We're going to move on. The next item on our agenda is item 9, which is the specific design plan 1705 for Locust Hill Phase 1. I'm going to do a roll call for those participants on this matter. Um, Tom Burke? Thomas Burke? Hello. Okay, you're, so you're there, Mr. Burke. Present. Okay, thank you. Yes. Jill Kosak? Present. Mr. Antonetti, Robert Antonetti? Present. Um, Kim Finch? Is there someone on from environmental? Okay. Madam Chair, I'm here. I'm for environmental planning. Okay. And Kim Finch, you're there too. Is that you? Okay. So Kim Finch and Megan Riser. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Transportation, Noel Smith. Present. Glenn Burton. Glenn Burton is here. Okay. Thank you. And then we have um, Chris Rizzi. Present. Good morning. Good morning. Jeff Driscoll. Present. Matt Capiz? Present. Thank you. That concludes my list, my sign up list for this case. And also for our exhibits, we only have one, which is applicants proposed revised conditions. Okay? We're good. Mr. Burke, you are on. Good morning, Madam Chair. You can hear me well? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the record, I'm Thomas Burke with the Urban Design Section. Project before you is listed as item nine on today's agenda, specific design plan SDP 1705 for Locust Hill, which includes type two tree conservation plan, 
TCP 2-027-2015-01. The applicant is seeking approval for phase one only for the development of 285 single family detached dwellings and 53 single family attached dwellings. This application is for infrastructure and site development only and does not include architecture. A separate, a separate SDP for architecture will be submitted at a later date. Slide two, please. The site is located in the central portion of Prince George's County, County Planning Area 79 and Council District 6. Slide three, please. More specifically, the site is located on Oak Grove and Leland Road, just east of its intersection with Church Road in Upper Marlboro. Slide four, please. The site is surrounded on all sides by other residential zoning developed properties and by the St. Barnabas Church and Cemetery Historic Site to the immediate west. Slide five, please. This slide illustrates the pre-development conditions of the site. Slide six, please. The site is the site topography is shown here. Regulated environmental features are present on the site for which the application is proposing impacts to. Slide seven, please. The master plan right of way map identifies Leland and Oak Roads as major collectors show it and, and shows a realignment of the right of way which will be performed with the applicant with the development of this site slide eight please the development for which this application is subject of is shown here with the single family detached dwellings along the west and north portions and the single family attached dwellings in the southeast section this plan also shows additional areas of the site to the north of leland oak road grove road and, and the southern part of the property, which will be developed through approval of subsequent SDPs. Slide nine, please. This exhibit demonstrates how this phase may relate to subsequent phases regarding the circulation with the future circulation shown outside of the blue highlighted area. Slide 10, please. This site rendering illustrates the development of this phase and the areas to be preserved with this application. Slide 11, please. Part of this application includes refining the lot standards, which were originally established with the CDP. Staff found that these adjustments were in general conformance with the approved CDP standards. Slide 12, please. Uh, let's, that, that is not the correct slide. Is there a slide beyond that? No, I'm sorry. So. Going back to that slide 12, the, the type two tree conservation plan shows the areas of reforestation and preservation with this application, portions of which will provide a forested buffer between the development and historic St. Barnabas Church and cemetery property to the west. The plan also shows areas of PMA. This application includes minor modifications to impacts, which staff have found to be in general conformance to these previously approved impacts. Uh, the urban design staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve specific design plan SDP 1705 and TCP 2-027-2015-01 for Locust Hill Phase 1 with the conditions found on page 22 of the staff report dated March 24, 2020 and as revised by conditions to be provided by the applicant of which staff has reviewed and are in full agreement. This concludes staff presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, are there questions of Mr. Burke? Madam Vice Chair. No questions at this time. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Um, Commissioner Giraldo. No questions, Madam Chair. Commissioner Dorner. No, ma'am. Okay. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to Mr. Antonetti. Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning. Uh, for the record, my name is Robert Antonetti with the law firm of Ship Lane Forest. We we'll are pleased to represent the applicant, WBLH LLC, regarding the future Locust Hill project. Um, again, this uh, application is a, uh, is a joint venture between Toll Brothers and N.B. Ryan uh, to develop this site. Uh, it has numerous entitlement approvals uh, spanning all the way back to 2006. Um, with me on the phone, uh, or through this portal, Mr. Jeff Driscoll, Mr. Matt Capiz, on behalf of the WBLH LLC partnership. Are, are you visible? Are you Rich. visible? 
Not really. I'm sorry. Okay, never mind. I was just trying to figure out if you were vis- vi- uh, visible or not. Okay. All right, go ahead. All right, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, and uh, I have Mr. Uh, Mr. Chris Rizzi with Bowler Engineering. Okay. Uh, I do want to thank Mr. Burke and the staff on behalf of its review of this case. And, um, you know, it's really exciting for me to be, uh, one, to be uh, on this, this call today. I, uh, it's my first hearing uh, in a while. And I just want to commend the Planning Commission, um, the Planning Board, all the staff. You guys are doing a phenomenal job. And it's, it's, I've never been more proud to be associated with you. So thank you for everything that you're doing. Um, with regards to the staff presentation, uh, we do agree with the findings of, of the staff. Uh, this is a, an SDP for infrastructure only. There will be, and it's for phase one, there will be a phase two in the future. Um, the phase one infrastructures include the grading, utilities, and uh, lotting items and, and other things listed in the staff report. We'll come back with uh, architecture through a SDP revision as appropriate in the future. Um, with that, uh, I'll be I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, we we do again agree with staff recommendation. Uh, we do have exhibit. I believe Mark is asking exhibit one, the uh, proposed revisions as mentioned earlier, um, which uh, we are in agreement with staff or vice versa. And uh, with that, uh, we we're here to take any questions you may have. We appreciate your consideration, and thank you for your uh, pouring this case. Thank you. Thank you. I was trying to. Um, Last week, we were able to see the attorneys who were speaking. I can't, I can't see you this time, but okay. I see your name. Um, did you have it, Mr. Antonetti? Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Are there any questions of Mr. Antonetti? Let's start with the planning board. Madam Vice Chair? No questions. Commissioner Dorner? No, ma'am. Uh, Commissioner Geraldo? No, ma'am. Um, Commissioner Washington. No questions. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, let's see what that. Um, and so all of your other folks are just there for um, experts. Um, if, if we have questions, okay. So there's no one else to speak on this matter. Um, Mr. Mr. Burke, you had nothing else to add, right? No, Madam Chair, nothing else okay. to add. Okay, thank you. I'll entertain a motion from the Planning Board. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, uh, and I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve SDP-1705 and TCP-2-07-2015 one along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and as further revised by applicant exhibit number one. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is uh, Commissioner Geraldo and I will second that motion. Thank you. And uh, and thank you, um, Commissioner Washington, for reminding me because even though it was submitted in the record for purposes of identification, I, sh I did want it referred to and labeled as um, applicant, I mean, as applicant's exhibit number one, so thank you. Um, we have a we have a motion and a second. Is there a discussion? And seeing none, I'm going to do a um, call for the vote. Madam Vice Chair. I vote aye. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Um, Commissioner Geraldo. I vote aye. Thank you. Um, okay, the ayes have it. Uh, and at five zero. Thank you. Um, we're going to go on to item 10, which is preliminary plan 4-19029. I'm going to um, double check and make sure we have everyone we need for this particular case. Um, Eddie Diaz Campbell. Eddie Diaz Campbell, are you on? Sherry. Okay. Sherry Connor? Madam uh, President, uh, it looks like Eddie is on. Um, he. Oh, just I'm here, sorry. My... Okay, got it. Okay. So we have Mr. Diaz Campbell. We have Sherry Connor. Um, Arthur Horn? Present, Madam Chair. Okay, Michael Clay? Yes, I'm here. Chuck Schneider? 
present. Brian Barnett Woods. Good morning, Brian Barnett Woods, present. Tom Masock. Present, Madam Chair. Majette Parker. Present, Madam Chair. Um, Savag Balian. Present, Madam Chair. Michael Inhart. Good morning, I'm here. Thank, Thank you. you. That concludes the list of people signed up on this matter. We also have two exhibits. We have the stormwater management concept approval letter and the accompanying plan. And we also have applicants proposed revisions to conditions. And that is all I have that was submitted um, time before the 10 o'clock deadline yesterday. With that, I'm going to turn to Mr. Diaz Campbell for presentation. All right. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I am Eddie Diaz Campbell, Senior Planner with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. Item number 10 on the agenda is the PPS for Greater Morning Star Apostolic Church and the venue, 4-19029. The subject project proposes 90 lots and 18 parcels for 90 townhouse units and an existing church building. And uh, Madam Chair, you already mentioned the two items that we have uh, received for the record. Correct. Uh, and I, slide, and I, you know what, I am going to refer to the proposed um, revised conditions as applicants exhibit number one and the DPI stormwater management concept plan approval letter and the accompanying plan as applicants exhibit number two. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The site is located in the central part of Prince George's County within Planet Area 73 and Council District 6. Next slide. More specifically, the site is located on the north side of Ritchie Marlboro Road, the northeast quadrant of its intersection in White House Road. Next slide. And when you go to the next slide, Mr. Diaz Campbell, please identify, please call out the specific number of the slide so that everyone can follow. Thank you. Um, if you can. I don't see here the number. I can t I can mention the the okay. title of the slide. Okay, that's fine. Uh, that helps at least. Okay. Okay. Zoning map. Portions of the site are within the I-3, RT, and R-55 zones. To the north and west sides of the property is land owned by the MNC PPC in the ROS zone, the capital beltway to the west beyond. To the south of the property is Richie Marlboro Road, and to the east is a single family detached subdivision in the R-80 zone. Next slide, please. Aerial map. The area photograph shows that the site is currently occupied by a 22,215 square foot church and associated parking. These features are to remain. New development is to be concentrated in the southeast portion of the site. Next slide, please. Bird's eye view. This photo shows another view of the site from an aerial perspective. Next slide, please. Site map. The site map shows that the site has a varied topography but generally slopes downward towards the stream valley on MNC PPC property to the west. Next slide, please. Master Plan Right-of-Way Map. The Master Plan Right-of-Way Map shows Richie Marlboro Road, the Capitol Beltway, Harry S. Truman Drive, and several other Master Plan rights away in the vicinity. Uh, 0 0.01 acres of right-of-way dedication to Richie Marlboro Road is proposed to this application. The three critical intersections determined to be impacted by the development are shown by the bullseyes on, on this slide and are further described in detail in the staff report. All the needed road improvements were conditions with a, pre with a previous preliminary plan for the property. Next slide. Uh, preliminary plan of subdivision south. Preliminary plan shows 90 lots, 18 parcels, and one out lot, outlined in red. Existing and proposed rights away are shown in blue. This slide shows the southern portion of the site. Next slide, please. Early plan of subdivision north. This slide shows the northern portion of the site. It also shows the existing church building in yellow. Adequate public facilities, including water, sewer, fire, rescue, and police facilities, are available to serve the site. Next slide, please. Illustrated plan overall. This, this illustrated plan shows the entire site. Next slide, please. This illustrated plan south. This illustrated plan shows just the townhouse development. Next slide, please. Lot relocation exhibit. During plan review, staff expressed concerns about two groups of townhouses which would have their rears facing Richie Marlboro Road. In response to these concerns, the applicant agreed to relocate one group so it would be in front of the other one. The relocated group will have its front facades facing Richie Marlboro. Next 
Next slide, please. Park connection. There is, an there is an existing trail easement on site leading to Heritage Glen Community Park to the north of the property. The construction of the trail is opposed to this application. The Department of Parks and Recreation requested that the easement be realigned to create a more direct connection. The applicant has agreed to this, subject to any adjustments to the alignment being determined no later than the DSP. Next slide, please. Variation PUE. The applicant has requested a variation to allow omission of one of the public utility easements required along McCarthy Drive, the proposed public street. Staff recommends approval of this variation request as set forth in Planning 11 of the staff report. Next slide, please. Variation lot depth. The applicant has also requested a variation to reduce the minimum lot depth on, on Ritchie Marlboro Road and Arteo Road from 150 feet to 95 feet. To address traffic impacts, the applicant is proposing a firm and noise fencing as shown in this exhibit. The variation addresses lots located along Ritchie Marlboro and McCarthy Drive in the southeast corner of the property. Some of the lots in this exhibit are proposed for future development and are not part of the current PPS. A separate variation will be needed for those lots at, at the time of the future PPS. Staff recommends approval of the variation requests as set forth in finding 15 of the staff report. Next slide, please. Type 1 Tree Conservation Plan South. This application is subject to the Woodland Conservation Ordinance, and a TCP1 has been filed with the application. This TCP1 shows the subject parcels in red and right of ways in blue. The primary management area is shown in magenta. Woodland preservation, regeneration, and afforestation areas are shown in the hatched areas. A combination of these uh, management techniques is supposed to meet Woodland Conservation Ordinance requirements. Next slide, please. PMA impact, or sorry. Uh, this plan shows the, the tree, type plant tree conservation plan on the northern portion of the property. Next slide, please. PMA impact. One impact to the primary management area is proposed on the west edge of the site, as shown on this exhibit. Staff is recommending approval of this PMA impact as set forth in planning 13 of the staff report. In conclusion, Subdivision and Zoning staff recommends that the Planning Board adopt the findings and approve PPS 4-19029, Greater Morning Star Apostolic Church in the venue, as well as TCP 1-067-9702 and variations in Section 24-121A4 and Section 24-122A, the Subdivision Regulations, subject to the conditions contained in the staff report. The applicant has communicated proposed revisions to the conditions of approval contained in the report. Staff, concur staff concurs with the proposed revisions, which are included on the record. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Diaz Campbell. Let's see if there are any questions for you at this time. Madam Vice Chair? No questions at this time. Okay, Commissioner Dorner? No questions from staff, but just to kind of give the applicant a heads up, I would like to know a little bit about the historical preservation on the site um, and what they plan on doing to examine whether or not um, ask certain uh, parts of it have um, can kind of go back to historical periods. Right. Sure, but. Okay. Um, okay. Um. So that was a heads up. Okay. Um, Commissioner uh, Geraldo? Uh, I have no questions at this time, but I do share in some of the, co the comments of Commissioner Dorner with regards to the historical. Okay. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington? No questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Um, I'll turn to Mr. Horn. Arthur Horn? <coughs> Yes, Madam Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, uh, for the record, uh, Arthur Horn, the law office of Shipley on Horn, uh, uh, good morning to you and the members of the planning board. I'm here on uh, behalf of the uh, applicant, the Greenwood Park LLC, uh, representing uh, Mr. Sabah Ballion, who is on, on the phone with us as well. We also uh, have, as part of our team, uh, Mr. Michael Clay from uh, Gupchick, Little, and Weber, the building engineering firm. We have uh, Mr. Michael Lenhart, Lenhart traffic consultant uh, with us as well. And also uh, attorney Midget Parker from the law firm of uh, Midget Parker, who is actually the attorney for the 
uh, church, Greater Morning Star Apostolic Church, uh, who, uh, as you know, this application uh, is part of the property that the Greater Morning Star Apostolic Church exists upon. And uh, I'll try to, to answer the question that has been presented, but I will say that uh, this portion uh, it deals with this section, just a minor part of the, the overall site that the uh, church itself will be developing the rest of the site and uh, its parcel, parcel one. Uh, so they uh, have a lot to do uh, with reference to the historic portion, and that's coming in the future. Um, I will say that uh, this board actually reviewed the conceptual site plan in this case almost a year ago to the day, March, well, I guess it's a little over here, March 21st, 2019, where the conceptual site plan, we showed that there were uh, approximately between 200 and 250 uh, townhouses being proposed for that site. As many of you know, this site is directly across the street from the entrance to the West Vegas Town Center, uh, and, uh, I'm sorry, from West Failure as, as general. And uh, uh, it, uh, Mr. Ballion uh, has developed West Failure Road, which is uh, development directly across the street from this site. And currently, uh, this proposed uh, 94 unit uh, is in keeping with what is uh, already built across the street. As a matter of fact, I mentioned at the time of the conceptual site plan that uh, uh, at one time, this property, this entire property, was part of the West Failure sector plan. And uh, even though it was removed later, uh, the church and its members participated in the West Failure plan uh, as we were going through. So the development that's being proposed is, uh, being, is pretty much consistent with what is uh, already developed across the street with the townhouses at West Failure Row and and also there's some commercial across the street where the Royal Farm uh, is located. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, uh, we certainly uh, agree with the staff's uh, recommendation analysis. I want to thank Mr. Diaz Campbell from uh, his uh, analysis. Uh, we do uh, have some edits to the proposed conditions and uh, would ask that the board uh, address that. With reference to the historic, I don't know, maybe uh, Mr. Clay could add to that as, as proposal or perhaps Mr. Parker in the future with reference to what the Greater Morning Star uh, Apostolic Church may have in mind. But with reference to this application, um, you know, we, we're, we are, um, you know, uh, hopefully uh, at the point where this application could go forward as stands. As so, are you asking for someone to um, address the issue of the um, historic um, sites? And are you are you asking for Mr. Clay or someone to address yes. that, Mr. Horn? Okay, thank you. Yeah, if Mr. Clay wanted to add anything to that with reference to our development on that, or if Mr. Parker wanted to. Oh, this was this is Sam Bally. I may speak on that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Good Ballion. morning, Madam Chair and mm -hmm. members of the Planning Board. Um, this is Seb Ballion with Haverford Homes. And um, I'm glad I'm speaking um, on behalf of our company on this matter. Uh, this section of the property was previously um, disturbed significantly with uh, some. Um, some um, initial development that has already uh, occurred, and we've discussed that with the historic section of park and planning. Um, there was a lot of dirt movement in this front section. There are currently earth berms that were put in there when the church was developed, and uh, there were also, in the past, uh, WSSC pipes that were put in, which since then have been abandoned and removed. So uh, staff is very much aware that uh, the townhome section of the property uh, does not have any uh, significant historic value at this time because the earth was moved. Uh, and so for future developments, uh, just like any other subdivision in the county, uh, there may have to be a phase one study done in sections that have not been developed. Uh, but 
this section uh, was previously uh, had some development work on it and earth movement on it as such. Uh, historic aspects of the property, uh, the historical research and archaeology archaeology is still relevant to the entirety of the property, but not in the townhome section. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Ballian. Um, does that answer the question, Commissioner Dorner, for you? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I just wanted to verify that there was no areas in the townhome section that, that needed to be studied a little bit further than it's elsewhere on the subject property. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, with that, I'm going to proceed down. Uh, uh, Mr. Horn, was there anything else that you that you um, had to add? Uh, no, ma'am. I'm going to turn at this point to uh, 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 Mr. Parker. Okay. Uh, uh, other than... Uh, other than we agree with the staff recommendation with applicants exhibit number one and with number two that had come in as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, I don't think there were any other questions. I, I don't know if I asked uh, Commissioner Washington if there were any other questions. Uh, no questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Madam Ms. Chair. Yes. Madam, Madam Chair. Madam Vice I do Chair. have a question for Mr. Okay. Horn before you leave. Sure. Uh, Mr. Horn, do you have in front of you the letter dated February 18th, 2020 from, from you? I, apparently, I mean, I was reading this probably very late at night, and I'm trying to figure out something I probably should know, but on the nature of request, are you there? I'm, I'm with you, but I don't, I don't have the letter. It's in the staff report? <laughs> no, it's probably wrong. It's in the staff yeah. report? Okay. Okay, it's not that significant. I will. I'll probably ask you later. But there was a, a phrase I could not uh, figure out what that meant. So uh, it is not that significant to the overall proposal. Just out of, uh, okay, I don't. I'll, I'll, I'll remain available, Madam Vice Chair, to answer any questions you might have with that. Okay, I'll ask you later then. Thank you. Right. I wonder if it's your statement of, of um, justification, okay, or something. Okay. Um, Okay, with that, Mr. Parker, do you have anything to add? And, and, and whether or not you do, may I take this opportunity to congratulate you on the opening of your new law office? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Majette Parker from the law office of Majette S. Parker, PA, located at 5827 Allentown Road, Camp Spring, Maryland. I'm here on behalf of the, the owner of the property, Greater Morningstar Apostolic Ministries, Inc., um, and at 1700 Ritchie Marlboro Road, we um, are in support of uh, the majority of the conditions and support this particular application for preliminary plan of subdivision. Uh, we do have some concerns about the uh, archaeology, the cost of the archaeological studies. We are aware, as you know, the church developed it, purchased this property in 1998, developed it with a church parking. Um, open space, stormwater management, and several other features. Um, but we will look at those items when future development proposals come forward. Thank you. Does the board have any questions of Mr. Parker? Okay, so, uh, so that concludes my list of speakers, unless Mr. Schneider or Mr. Barnett Woods or Mr. Masag, you have something to add. Uh, this is Brian, nothing to add. Okay. Okay. This is Tom, Chuck, nothing, nothing Okay. This is Chuck, nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, if the board doesn't have any questions of anyone, we'll entertain a motion. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, and I would like to, and I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve preliminary plan subdivision 4-19029 ECP1-067-97 02 variation from section 24-121A4 and variation from section 24-122A along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report and is further revised by applicant exhibit number one. We have a motion. Uh, Madam Chair, second. Dr. Bailey. Commission, um, 
um, seconded by Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Bailey. Um, I'm going to call for the vote. Um, Vice Chair Bailey. But I. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay. The ayes have it five zero. Um, at this point, um, I'm going to take maybe about a 12 minute break, for a health break. I advise anybody else, wherever you are, you might. This is a good opportunity. Um, we have two cases that are, are going to be significant in terms of length. And then we have two that are not, so that's a, in terms of length. So I, I may see if I can take them first and then yes. proceed. But we, at some point, we will be breaking um, for lunch as well. We'll see how far we can get. So for now, we're going to resume at about uh, 11.35. Okay? Thank you. board members and see if everyone's on. Okay, Madam Vice Chair, there you are. Okay. She, Madam Vice Chair, present. Um, Jessica. Madam Vice Chair. Unmute, unmute. 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 Okay. Commissioner Dorner. Yes, present. Okay. Commissioner Geraldo. Present, Madam Chair. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Washington. Present. Okay. I see Madam Vice Chair. I think she's having a little difficulty unmuting. She's talking. Okay. Okay. So we're doing a roll call. Everybody's. Present. Yes, she's present. Okay. Madam Vice Chair. Go back. Present. Thank you. Okay, so we have all, all five present and accounted for. Um, I'm going to um, switch up the agenda for a moment. I'm going to go to item 13. Um, and the, I'm going to go 13, 14, 11, and 12. So 13, um, um, Mr. I, I have Mr. Hurl by Ms. Kozak, but it's a resolution. I don't have the applicant on signed up. So we have the resolution for um, Westphalia, um, PGCPB's 2020-47 uh, for, for detailed site plan 19009. Um, is there a motion? Mr. Hobart, was there anything you needed to add? Planning board members, is there a motion? Move approval, Madam Chair, item 14. Okay. The, uh, Commissioner Washington, second. Okay, motion by Madam Vice Chair, seconded by um, Commissioner Washington. I'll do a roll call, Madam Vice Chair. Not roll call, but vote on. Okay, Commissioner Washington. Vote on. Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Commissioner Geraldo. Aye. Okay, thank you. Wait, somebody said 14. It's 13, right? I said 13 and 14 I'm doing. 14 is the... Um... I didn't get to it yet. Oh, okay. I said I'm going to do items 13 and 14. Okay. okay. So I finished with item 13. Okay. So now we have item 14, um, which was um, continued from last week, the temporary policy for traffic counts collection and traffic study submission um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a memo that we all reviewed last week. It's been posted online now um, for the requisite time. And Mr. Barnett Woods and Ms. Mr. Maysog, is um, any a brief um, presentation that you need to make? Well, yeah, in fact, the church is already aware that they have one headstone that's remained undisturbed. We don't have any signage. No, on no, 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 no. Hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. An archaeological study when they go to develop. Okay. That's legit. I know. Mr. P mm -hmm. Mr. Parker, is he talking presently? Was that a recording? We passed this case. Right. Mr. Parker. Right. We put firms up there. We Mr. Firms Parker. Oh, my goodness. Okay. He didn't, um, he didn't get off. Okay, someone... Um, is Mr. Horn still on? Okay, it's a standard. No, okay, so turn the mics off. I'm 
doing it now. I just, I just did it. So just so you know. All right, can we try again? Are we back on? I'm back on. Okay. Um, Mr. Barnett Woods, we were, we were about to hear on item 14. Yes. Um, Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning, members of the board. I have a brief discussion uh, regarding the, the memo and resolution. Okay. regarding uh, handling traffic counts during COVID-19. Um, so we drafted this brief memo, and you know, basically what we've seen is with the closure and transition of remote learning for schools and universities, closure of public offices, reduced operating hours for businesses, um, there's been a substantial reduction in the number of motor vehicles and other traffic in the county. Um, our traffic review guidelines currently state that traffic data must reflect existing normal peak hour conditions at the time of the study. Uh, but in the, current, in the current environment, any traffic counts that uh, were to be collected would not reflect normal conditions. Um, we recently issued a DRT bulletin indicating to, to put a hold on uh, traffic counting and accounting for development. Um, however, we don't want to inhibit development for proceedings. Um, it's important to note that not all development allocations require traffic counts. Uh, for instance, CSP, CSP, Manford, Pearls, et cetera, don't require these. Um, We've been coordinating with the Maryland Department of Transportation, State Highway Administration, Department of Public Works and Transportation, and the Department of Permitting, Inspections, and Enforcement to develop alternative approaches for moving forward. Um, the first approach is something that we call the growth factor approach. Uh, this approach would allow an applicant to use traffic counts that would have expired under our current policy. Uh, for reference, in today's guidelines, if traffic counts are older than a year, then they've expired. Um, but under this new approach, we would permit traffic counts that are older than a year, but they would require a, a growth factor to be used. And so we would multiply those old counts to essentially bring them up to date. Um, this approach makes the policy assumption that motor vehicle traffic will return to the same levels from pre-March 2020 um, relatively soon. Um, and while it, you know, traffic will eventually return to those levels, it's not clear how long it may take. If it takes a much longer time, this may result in building more motor vehicle infrastructure than necessary, um, which can be just as detrimental as not building enough, um, especially in areas where TOD or transit or even development, walking, bicycling, and density are encouraged. Um, today, we do use growth rates in our current policy to add to background traffic. Um, essentially, historical data is used to extrapolate a growth factor, which is then added to the background traffic to help estimate total traffic in our traffic impact studies. Um, if we were to do follow this policy or this approach going forward, um, the growth factor we recommend would be developed by using historic count for data um, of the nearest state road uh, where they take a yearly count. Um, in discussions with uh, State Highway Administration, Department of or GPI, um, and Public Works, they've all recommended against using counts that are older than three years old. Um, please keep in mind that this approach would be useful for applicants that can't get new counts 
um, but have counts that are three or fewer years old. It wouldn't be useful for applicants that had counts that were older than three years. The second approach is something that we call traditional counts after a specified time. Um, this approach would require essentially a suspension of all traffic counts until a specific date, at which point counts and the submission of traffic studies using those counts would resume as a normal. Um, this approach assumes that there would be a new normal in which traffic lines don't return to pre-March 2020 levels. Um, using this approach will probably result in lower traffic counts than what occurred uh, last month, or I guess pre-March 2020, um, before or if the growth back were used. Um, and we're, it w would in turn result in less infrastructure built for development. Um, that being said, uh, traffic counts and adequacy determinations are a snapshot in time, and by taking counts at a specified time, we kind of maintain this principle. Um, this approach would suspend all counts until a chosen date, at which point all applications relying on counts could move forward. Um, if we were to look at a date, we'd recommend using September 10th. Um, September 7th is Labor Day, and Labor Day is generally the marker for where schools begin. Um, and September 10th is the first planning board date after uh, Labor Day. And this way, if we need to make a change or make an adjustment, um, we could do that at a planning board hearing. Uh, because of the August recess, we wouldn't be able to do that at, prior to Labor Day. Okay. Um, so we recommend kind of using the combination of the two approaches. Um, first, we wouldn't allow any new counts between March 15th and uh, September 10th. Um, if there are existing counts for critical intersections of a proposed development that are collected, um, within one year of the development, they can move forward as normal. And this is just what would be the normal, uh, normal situation, what we do under the existing policy. If there are counts that are older than one year, but less than three years, um, we would recommend accepting those counts, but then using a growth factor based on the historical averages of the nearest FHA road. Um, we would want to confirm this growth rate uh, prior to accepting that traffic study. Um, if uh, applications submit counts that are older than three years, those should not be accepted. Thank you. Um, and then lastly, um, any application that is located within the Brandywine Road Club, and that's planning areas 85A and 85B, um, we recommend that they be, they be permitted to submit traffic studies without traffic counts until September 10th. Okay. Um, these applications are subject to Council Resolution 009-2017, and so their transportation adequacy is achieved through uh, paying fees which go to already identified improvements. Um, so having their traffic counts taken um, ultimately results in the same outcome because they'll be helping to contribute to build these improvements which are already identified. Um, and that's what we recommend going forward. Uh, I think there's a resolution um, yes. as well, but if there are any questions, I'd okay. be happy to talk further. Let me see if the board, thank you, Mr. Barnett Woods. Let me see if the board has any questions. I think that's a, that's a great interim plan for this period because otherwise the ca traffic counts would be extraordinarily low during this time, which wouldn't give you an accurate, accurate, um, uh, tra you know, people might love it. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's not fair. And uh, I think this is, this is a viable plan to address that. Um, factor. And let me see if the board has any questions. Madam Vice Chair? No questions, but I'd uh, like to associate myself with your comments. It's very uh, appropriate that the staff would take this position. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Washington? Uh, no questions, and I also associate myself with your comments, Madam Chair and uh, Vice Chair. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, I've got a couple. Okay. Um, so I realize that this is kind of a hard thing to be dealing um, with right now. Um, the first question is just on the September 10th um, deadline. If if we if the stay at home or or whatever the technical term of the the decree is by the governor, if that's lifted, say next month on, on May 1st, and everything goes back to normal per se, um, as close as normal can be. Traffic counts that would be obtained in June or July for developments might not be that off. Um, so could we have some discretion in the policy that would um, have sort of a, a carve out or would staff just come back to us if the stay at home order is um, lifted? That way any kind of ongoing developments that don't have any traffic counts um, could actually go out and do those and use those in those cases. So that's my first question. I'll stop there. 
Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, yes. Yeah. So in the resolution, um, I think part four of it is a changing conditions may necessitate the review, modification, extension, or termination of the policy prior to the expiration date. So if um, things change and, and go back to normal much quicker than expected, um, we can make that change then, yes. Okay. Um, so another question on the growth factors. How how do you, it's just very vague, and there's a lot of discretion left up to, to our staff, which is fine. I don't think we necessarily need to pin everything down, but I'm sort of wondering, um, or we don't need to pin it down in this, in this memo that necessarily in the resolution, but I'm wondering how we're going to come up with those growth factors. So is this going to be like an average over the 10 year period from the nearest roadway? And then if that average is increasing, then you use sort of like whatever the, the, the increasing yeah. rate is to, to adjust the counts or how are we practically planning on doing that to get some indication to the applicants? So that, that's correct. Um, we would use the, the 10 year average of the, the nearest FHA roadway. Um, in the event that there's a negative uh, rate, um, we would recommend using a zero growth average or a zero rate of growth. And then what what are we going to do if, if there's a place that, that has like a big development that's come, come around and those counts potentially they don't take into account the new development and that's going to impact um, the applicant, how, what kind of discretion do we have or would the staff have to increase the growth factor by potentially more? Um, so I think if, if there were to be some new development that's proposed and it's not taking into account other, other factors, um, whether it's neighboring background traffic or something like that, um, by requiring essentially the staff to uh, coordinate with the public agencies as well as the applicant, uh, to confirm the growth rate prior to acceptance um, or acceptance of that traffic study, um, we would be able to make those changes if necessary. But that would be more of a on a case by case basis of, of some intervening event with a specific development. Which, which would be very hard. It, it, it's not very likely at all because um, it, it, we would have already factored in the background traffic from other approved developments. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, so but but the background traffic assumes that they actually have the traffic counts, right? So if, if they had a development and they haven't done a traffic count in the last year or two, then they might not actually take any impact of the background development. So the, the growth factor background counts would only be for uh, counts that were taken between one and three years, um, I guess from the time that they submit their application or it's accepted. Okay. Um, and then the so, kind of question is, so this is sort of a, a weird time in the pause and, and it may just be overthinking and, and we don't really have to worry about this that much, but have you thought about other sort of data resources out there like looking at ArcGIS or some of the open source things or looking at Google Maps to try and come up with other factors? Because I, I could see our growth factors being challenged later on and somebody coming in with something that seems reasonable um, and that's probably better data-wise. Um, will we have discretion to use other growth factors other than, than the SHA roadway? Hmm. So I think we could certainly consider um, what those other growth factors would be, but a lot of the other, um, I guess, uh, third-party observed data collected um, tends to use its own adjustment factors, which kind of introduce new assumptions. Um, so if there is something better, I think we can consider it. Um, however, I think probably for a more consistent approach, the SHA growth factors is probably going to get us better information. Okay. Yeah, no, I, so I, I concur that the SHA, I think, is a better authority in some ways as, like, the first pass. But then if we, if we have roads that have been built that, that haven't had any traffic counts on them and new neighborhoods coming in, um, this might be an appropriate time to give some discretion to the staff to... Um, allow them to consider other kinds of data sources, like like Waze or or maybe ArcGIS or um, some of the open source, like open data kind of um, software that could that could provide not exactly what we're used to using for traffic counts, but something else that might indicate that a, a greater growth factor or a different growth factor is appropriate. And, and I don't know offhand what the best source would be, or even whether the sources are reliable, but I, I think that we need to have a little bit of discretion potentially in these applications. 
can take that into consideration, yes. Okay. Okay. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, is there a motion? Oh, Mr. Geraldo, and please. Wait. Mr. Commissioner, Gir uh, Commissioner Geraldo, the, the, um, the, the question that I have relates to using a 10-year plan, a 10-year historical traffic. So that would mean going back 10 years, let's say it's for next next month, 10 years from that going back to 2010. Uh, yes, yeah, correct. So SHA uh, has permanent count locations. Um, and they're uh, regularly collecting data. So my only concern with going back 10 years is that that was at the, the height of the financial crisis and there was not a lot of development going on at that, that, at that time. And so I'm wondering whether or not a shorter period would be more realistic. That's a question. <laughs> this is Tom May. So, oh, oh, Brian, do you want me sorry. to jump in here? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. But Tom, if you'd like to, please show first. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, the guidelines, in terms of measuring historical growth, the guidelines already require that we measure that growth using a ten-year period. So we're really not trying to be inconsistent with anything that we're already doing. This is just to establish a growth factor and nothing more. Furthermore, the dip in traffic that we saw about 10 years ago was in the area of about 5% to 10%. Might have been a much bigger impact on localized roadways. But again, we're using the SHA count stations for this. Does that? that that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Are there any other questions? Okay. If, if the board has no other questions of anyone, um, and there was no one on the sign up on this, can we have a motion, please? Madam Chair, Commissioner, move approval of staff's recommendations on the two approaches as outlined in staff memo. Do you have a motion? Second. Okay, Madam Vice Chair, seconded. Um, I'm going to call the roll. Commissioner Washington? Approved. Madam, Vice, uh -huh. Madam uh -huh. Vice Chair? Uh -huh. um, Commissioner Dorner? Aye. Uh -huh. Commissioner um, Geraldo? Com Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, the, the ayes have it 5 uh, 0. Um, I thank our, our transportation experts for coming up with a policy that is fair, that is, um, does not you know, allow um, applicants to get away with tra the traffic counts during this time period because um, that, would, that would just be patently unfair and, 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 and inure to their benefit. So um, and that's not what we want. We want to make sure that um, we, we do a good traffic analysis. Um, for all the development proposals and that whatever requirements are um, needed um, and that that we that the applicant can um, will have to produce and have to uh, construct pursuant so long as there is an adequate nexus um, in line with all those Supreme Court cases. Thank you. Um, with that, I'm going to turn to go back to our other cases that we had. Um, we had items 11 and 12 they concern the same um, development, but they are different items. So I'm going to start with um, item 11 first, and I just want to make sure I, I do a, a roll call for the people who are participants on this. And then um, um, there, there are a number of, of um, applicants, uh, um, there are a number of exhibits too. So let me, Mr. Bishop, are you on? Yeah. Okay, Jill Kosak. Present. Um, Chris Hatcher. Present. Um, Chuck Schneider. Present. Brian Barnett Woods. Present. Hello. Yep, we're good. Tom Mesot. Present. Mark Ferguson. Present. 
Stephanie, is it Farrell or Farrell? Stephanie Farrell? Is her name on there? Okay, I'll move on to Glenn Cook. Glenn Cook. Okay. Um, I, I may not pronounce this correctly. Jignesh Patel? Uh, Did I pronounce it correctly? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Bradley Hurd? Thank you. Uh, yes, Okay, the present. Okay, I'm going to go back to um, Glenn Cook. Stephanie Farrell? Mr. Hatcher, do you not need, do you not need them? Uh, I think they'll be... I do need them for uh, item number 12. I think there will be less relevant for item number 11. Okay. All right, so we're going to go forward. Um, um, Mr. Bishop? Oh, wait a minute. Well, let, wait, hold on a second. I do have um, a legal counsel. Um, I, th I believe we have our um, principal counsel, David Warner. Is, is he present? Yes, I'm here. Okay, uh, and Deputy General Counsel, Deborah Borden? Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay. Thank you, um, and I do, and I don't. I also should have said it all earlier. We had um, the um, Parks and Recreation folks on the line too. Helen Asan, Planner Coordinator, and Paul Sun, Senior Planner, Park Planning and Development. I don't know if they're still on, but they've been on. As have our um, counsel. Yes, ma'am, I'm here. Okay. Madam Chair, I'm here, ma'am. Okay, Paul Sun. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, okay, Mr. Bishop. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the Planning Board. For the record, Andrew Bishop of the Urban Design Section. Item 11 is a DSP proposing to have a mixed use building including 192 multi family dwelling units and 11,000 square feet of ground floor retail. As a matter of fact, I'd like to point out that additional backup was submitted. Okay, hold on, hold, hold on, hold on a second, Mr. Bishop. I do need to mention that too. We do have a lot. I should have mentioned that earlier. We have a lot of exhibits, and um, and maybe you can go through them because we have a lot. And also, you're fading in and out. So, if whatever you have to do to adjust the mic, please do, while other people um, mute their mics. Okay. So, if you want to go through um, the uh, um, the exhibits, uh, or, or I can. Well, let me just tell you what I have listed here. I have, and, and in front of me, I have the updated corrected ver uh, updated version of proposed findings of facts and conclusions of law as submitted by um, Bradley Hurd. I have, um, I have uh, uh, Mr. Hurd's PowerPoint slideshow. I have a memo date from dated April eighth, twenty twenty, from our principal counsel David Warner to to uh, to myself for items eleven and twelve. I have documents from Mr. Hatcher on the Mark Ferguson resume. I have the land planner report. I have the Iman LNC, LLC authorization letter. I have a 2020, a 220, 2020 letter of support from the town of Capitol Heights. Um, I also have the uh, uh, February 27, 2020 letter of support from IRHSCA and a, a petition for support from change.org for items 11 and 12. Now. I will the, the thing I will address these bits of um, evidence as um, we we sort of go through them. But the one thing I will tell you about the petition of support is um, we, we will that I will tell you off the top. So I put my hands on it. Oh, here it is. That we um, this is the Banneker Ventures um, Neighborhood Development Company um, and, and that um, who, that are developing. Um, are the developers of Park Place and Addison Road Metro, and um, this and these people in Change.org are supporting the development. It's a huge list of people. I, I can't even begin to count how many there are. It's well over a hundred, maybe two hundred. However, um, I will comment on that. While we appreciate that they may be in support, or whether they were not in support, 
we do not make decisions based on plebiscite. So we will, the mere, the sheer number of people who have signed this petition will not influence this planning board either way, either in support or either in opposition. So I, so um, because that would be um, acting on the basis of plebiscite, and that we do not do, and we're prohibited from doing in accordance with the law. So I do want to comment on that. Okay. All right, um, Mr. Bishop, you want to add any any other documents? I'm, I probably have some more here. No, I, I don't need that. Okay. Don't need okay. Thank you. All right. I'm, I'm sorry to have cut you off. I hope you got the mic situation addressed. Um, so, <clears throat> with that, I'd like to begin with slide two, please. The site is in planning area 72A, Council District 7. Slide three, please. More specifically, the properties in the southwest quadrant of the intersection of Maryland 214 and Edison Road with frontage on Zama Avenue. Slide four. The property is in the CSC and R55 zones. Slide five, please. In addition, it's noted that the property is within the town commons portion of the 2000 approved sector plan and sectional map amendment for the Edison Road metro town center and vicinity and is outlined here in red slide six please aerial shows the location of the site which is outlined in red and shows the location of as road metro directly east of the property the entrance to the metro and the parking and the parking garage is located near the dashed yellow circle approximately 440 feet from the property and the center of the metro platform is shown near the orange circle on the area slide seven please the currently vacant site is generally flat flat and does not include environmental features slide eight, please. We cannot hear Mr. Bishop, Madam Chair. You no, know, I'm getting ready to ask him. None. I think we lost him. Mr. Bishop? I, I'm still here. Okay, we lost you for a little bit. Okay, so, all right. If you, okay. if you can continue on on this slide, because if you said anything else, if you moved on, we didn't, we didn't move with you. So continue with this the, slide, please. Okay. The, the, currently, the, the currently vacant slide, site is generally flattened, does not include environmental features. Slide eight, please. The master plan rights of way directly adjacent to the site include the arterials of Maryland 214 north of the property and Addison Road east of the site and are shown here in red. Slide nine, please. This slide shows a bird's eye view of the undeveloped site and looks north towards the intersection of Maryland 214 and Addison Road. Slide 10, please. This exhibit is an illustrative site plan of the property and shows the proposed improvements on the site. These include the proposed building and outdoor plazas along Maryland 214, the parking com compound located behind the structure, and access to the property from Addison Road, which is the subject of a pending reconsideration of PPS 4-05068, which is item 12 on today's agenda. Staff knows that the planning board's action on the request will not materially affect the layout and circulation shown on this plan. A condition of this application requires that prior to certification, the DSB note that the planning board's final decision has been made on the recommendation, or on the reconsideration. <clears throat> the application has been revised since it was originally submitted and is no longer proposing 55 parking spaces off-site at the Edison Road Metro Garage. A revised analysis has been submitted, which was included in your backup and is discussed on pages 12 and 13 of the technical staff report. Staff has reviewed this information and supports this reduction due to the application's location directly adjacent to the Edison Road Metro. Slide 11, please. 
The architectural elevations show the character of the proposed building with the ground floor commercial retail uses on the eastern portion of the building and the residential units above. Slide 12, please. Emphasis has been given to the variety of materials used on the facades through the different volumes and massings and architectural design elements on the building. Staff recommends the architecture's approval. Slide 13, please. The applicant provided this perspective rendering of the site looking southwest from the intersection of Addison Road and Central Avenue. The illustration shows the character of the streetscape, streetscape and the commercial plazas along Central Avenue and provides the applicant's vision for the development. Slide 14, please. The application is proposing a variety of different signage options. Slide 15, please. These include freestanding, channel letter, and blade building mounted signs, in addition to can canopy signage on the property. Slide 16, please. Staff finds the sign examples propose high quality, attractive alternatives, which will enhance the architectural character of the building and contribute to the overall atmosphere of the site, creating a sense of place. Slide 17, please. These, these signs will encourage the creation of a mixed-use development in the proximity of the Addison Road Metro Station and support the goals and objectives of the sector plan. Slide 18, please. The final slides of this presentation include the site details which have been proposed with the application. These include a variety of finishes in the plaza spaces and decorative fencing to enhance these areas. Slide 19, please. In addition to the details showing the site finishes, the applicant submitted examples of a proposed mural which is proposed to be painted on the face of the retaining wall at the southern boundary of the site, and public art which is to be located at the intersection of Maryland 214 and Addison Road. Staff has worked diligently with the applicant over the course of the review, and the applicant has reviewed the technical staff report and is in full agreement with staff's recommendation. The DSB was evaluated for conformance with the requirements of the sector plan, the zoning ordinance, previous approvals, the landscape manual, the woodland and wildlife habitat, and tree canopy coverage ordinances, and the DSB was found in conformance with this design criteria. The urban design section recommends the planning board adopt the findings of this report and approve detailed site plan DSB 06001 dash 03 TCP 2 013 2019 including a departure from the number of residential parking spaces, a variance for the removal of seven specimen trees, <coughs> and um, the conditions found in, in the staff report. The applicant will be proposing an amendment to the use table and staff is in support of this request. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Um, before I turn to see if there are any questions, let me do this because there were a number of submissions in this case. So I think we should give them a number. And so I'm going to go down my list. Um, first of all, I'm going to start with um, our own. I'm going to give um, uh, the memo from D um, David Warner um, to Chair Hewlett. I would just call it um, legal. Um, um, uh, um, staff's exhibit number one because I'm gonna just uh, uh, and then friends legal legal memo so that's what I, that's what that one's gonna be that's the April eighth, twenty twenty letter from Principal Counsel David Warner um, just leave um, um, staff exhibit number one because um, from legal and then I'm gonna go back to Mr. Hurd Mr. Hurd um, submitted. Um, I was remiss because there were three things I think he submitted. One was the proposed findings of fact and conclusion of law, his version. So that will, we're going to call that um, opponent's exhibit number one. Okay. The PowerPoint presentation, we're going to 
um, call upon us exhibit number two. And, and the other thing was there was a letter that was submitted on April 1st, 2020 from uh, Mr. Hurd um, addressed to me with um, of some proposed hearing, uh, proposed um, um, requests for um, the hearing, this, this particular hearing, and also item 12. So I'm going to mark that as opponent's exhibit number three. Okay. Um, the um, the Madam letter. Chair. Yes. Who is that? I don't know who that is. Uh, this, this is this is Brad Hurd for the record. Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, I just wanted to know. Uh, I just wanted to know that um, I guess what you have numbered um, exhibit one, which is the April seventh proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. Uh huh. Okay, so that exhibit references um, 37 additional exhibits, which have also been su submitted for the record. They're listed at the back of that exhibit. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I, I think I saw all of them in the back of materials, but I just wanted to know, and they're numbered 1 through 37, so... Um, oh, you're saying we but, needed but di can, different numbers? So I need to give... Uh, is that what you're suggesting? I would suggest labeling, if you're going to separately label those things, I would say 38, 39, and 40. Okay. All right. So, that, uh, okay, I'll make that change. So, I'm going to um, go in the same order. So, then your proposed findings, um, uh, and, and I may need legal and, um, and Mr. Bishop to confirm that we have everything that, that's at the back of um, Mr. Hurd's um proposed um findings of fact and conclusions of law so while i'm numbering these things can you you can confirm these that we have all this yes ma'am that was mr bishop yes it was okay and, and and this goes for everybody please identify yourself since not everybody can be seen so we're going to mark this as opponents exhibit number 38 and then therefore the powerpoint will be 39 and his letter would be 40 right okay now I'm going to go to um, the applicants exhibits so um, I'm just going in the order of let's see where are they so the uh, mr. Ferguson's resume I'm just going to do that as applicants exhibit number one the land planner report um, was going to be applicants exhibit number two um, so that's number two this is applicants number one I'm just Noting them. applicants number one, applicants number two. Okay. Um, the um, Iman LLC authorization letter, which is where? Oh, okay. Um, is that which one is that that's um oh okay that is um number three applicants exhibit number three um and then number f applicants exhibit number four uh will be the letter of support from the town of capitol heights applicants number five will be the letter of support from um, the Islamic Research and Humanitarian Services Center of America. So that's applicants number five. And then the petition of support for its limited pro probative value um, will be admitted as number um, six. Okay. All right. I think that covers the additional exhibits. Okay. Now let me see if the board has any questions of Mr. Bishop. Madam Vice Chair. No questions at this time. Okay. Commissioner Dorner. No, I don't have any questions. Um, because I, I think, and I'm not going to just ask for clarification just to be sure. Mr. Bishop, the, all the sort of the, the negotiations on the Central Avenue um, connector trail are, are done, right? Yeah, you guys came to agreement on everything? Yeah, yes, we did. Okay, bye. I think that's pretty important, so thank uh, you. Okay. 
Um, Commissioner uh, Geraldo? Uh, the only question I have, Madam Chair, is I did not see anything uh, or any reference to a bike shop. Okay. Some sort of, that's all. Okay, so let's, we'll have um, Mr. Bishop or the applicant um, address that, okay? Thank you. Okay. Um, Commissioner Washington? More questions, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, um, Mr. Hurd, when we get to you, you may have some questions as well of Mr. Bishop at this time. Uh, or, I mean, when, um, well, you may have some questions. I may have to turn to our legal counsel first. But I'd like to go ahead and have the applicant because in, in order of our, um, in, in accordance with our rules and procedure, the, the applicant presents next. So I'd like for them to go next. Sure. So, Madam Chair, this yes. is Brad Hurd. Uh, just to clarify, you don't want me to ask my questions of Mr. Bishop right now? You can ask. Your, you're, you're absolutely able to ask your questions, but I would like to go ahead with our um, the, the order the, of um, the order of testimony and presentations as in accordance with our rules of procedure. Now, if, if you have some, and then you will be able to address your questions. Okay? All right. Um, Mr. Hatcher? Madam Chair, Commissioners. Yes. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, Chris Hatcher with the law firm of Lurcher Lynn Brewer. Here on behalf of the applicant, 6301 Central Avenue, LLC. I'd like to thank uh, staff and the various community stakeholders that we've been coordinating with uh, for this, this very exciting project. Uh, the applicant is, is very proud to bring this vertical mixed use trans oriented inner beltway development uh, to this prominent corner uh, directly across the street from the metro. Uh, today, uh, we have with us the architect, the engineer, a land planner, uh, and uh, who, is, who are prepared to respond to any questions that you may have. Uh, uh, leading up to today and in the last few days, uh, after review of uh, the land planner's analysis, uh, the planning board uh, resolutions and the district council orders, uh, it, it became uh, the actions of the district council and some of its previous actions uh, aren't crystal clear with respect to whether they did amend the table of uses. Uh, so with, in an abundance, although we do think they did, however, in an abundance of caution um, and to ensure that uh, for clarity purposes, uh, the applicant respectfully requests that is part of the findings of fact and conclusions of law that the planning board make a recommendation that the district council to amend the table of uses to permit residential units on all floors of a building containing commercial uses. Um, with that said, uh, I, I believe uh, you've already introduced uh, Mr. Ferguson's resume into the record as applicants exhibit five, as applicants exhibit one. Correct. Um, and, and his land planner report into the, the re into the record as applicant exhibit two. Um, he's been qualified before this board many times, probably since I was the age of ten, um, as an expert in land planning and and in urban design. Um, and would like to uh, proffer him up to, to speak to the application and the required findings. Okay. Um, Ms. Mr. We have recognized um, Mr. Ferguson. You did not have to add that part since you were 10, because some of us were not. <laughs> um, but okay. Um, so I need to go back to what you, what your recommendation was. Your rec tell me, you were adding that the recommendation to go back to the district council to change the um, the use, right? Correct. Okay. Um, and then you want to go for, we, we have recognized Mr. F uh, Ferguson as an expert. Um, so we, um, um, please feel, so you ready for him now? Is that what you're saying? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and members of the planning board, Mark Ferguson with Site Design uh, Offices on Medical Center Drive in Largo. Um, you have uh, already indicated my land planning report is, is applicant's exhibit number two, and uh, it, is, it is lengthy, but I'm not going to go through it. I'm merely going to state that it is in the record to complement and amplify uh, your staff's findings, which, which I do agree with, uh, regarding the criteria for approval of a detailed site plan generally, for a detailed site plan 
in the uh, development district overlay zone and um, the criteria for approval of the requested modifications uh, that, that the staff has recommended approval for uh, in this report. Uh, with respect to the, the modification of the use table, um, Madam Chair, I have in front of me a uh, amendment to my report, which unfortunately because of uh, our procedures we can't get to you. Um, but it goes forward with the, it goes through the criteria for approval of the use table modification. And absent being able to email that right now into the uh, PGCPD email address uh, and have it miraculously appear in front of all of you, no. I'd like to go through those findings very briefly if I could. Um, you, can, um, you can testify a little bit. You absolutely cannot submit them to us. Yeah. Okay. 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 Then I will. I will uh, try to be respectful of your time and be brief, um, Madam Chair. There are um, there are actually two sections of the uh, of the ordinance which deal with the approval of amendments to the development district standards. Um, I believe that an amendment to the table of uses does constitute an amendment uh, to the development district standards, albeit it is an amendment which can only be finally approved by the district council. So the, the principal criteria for that are in 27548.26 B1B2, and that has three criteria. Additionally, there are three criteria for modifications to the development district standards which are approvable by this body, which are in 27548.25C. The three criteria in each of these sections overlap but aren't exactly the same. So both have a requirement that the uh, amendments uh, benefit the proposed development, and both of the sets of findings require that the amendments will not substantially impair the implementation of, of the, applicable, the applicable master plan. Uh, one set of those criteria require that the standards benefit the development district, and the other requires a finding that they further the purposes of the development district. So let me go through, so essentially there are four, when you, four findings of the, of the two merged sets of criteria. Uh, the first is that the, that the uh, amended standard would benefit the proposed development. Clearly, it would be a benefit because it would allow the development to, to go forward. Um, without allowing mixed use, or with, excuse me, without allowing residential units and all the floors of a mixed-use building, uh, this, this development cannot, cannot go forward. The second, um, it was actually the third in both lists, is that the, the requested modification will not impair the master plan. The applicable master plan is the sub-region 4 master plan, which actually amended the plan portions of the Addison Road Metro sector plan, but it did not amend the development district standards. So staff, in my opinion, has correctly reviewed the project with regard to the development standards in the Addison Road Metro uh, development district, um, development overlay, the develop, development overlay district. But um, but the master plan criteria are actually those amended criteria in subregion four. And I would I would um, testify, Madam Chair, that. Uh, the, the modification will, will not just not substantially impair, it will not just not impair, it will actually help to implement the recommendations, uh, the goals, the policies, and the strategies that are laid out for, specifically for the, what's called the Addison Road Metro and C. Pleasant, or the Addison Road and C. Pleasant Metro Station uh, in the subregion for master plan. So, um, it's a much, this meets a much higher standard than just not substantially impairing. This actually helps to implement those recommendations. Uh, the remaining two criteria are that the, the, the purposes, uh, excuse me, that the amended standards will um, benefit the development district and that it will fulfill the purposes of the development district. Um, I believe, as staff has testified, this is, this is a very key site. It's immediately across from the from the metro station, and having this kind of development, which the master plan specifically seeks, um, it, which is a very high quality development, and which actually will in, in, uh, involve 
public Im improvements to the public space in the form of the plazas in front of the development will actually provide a much superior environment um, and will actually be a, a, a uh, helpful focus of the town center immediately adjacent to uh, in, in adjacent to the metro station. So in that way, it will uh, it will benefit the development district. There are four goals laid out in the uh, Addison Road Metro sector plan for the development district, which are the nearest um, thing to purpose. There's no purpose statement, but those goals are reviving the town center with new upscale residential and commercial development. This modification will absolutely uh, further that purpose. The, the, the second goal or purpose is promoting transit-oriented development near the metro station. This modification will absolutely further that purpose. The third goal is to promote pedestrian-oriented development. Uh, this modification allowing this development to go forward will further that purpose. And you can see that particularly in slide 10, the illustrative site plan with all of the, uh, the uh, pedestrian-friendly improvements. Um, to the Central Avenue frontage. And then finally, the fourth purpose and goal is promoting compact development in the form of a town center with a town commons area at Addison Road and MD214 next to the metro station. And I believe you should agree with me um, that this, uh, this application will do exactly that, furthering this purpose of the uh, development district. And uh, that, Madam, Chair is all that I have, and I'm available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Ferguson. Um, let me first see if the board has any questions of you. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? No questions at this time. Commissioner Washington? No questions, thank you. Commissioner Dorner? No questions. I, I just think that at some point, um, either the, the attorney or um, one of his witnesses could maybe touch on the pictures that uh, Commissioner Geraldo had asked about. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? No and questions at this time, Madam Chair. Okay. I'm going to now turn to Mr. Hurd. Mr. Hurd, you have the ability to cross-examine uh, Mr. Ferguson in pursu uh, pursuant to our um, rules. Thanks, Thank you. Uh, yeah, and staff. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, um, Thank you. Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, Mr. Ferguson. Good afternoon, sir. Um, I just had a few questions for you. Um, first, uh, first, just on your um, on your CV, um, you indicated that you were a registered architect in Maryland and that you had a BA in architecture. Correct. That's correct. Okay, do you have any other degrees or professional certifications? No, sir. Do you have any formal training in law? No, sir. Are you offering yourself up as an expert in legal compliance? No, sir. Are you offering yourself as an expert for structural engineering? No, sir. What are you offering yourself up as an expert for? Uh, land planning and the conformance of the, uh, the the property as a planner to the criteria in the zoning ordinance um, and to the extent that they require an analysis of conformance to the master plan to that. Were you retained by the applicant? Uh, yes, I was. When were you retained? Approximately one week ago. So you spent one week with this file? Yes, sir. And what have you reviewed in your one week uh, with this file? I have reviewed the detailed site plan. I have reviewed the neighborhood of the site. I've reviewed the uh, the, the general plan for the county and its rec applicable recommendations, the, the master plan, uh, the subregion four master plan and its applicable recommendations, the Addison Road uh, sector plan and its recommendations. I've reviewed your uh, proposed finding of fact and uh, and law and your PowerPoint. I uh, certainly reviewed the staff report and the backup to that as well. Um, did, uh, and how are you being compensated for this testimony? Um, at my standard hourly rate, sir. Which is? Uh, $300 per hour, sir. Thank you. Um, now, let me also um, ask 
And let me and let me remind right. everyone that your know, cross examination is is should be is should focus on the things that were addressed in his direct testimony. All right. Um, and just, and just for the record, oh wait a minute! Too many people speaking. Uh, Who's, who just wait a minute? Who just jumped in? Who is that? Uh, Chris Hatcher. Chris, who is Chris Hatcher? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. And I, Brad. I, I know, but but I hear more than one at, at a time, and I'm just trying to zero in on who's. Okay, so Mr. Hatcher, did you just jump in? Somebody jumped in to speak. Yes, Madam Chair. I did just and you jumped in to do what to say what um typically uh typically i don't uh object to certain questions and i'm going to try to be respectful of everybody's time okay. but in order to uh preserve some rights on a potential appeal i do have to object to certain questions as we go forward particularly ones related to not related to the analysis that was submitted so when uh, mr ferguson was uh brought on how much he's compensated, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so you're noting an objection for the record for those questions when, when, when he, he, that were not germane to his testimony, when he was hired and how much his hourly rate is. Correct. And, and that you may have objections in the future, and that you're, you're giving us a heads up that you may have other objections. Okay, thank you. So your Correct. objections are, are, are noted for the record. Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Hurd. Um, and I would just uh, I would just respond for the record, uh, and I do understand, Madam Chair, that um, that the cross examination is supposed to be confined uh, to the to the testimony. My understanding was that the applicant was offering um, the entire um, land planning analysis document and uh, the CV as part of his testimony, and so I'm questioning him on that as to the. Um, as to the hourly rate and when he was retained and the circumstances of his um, appearing before the board, these all go to his qualifications uh, to be an expert. Um, his salary, I don't see how his, his I don't see how his salary um, goes to that, but you know, it's already in the record. He's already answered it. You know. And I, and I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just stating that for the record and his, um, and his, and his uh, potential, um, uh, for, for basis of his opinion. So, um, with that, I can move on, Madam Chair, unless you had other questions. Well, no, no, your question, I'm, I'm right now I want to continue with your questions of, of um, Mr. Ferguson at, at this point. Yeah. You, you still have Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and I think the only other substantive question that I have for you, Mr. Ferguson, um, is that you stated that uh, you agreed with the proposed amendment to the use table, um, which uh, the applicant's council just uh, made. Um, and that amendment would allow residential uses uh, on all levels of the building, is that correct? That is correct. Um, and did I hear you mention that, um, that you believed that this would not um, impede with the implementation of um, either the armed sector plan or the sub-region four master plan? Uh, what, what I believe I testified is that the, the applicable master plan is the sub-region four master plan, which has superseded the planning portions of the Addison Road Metro uh, sector plan, but not the development district standards contained within it. Okay, and you're aware that the building envelope standards in the subregion four master plan for storefront funded for storefront frontage buildings uh, prohibit residential uses on the first floor of buildings. Uh, well, no, that's that's not strictly correct. So the master plan is not a zoning ordinance. Um, at the time that that master plan was was prepared, uh, there was. Um, uh, historically, some uh, desire to uh, move projects that are in centers and corridors to what is called Subtitle 27A in the county code, which is um, the code that was that was uh, the urban centers and corridor node development and zoning code. So that was approved, but it's never been applied. So, so 
the, the recommendations in the master plan in subregion four are merely advisory. The applicable development district standards are those that are in the, uh, the uh, Addison Road sector plan. So are you changing your testimony that the subregion four master plan is the applicable plan for this area? It is the applicable master plan. That is correct. Okay, and what I had asked you previously was um, the building envelope standards in that plan um, for storefront frontage buildings prohibit residential uses on the first floor of buildings, correct? Well, a master plan cannot prohibit. It is a master plan. It is a guide. It is not a regulation. What does the regulation say? They're not allowed, right? No, there is no regulation that says that, Mr. Hurd. Uh, I object to any further questions on this issue. It's been asked and answered about three times now. It's also the difference between a master plan and uh, a master plan and uh, a sector plan with development district standards is analyzed by uh, uh, parking planning legal uh, in their five-page analysis, which is in the record. Uh, I. I, I've seen that, and, uh, but I'm, I'm entitled to make a record based on based on um, based on what this witness's testimony is. Okay, Mr. Hurd, let me let me just tell everybody here. I realize we have an applicant with a strong desire to go forward. I realize we have an opponent with a strong desire that they not go forward, and we're all going to handle ourselves professionally. And we're all going to be, we, we, you have the right to present your case, Mr. Hatcher. You have the right to present your witness. Uh, Mr. Hurd has the right to present his case. He has the right to cross-examine witnesses. Um, but we're all going to do this in a professional manner. And we're not going to be unduly repetitive because we're not going to be here till tonight. So uh, due, a due process affords everyone the right to be heard, but not in, ad infinitum. So we're all going to be respectful and respectful of each other's time. We're going to answer the questions as asked, assuming that they are not the subject to um, an objection. Um, and But we will move on. So, Mr. Hurd, I'm going to ask you now, was that your question answered? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think he answered the direct question, uh, but I think the uh, point is clear enough, and I can clarify it enough in my, in, in my presentation if necessary. So I don't have any further questions for Mr. Ferguson. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, thank you. Um, you will have the opportunity also, okay, to, to come back for others. Um, are you, were you finished with, you're not, were you finished, Mr. Hatcher, with your case in chief or no? Uh, pretty much, yes. Well, what, you still have a question on the table from um, our commissioner. Yes, we, yeah. So in direct response to the question from the commissioner, we do have a space available for bike share. We are currently coordinating with the provider to see if they want to um, locate one there. But we are accommodating a space on the site for one. Okay. And that concludes the rest of your presentation. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, with that, the applicant respectfully requests that the planning board adopt the findings of fact and conclusion of law as outlined by staff in the staff report with the rem with the additional recommendation to the district council that the list of uses be changed to permit residential uses on all floors of a all floors of a building um, containing commercial on the ground floor. Okay. So I'm going to now. So um, let me look at this list. So that concludes the speakers that I have for you. Then I'm going to then go back to um, Mr. Hurd. And Mr. Hurd, I'm going, I know you have a PowerPoint presentation, and I know you have some questions of Mr. Bishop. Um, I will tell you that we will also be breaking for lunch. Um, um, I, I think we can, hold, you know, we can probably hold off to maybe 1.30 for lunch. Um, and, and we'll see how far you get during that time. Does that work for everyone? Uh, that works for me, Madam Chair. Um, and, and if, uh, well, if that works for me. I, I, I'd like to ask my questions for Mr. Bishop uh, before I address the PowerPoint. You can do that. Uh, so this this is your okay. this is your this is your time now. So we will turn to you to um, 
for you can you have the ability to ask Mr. Bishop your questions and then you can um, proceed. But if you're not finished with your presentation, depending on how close you are to ending it, we will break for lunch. Okay. Okay, that okay. that sounds fine to me. Okay. Um, all right, Mr. Hurd. Um, for the record. Okay, so for, Mr. The rec for the record. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I'm just 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 re-identify yourself for the record. That's all. Oh, okay. okay. Uh, excuse me. My name is Bradley Hurd. Um, I live at 415 Zelma Avenue in Capitol Heights. Um, I'm an opponent in, uh, to this proceeding. Thank you. All right. Uh, I, I did have some questions um, uh, for Mr. Bishop, um, just based on a couple of things that I wanted to clarify in the staff report, and then I can move along to um, the PowerPoint. Okay. So, Mr. Bishop, if you're on the line, do you have the staff report with you? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, and hopefully this will be quick. I just wanted to clarify um, a few things for the record. Um, on page three of the staff report, um, you, have, um, you have indicated there under evaluation criteria A, um, that you uh, that you uh, the staff report is based on an evaluation of the armed sector plan. Um, is it correct that um, consistent with um, the information in the principal council's letter that you did not consider uh, the sub region four master plan or um, plan twenty thirty five? And that is correct. Okay. Uh, on page nine of the staff report um, with respect to um, your analysis of lighting um, you did not evaluate um, arm standard p5 as it relates to providing ornamental pole mounted street lighting adjacent to the property is that correct lighting and then Provide details for the proposed lighting on the site and are included in recommendation. Mr. Bishop, you're fa you're fading out a little bit. Yeah, Mr. Bishop, you're fading in and out a little bit. You you start out strong, fade out for like a second or two, and then come back. So let me please make the effort to um to be really clear uh, uh, if you can. Yes. Okay. Um. So, so Mr. Hurd, um, yeah, the site plan was evaluated by staff for conformance to the applicable regulations, and we can uh, we included conditions um, of the application to provide some of the uh, required details for the site lighting and building mounted lighting that are included as recommendations in the report. So, yeah, we did and we did evaluate that. Uh, so, do your recommendations cover um, the issue of providing um, street lighting along the right of way um, according to standard P5? Or is it just limited mm -hmm. to on site? It is, it is for on site lighting, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Okay, page, I think we just covered that in terms of they submitted their um, proposal for a use table um, change. So that covers my question with regard to page 10. Um, page uh, 11 of the staff report. Yes, sir. Under, under B. Um, so this is the, uh, the building siding and setback. And you mentioned in your report that it's uh, that the building is set back in some places, uh, 55 feet or so from the from the right of way, correct? In in the staff report, it says it has a very setback from 12 to 60 feet from the right of way. So 55 feet, yes, that would be correct in certain locations. Right. The the the, uh, the setback is not consistent, correct? Staff report says it's between 12 and 60 feet. Okay. So no, it is not uniform. 
Okay. Um, okay. And um, I think you are you you've got pulled up there uh, the uh, the uh, illustrative plan. So that's probably a clear um, example. Um, the 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 building um, is blocked from the right of way by fencing on the I guess the northwest side where the residences are. No, you had the right slide up, I think. Yeah. So in the northwest corner of that building, are you with me? I am. Okay. That there's a fence between the street and the building over there, right? In the northwest corner? That is correct. And it was a seven foot high fence that was originally proposed and you're recommending that it be reduced to a five foot fence. Correct. Okay. And on the eastern portion on the Addison Road side of the building, um, there's a wall between the street and the building. And then there's surface parking between the street and the building. Correct. From um, between the building and 214 or between the building and Addison Road? Uh, I'm on the Addison Road side. So between the building and Addison Road, um, the building is separated from the from the sidewalk by a wall and by surface parking, correct? There is surface parking in front of the building to start commercial development on that portion of the building, which includes the um, retail plazas in front of the building along Maryland 214. So yes, that is correct. So, and in addition to the surface parking, there's also a wall um, in front of the surface parking, correct? The screen, some of that parking, yes. Okay. And landscaping. Okay. Um, and your understanding of uh, what is your understanding of the WMATA line of influence? What is it? <clears throat> the line of influence. Mr. Bishop, Mr. Bishop, you're fading. You were doing great uh -huh. before. Okay, so come back. Whatever you did before was working. Uh -huh. Okay. You were doing golden before. No, 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 no. You, you cannot hear me. Now we hear you. Now we there hear you. Go. you. Okay. Um, so the the Wamana line of influence would it would be where the metro line goes underneath the the ground, and so the building step back from that. <clears throat> okay. Um, is it your understanding that the line of influence is the actual metro, or, or is the metro line a little bit ahead of that? Let, let me jump in here at this point, because typically when, we, when our staff does the staff uh, report, um, they're all professionals, um, but we also have input from others. So um, um, I don't know if, I know we have Mr. Masog on the line. I don't know if we have anybody else from transportation on the line, but just some of that, some information may or may not have come from our transportation experts. So, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, Tom Masog for the record. Uh, the Metro line of influence did not come from us. Okay. I don't know that term. Okay. Thank you. Chris Hatcher is here. Um, we're prepared to respond to this okay. on rebuttal. Okay, so let uh, I'll let Mr. Hurd finish. I didn't know where Mr. Um, um, Bishop got the, his information, but go ahead. Um, go ahead, Mr. Bishop, if you can continue to respond. So the WMATA um, line of influence is um, <clears throat> not the actual WMATA tunnel. Um, I'll let Mr. Hatcher respond to Mr. Hurd's question. Okay, uh, and let me see, uh, I think I just have a couple more questions for you. 
Um, on page 15 of the staff report, under 10C, with me? I am. Provide a standard okay. sidewalk along the subject site. The entire road frontage of Zelma Avenue, unless modified by DPW and T. Right. Condition. Uh, I'm jumping in here for yeah. a second just to make sure our board is following because you can see that on the exhibit there. Uh, you can see Zelma Avenue right there on, on our exhibit in the, in the northwest kind of corner. Okay. Thank you. Well, not just northwest, but the west. Okay. Thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Hurd. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I, so I just. I actually, um, I don't know, I, I actually would like to pull up um, uh, Exhibit 1 um, so that I could show Mr. Or, or if you have, so e if either whoever's running the exhibits over there, if they could just pull up my Exhibit 1, which is the civil plan. All right, let me see how we can do this because... Um as you know, we're operating a little differently, but they're... I, I, I got you. Yeah. I mean, I can share my screen, but I don't know if they want me to do that, so... Okay, hold on a second. Um, well, I think they're they're working on it, and... So, hold, hold tight. if I could suggest the easiest way would be to go to that uh, Dropbox link that I gave you all and pull it from there, but... That seems to be what he's doing, but, oh my goodness. Yeah, that, that's it. Exhibit one right okay. there. Is that what you're talking about right there? That's the, that's, that's the one. Okay. Looked a little so clearer on the other exhibit, but okay. I'm sorry? I was saying the other exhibit was a little clear, but okay, let's go with this one. Well, it is, but I, I wanted to ask him a question specifically about this, if he can, if he can blow it up so we can all see it. Uh, I don't know. So I'm... I'm, I'm I'm focused on um, if if you can that that part along Addison Road if you can blow that up. Okay, so Kenny to the right. So I usually use like seventy five or a hundred percent if you just want to pull down. Okay, hold that's on. the only way I can really see it clearly. And then you have to. Yeah, if you go back, if you go back up. Over. Okay. Sorry. Okay. I know this is a little, a little weird. Okay. Go back up a little. Okay. And if you can go over to the. Right. Over to the right. Okay. Just a little bit. Okay. All right. Right. All right. So, Mr. Bishop, what I wanted to ask you about, um, do you see this, this hashed out part over here around the sidewalk Mr. Bishop no the sidewalk is near the street I couldn't hear you Thank you. Can somebody hear him? I can't hear it. Yes. Mr. Hurt. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. This is Mr. Bishop for the record. So, Mr. Bishop, what I was yes. asking you about was that passed out part where, where the cursor is? Yes. Okay, what is your understanding of, of of what the developer is intending for that? So that that uh, the applicant has proffered to make that <clears throat> twelve feet in uh, accordance with the Central Avenue connector trail. That is my understanding. 
All right, but do you, you see this node up here? Sidewalk, green space, and connections from Addison Road and MD 214. I don't know if I can't even read it on that plan. Let me see. <laughs> Pull it on mine here. Uh, within dashed area to be constructed after the completion of MD 214 improvement by Elm Street development under, and then there's a permit number. Do you see that? It, it's illegible. There we go. You see that note? That's, that's what I'm really asking you about here is this note. Okay. What about it? Mm -hmm. So again, again, I'll, um, I'm going to ask Mr. Hatcher to respond directly to um, what? What that is, question. What is the What is the question? I'm I'm following what? along too. What is the question? So uh, what what I what I'm what I'm trying to ask Mr. Bishop is what uh, what the staff's understanding is of this note. Um, um, that's included on on the on this on the civil plan, and I think he said he's he's going to have to ask Mr. Hatcher what that means. Is that relevant to the case? Um, that that that's what you said, Mr. Bishop. That is what I said. Okay. Um. And let me go to page, um, you can, I, I want that, I want that civil plan later maybe, but I don't, I don't need it for right now. Um, so on page uh, 19 of your staff report, I'm almost done with you here, Mr. Uh, Bishop. Um, on page 19. At the bottom there, um, number three, are you with me? Number three, yes. The final plan for lot five of Block B shall be approved with the following note. Um, now, a final plan of subdivision usually requires a preliminary plan, correct? A uh, final plan of subdivision is done after the detailed site plan is approved. We do have subdivision staff online who can speak to the final plat process but his question, okay, his, question his question was uh, typically to get to a final plat you need a, approval of a preliminary plan not always no typically it's not always sometimes you don't always that's true but typically that's the question is that, was that your no, question that mr hurt so that so there is an approved PPS for um, this site for parcel A and uh, <coughs> where the building is located. I think he was asking generally. So generally, well, yes. And and specifically, there is no preliminary site plan with respect to lot five. Is that right? Uh, lot five. Excuse me, Mr. Chair. This is Deborah Borden. Ms. Borden, okay, thank you. I, I need to object to the form of the question. He just said, he just said the preliminary site plan. There is yes, no there's preliminary, such site, preliminary plan. site plan. That's true. Um, I'm sorry if I'm I'm sorry if I wasn't clear. Uh, the preliminary plan of subdivision. There is no preliminary plan of subdivision um, that is before the planning board for lot five of Block B. Correct. So the preliminary plans of subdivision uh, are outlined in the SAF report, and they're 4-05068 and 4-08019. Right. So 05068 is uh, relates to lot A. Correct. Correct. And the 08 number that I don't have right in front of me. 08019. Uh, Correct. That relates to um, parcel 87 where the surface parking is, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. 
That is correct. So let me jump in here. Is. I, I want to make sure I, I heard the question. I think what Mr. Hurd's question is, Mr. Bishop, is he asked if there was no, he said there's no preliminary plan of subdivision for of, of lot five of of, um, of of five lot five on B, right? Is, is that the question? That's the question. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, this is Sherry Connor for the record with the subdivision and zoning section. Thank you. Um, that is correct. That the lot five would be subject to re subdivision in accordance with uh, the subdivision regulations. Um, however, there's no development proposed on the lot at this time. In the future, if development is proposed on Lot 5, a preliminary plan of subdivision would be required. So, Ms. Ms. Connor, again, what's the meaning of this condition here that the final plat for Lot 5 of Block B shall be approved with the following note? That's a condition under under the previous uh, the previous detailed site plan, the um, the 01 revision. Um, what, what is the meaning of that? That's correct. Uh, with the prior detailed site plan, these conditions were applicable and the applicant agreed to re-record plats for, uh, for, for this lot and uh, parcel 87 and parcel A in order to clarify the development proposal and the development limitations that apply to the property. But you can't just re-record a plat. You have to file a preliminary plan first, mm -hmm. right? No, there is minor final plat process that the applicant can proceed with to file a final plat. Okay, and do you and, and do you understand have an understanding of how that would be permitted? Is there, do you have a reference? I mean, this is this is kind of an issue that that's important. Yes, minor final plat can be filed in accordance with 204108 of the subdivision regulations. Of the Prince George's okay. County Code? Yes. Okay, and, and, and 24108 is uh, the section of the subdivision ordinance that governs um, exemptions from preliminary plan requirements? Is that right? No, it does not. It governs minor final plats. Uh, so section 24-108 um, indicates that a final plat may be filed with the planning director and treated as a minor final plat for which no preliminary plan is required. And then it lists several instances. In fact, we're talking about the same statute, right? Correct. Okay. Um, what condition under there would this fall under? There are several instances that you can file a minor final plat. And in this case, it is to uh, it can be filed in in order to uh, correct a drafting or engineering error, in order to do minor lot line adjustments, uh, things of that nature. Well, what is what is the provision that the that the staff is relying on? The final plat can be filed to make minor corrections which in this case we're recommending in order to clarify the development uh, that is allowed on this site. I'm, I'm trying to follow. Chair, I'm trying to uh, follow. David Warner, Principal Council, yeah. can I interrupt for a second? Yes, because I was about to anyway. Okay, so you can interrupt because I don't think we have a final plat right now. And so I don't think it's our, our, our staff's burden to, to determine um, where it falls if we don't even have that now. Um, Mr. Mr. Warner? Correct. I was going to point out that uh, the preliminary plan of subdivision is not before you right now. This is a uh, consideration of a detailed site plan. Uh, I understand that. What I what I was trying to clarify is this is this is in the detailed site plan report. It's in the staff report for the detailed site plan. And I'm trying to understand what the basis is um, for the condition that a final plat shall be recorded um, without a preliminary plan. That's what I was trying to get from Ms. Connor. Okay. Is what what is the condition under which a final plat can be filed can be, can without be. a preliminary subdivision? Okay, so what, what, on on what circumstances a, a final plat can be filed um, without? Because that's a different question. I'm I'm, I'm going to turn to our, our uh, planning director. 
I'm Drake Checkley. Uh, this is a piece of the site plan on which development is not shown. And staff uses a condition like this in these situations to ensure that if development wants to occur on this por portion of the detailed site plan that is not currently showing development, it has to come back in. And that is the sole purpose of this uh, condition is simply to put the applicant and everyone else on notice that if development in the future wants to happen on this parcel, on this lot, it will have to come back in. And Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Corner. Um, I have a suggestion because we've just spent 25 minutes on, on things that it seems like Mr. Hurd doesn't understand about the legal parts of this case or things that staff have done. It might be more productive if he were to go offline and talk with staff about questions that he's not sure about or about how well, the laws or regulations well, work in the county. Well, and we can skip for lunch. He, well, what, mm -hmm. no, he can't. We can actually. We're in the middle of, of, of the case. I mean, he can talk a little bit, but um, um, we are in the middle of the case. And he does understand. He, he, may, not under, he may not have the same um, level of knowledge on, on land use, but he, he is an attorney and it does, know, um, it does know how to read uh, statutes and whatnot. But we have spent a, a, a while on this. What, it seems he was, I, it, what appears to me, Mr. Hurd, was that though you are very knowledgeable on a lot or, or have made yourself very knowledgeable on a lot of this in addition to the other aspects of law that you practice um you may not have been aware of the provisions for a minor um, subdivision you may or may not have that that's what i'm gleaning from from your line of questioning however um we, we do have a response from the planning director on this and um and if that answers your question with regard to that lot five um maybe we can continue to go forward because we're gonna, uh, we're we're gonna. My my original thought was to break for lunch after you had finished your um, PowerPoint, but I don't think that's gonna happen. But uh, you can so, continue. But I would like for for us to kind of move along. So so, Madam Chair, just to just to clarify for you and, and Commissioner Dorner, um, I have an understanding of what Section twenty four dash one hundred eight of the subdivision ordinance requires. Okay. Um, but I'm, I'm not here testifying right now. That's for later. What I'm trying to do is, is obtain the staff's understanding of what, of that, of that code section as it relates, um, to certain conditions that they have offered in this staff report. Um, and so that, that's really where, where I was trying to go and, and perhaps, um, <laughs> Perhaps my last question really on the last page of the report um, can really hone in a little better. It's a subdivision question, but I have an understanding of, on my own of what the law requires here. I'm trying to suss out what the staff's understanding is um, that, that accompanies the staff report, if that makes sense. Yeah, I guess I need some help from Ms. Borden or Mr. Warner because I, I heard you asking about what what would they have to show i mean what how um what would they in this particular case what would be the basis of approval of the of a of a final plat for something that has not been submitted yet and i it's like putting a burden um a pro a, a, a proactive burden on our staff to determine what that's the applicant's burden. If they come in with a subdivision plan, they gotta show they gotta show how it meets the criteria. That's not for us to say now before something has even been submitted. I, that's what I'm trying to get well, to. Madam Chair, uh, David Warner, Principal Counsel. Um, as I understand it, the, the planning director answered the question, so I would suggest that we move on to the next question. Um. <clears throat> Uh, well, maybe I'll, I'll take another crack at it, and this is my last question on the staff report, but it's another <laughs> crack at this subdivision thing. It's on page 32, 5D. I mean, because this, this is basically what the crux of it is. They're saying that they uh, submit a final plan, that a condition prior to approval, a condition of this detailed site plan that they're recommending is that to submit a, a final plan that consolidates the entirety of the land area that comprises um, the two 
previous preliminary plans, um, and and it says filed in accordance with section 24-108 of the subdivision regulations. And I'm just trying to f figure out from the staff's position what is the part of 24-108 that they're relying on. That's that's really the, the question. Okay. Well, that's what that is the part of 24-108 that they're relying on? Sherry, is it that? Yep. So this is this is Sherry Cutter again with the subdivision and zoning section. This would be pursuant to 24108, section 24108, A3 of the subdivision regulations, which allows the adjustment of common boundary lines or consolidation of lots. Okay, so that's 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 your basis for this for this condition. 24108 A3. Correct. Okay, thank you. That's 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 what I was trying to get at. Okay. Thank I you. I think that's all my questions uh, on the staff report, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I would next move to the PowerPoint. I don't know whether you you want to break before that or. It, it it probably makes sense to break for a little bit before that now because you, um, your power you have already indicated that your PowerPoint is long. We have it in front of us. Well, we have hard copies. Um, it, it is, but I, I don't. It's not so. It's not so especially long. I'm 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 surmising that it's your narrative that may make it the length that you suggested. But I would ask that you, I would ask that when we sorry, when we come back from lunch that you this is um, that you um, um, and I've and I've looked at it and I will tell you you know I've looked at it. Um, but I uh, I would ask that you be. Um, you know, say, present, because. But um, I would ask that you be succinct, and I will tell you there are a couple of slides in here. Early on, I'm putting you on notice that while it it, it refers back to an, an egregious time in our beloved Prince George's County, I don't know that it's relevant for this particular case. So I know I know I will put you on notice about that right now. Because right now we're looking at the case that's before us and not what transpired, I don't know how many years ago. Um, so, okay. Well, I'm just going to understand. Make, okay. Um, so, I, this prop, since we were going to break at 1.30 anyway, and your PowerPoint is longer than that, than, and it's 1.20, how about we break now for break, breakfast? Mm. <laughs> for lunch. <laughs> for lunch and resume at, at uh, 2 o'clock. So it's 40 minutes. Okay? All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, um, is everybody on? Let's do a roll call for our planning board. Okay. Um, Okay, I see, I see Commissioner Dorner. I see yep. I see Commissioner Geraldo and Commissioner Washington. Aye. Um, I'm uh, I I know Commissioner Bailey should be on momentarily. I guess uh, um, I'm here struggling how to wear this mask and be heard and not fog up my eyeglasses. That's a new problem, but um, so I can see. Um, let me, while we're doing that, let me see who, everyone else that I have, um, on this case. So, Mr. Bishop, are you there? Present. Okay. Ms. Kosak. Present. Mr. Hatcher. Present. Mr. Schneider. Present. Good. Mr. Schneider. Or anybody from environmental? I'm, I'm here. Okay. Present. Okay. Mr. Schneider. Okay. Okay, Mr. Snyder, okay. Uh, Mr. Barnett Woods. Present. Mr. Basog. Present. Mr. Ferguson. Present. Um, I don't know if Glenn Cook, I don't think he was on in the first place. Uh, Jignesh Patel. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Present. Ms. Um, Farrell, Stephanie Farrell, I don't think she was on either. Present. Oh, she Present. is? Present. Okay, good, okay. All right, so so I think we got everybody. Um, can we double check on Madam Vice Chair? And there she is. Okay, she's present. Madam Vice Chair. Okay, I see her. 
Okay, so um, uh, we were, Mr. Hurd had finished um, uh, his cross-examination of, of, of Mr. Ferguson and um, Mr. Um, Bishop, and he was about to go forward, I think, with his um, um, PowerPoint. Is that not correct? Uh, yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay. So, okay, so um, if everyone's ready, let's proceed. Now, now, Mr. Hurd, you heard what I said a little bit earlier. So we, we want to focus in on the things that are relevant. I can't, yeah, you know, I look through this PowerPoint. I know you understand what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, I'll try to walk gingerly through that, uh, uh, that uh, what you were saying. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll move. I'll move quickly through it. Um, uh, so, good afternoon again, Madam Chair um, and members of the planning board. Uh, Bradley Hurd again, for the record. Um, uh, thank you in advance just for your indulgence. I understand that this is uh, probably more of an opposition than the board is <laughs> is used to hearing. Um, so, I'll try to move uh, quickly through um, the PowerPoint. It, did not take as long as I had um, forecasted in my letter to you, so okay. it is shorter than that. Okay. <laughs> so that, that's good news. Okay. In any event, um, uh, I wanted to, let's just start before we move through the, the slide presentation. Um, I wanted to clarify that while I'm opposed to this particular detailed site plan application in its current form, I am and remain very uh, supportive of compact, dense, vertical, mixed-use uh, transit-oriented development at this site. Um, this site, um, as I'll explain, just does not, I'm sorry, this detailed site plan, as I'll explain, just doesn't comport with the requirements of the ARM development district standards. And when I say ARM, that's shorthand for Addison Road Metro. Um, it doesn't comport with the Subregion 4 Master Plan or the 2014 General Plan that we know is plan 2035. Um, it does not present essential improvements to adjacent and nearby rights of way to ensure pedestrian safety and comfort. And it proposes to waste nearly an acre of prime real estate directly across from Metro on a surface parking lot, even though the Metro parking garage has more than 600 spaces available uh, and unused for shared parking. So I'm requesting the disapproval of the pending DSP application proposing some instructions that would allow the applicant to achieve an approval. Uh, for obvious reasons, I'm, I'm, obvious Okay, reasons, hold, I'm, Mr. Hurd, hold on a second. Some, uh, somebody doesn't have their, yeah. um, somebody doesn't have their uh, mic on mute. So if everyone could please remember to do that, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. Please continue. Okay. Okay. Um, so, you know, as we mentioned in the beginning, I filed um, detailed proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. I will just restate and incorporate those by reference uh, so as not to uh, Thank you. Um, elongate the proceedings. Um, and if we can go to slide two, please. It's not an exaggeration to say that the uh, subject property, which sits at the southwest corner of Central, Addison, Central Avenue and Addison Road across from the metro station, is one of the most important development sites in Central Prince George's County. If it is developed properly in accordance with the applicable comprehensive plans, the site has the potential uh, to set an example within the county of what dense, compact, vertical, mixed-use TOD should look like. Um, We'll go to slide three. I will note it's there, and I will move I'll along. Slide, slide three. This is Chris Asher. I didn't hear what you said. Um, Chris. Okay, go ahead, Chris. Are you objecting? Uh, this is Chris Asher. I'm going to note my objection to slide three. I think you should. Well, no. Let me. I shouldn't say that. Let me rephrase that. I. I understand that you're that you're noting your objection, and and it's it's not relevant. I can't see the relevance to this. Um, while that was a rough period of, in, in, in Prince George's County history. Um, I don't know how it's relevant to this, so we'll move on. Your, no, your, your objection is noted for the record. Okay. 
Well, respectfully, Madam Chair, I'll say that uh, we can go to slide four. Okay. Um, the relevance. Uh, this really, is Chris Hatcher. I know my objective is slide four. Um, the objection, uh, the. Okay. Uh, so slide four is really um, where I believe the relevance is. And that is to say that given the involvement of Dr. Bay previously, and also given the district council's um, modifications of planning board decisions um, that we know now is improper because of the Zimmer case, the previous development decisions obtain it. Um, and it's all the more important that this planning board take a fresh look at the detailed site plan and follow the rules. Uh, that's that's the relevance. That's the only okay. real. And um, I'm gonna I'm gonna let you go forward with that because the Zimmer case was post the the district council's call up, and I and I know you just essentially said the same thing, and um, but I don't know where that leaves us. I'll turn to our esteemed council to to address that, but not right this second. Um, so, okay. So Ms. Borden, uh, Ms. Borden, and Mr. Warner, you I can think, address that. Okay. All right. I, I think, Madam Chair, that that leaves us in the position that if, if an action was illegal from the time it began, um, then you can't really rely on it in future proceedings. And so that that is that is my suggestion as to where that leaves us. Um, similarly, with respect to the applicability of um, Plan 2035 and the Subregion 4 Master Plan, um, I will note, again, uh, the disagreement with um, the Principal Council on that issue and refer the planning board to the um, um, Maryland National Capital Planning Commission versus Greater Baden Aquasco Citizens Association case and also to section 27-281B1A of the zoning ordinance. And it is those two provisions that I think uh, make um, the comprehensive plans um, more regulatory in nature and just advisory. Okay. And with that, we can move on to slide five. Uh, slide five, Chris Hatcher, I note my objection to slide five on points four, five, and eight to the extent that it does not directly relate to the detailed site plan. So okay, thank the you. Uh, eight factors listed here are the um, issues that I contend are in contention with respect to this detailed site plan. Um, and we will move through those accordingly. Uh, but first of which, we can go to slide six, um, is the surface parking on parcel 87. Uh, you see here in the figure that it's highlighted. Uh, we'll note that it's directly across the street from the Addison Road Metro parking garage that sits every single day with 600 empty spaces not used. Um, so, uh, we can go to slide, the next slide is slide seven. I, I think uh, Dr. Baig submitted a letter in the record that authorized uh, the use of his site um, for this surface parking okay. lot. So we can move on from that slide. Okay. We can go to the next slide, slide eight. Essentially, uh, the ARM uh, standard S2 prohibits single large surface parking lots and the presence of I my objection uh, to that character is this Chris I know my objection to the characterization of that stand that standard that standard says in its entirety single large surface parking lots are not permitted instead parking lots shall be provided in smaller defined areas separated by land planted mediums and with respect, uh, uh, okay. I'm, I'm fine with objections being noted, but I, I, I would also say that Mr. Mr. Hatcher um, can characterize the standard as he as he wishes. Um, That's a quote. Uh, but but the standard prohibits uh, single large surface parking lots. This uh, parking okay. lot All right. is, Hold on a is second. one parking Hold lot. Hold on a second. Let me, Mr. Hart, let me do this because I'm trying to keep up, keep up with it. I have a hard copy of these slides. So I'm trying to um, number them. So this one, I guess, is slide six. Um, so we're on, we're on slide eight in the, in the presentation. Really? Yeah. All right. Hold on a second. Are we still looking at surface parking? I, this is Commissioner Geraldo. 
Is the slide still surface part on parcel 87? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Oh, I see, slide Ooh. eight. Okay, got it. Okay, eight. Okay. All right, got it. Okay. Um, so, so uh, we, we talked about the ARM district uh, standard. The master plan standard has a building envelope standard that restricts parking um, to 30 feet behind the build two line. Um, plan 2035 also says that surface parking should be located in shared or private garages that are accessed via alleyways. And all the plans encourage shared parking and other reduction strategies. Next slide, please. This is nine. Uh, and what are some of those alternatives to surface parking? Uh, well, one, we have the shared parking I mentioned before. Excuse me, that Addison Road uh, Metro parking garage Ooh. is directly across the street and is operating at less than 50% capacity. Was somebody, jumping, was somebody jumping in? I thought I heard somebody say, excuse me. Okay, never mind. Okay. okay. Um, the other, uh, another alternative um, is underground parking. Mr. Hurd, this is Commissioner Geraldo again. I, I'm sorry for the interruption, but when you yes, say sir. that, when you say that the metro parking is operating at less than 50 percent, is that based on on uh, data given to you by WMATA? It is, sir, uh, okay. and it's included in the proposed findings. But yes, that that is based on WMATA's own data. Okay, that's. that's and that it has been um, substantially um, unoccupied. See, that, that station used to be an end of the line station, so it was built with a huge number of parking spaces. But once they added Largo Town Center and Morgan Boulevard, that didn't become the end of the line, so they didn't need as many spaces. So now, on a, on a given day, and this has been true probably the past seven, eight years, it's it's running about half full. Well, let me see if I understand your 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 argument with respect to the with respect to the parking and, and correct me if i'm wrong what you're saying is that this project does not need uh to utilize one acre of land for uh, on surface parking that's exactly right okay thank you okay um and so uh you know it, the, and among the alternatives would be to share the underground parking uh, most mixed-use buildings in urban areas put their parking underground if they have it. Um, again, um, to the point that Commissioner Geraldo just noted, um, I don't think that this development necessarily needs any sort of dedicated parking at all, particularly given the availability of that parking directly across the street. But if dedicated parking is required or if the developer desires it, they should put it under the building or in a mixed-use parking garage which is another alternative, a separate mixed-use parking garage that the developer owns. And in fact, the um, subdivision plan that's pending for parcel 87 is for a parking garage, um, not a parking lot. Uh, car sharing is another option, um, but the simplest option really, because this is directly across the street from the metro station, is to reduce or eliminate the parking minimums to the point where you don't need an acre of surface parking directly across from the metro. And in fact, the, um, the new zoning ordinance would do just that. It eliminates parking minimums in regional transit oriented and local transit oriented zones within a quarter mile of metro, which the site is obviously, since it's directly across the street, it's obviously within a quarter mile. Next slide, please. So the uh, plan 2035 discusses how Prince George's is not meeting its need to provide multifamily housing affordable to millennials earning less than $100,000 or to senior citizens. It also discusses how the area, this area and many surrounding areas are food deserts. Um, Subregion 4 plan mandates that the remaining vacant parcels in the Addison Metro center be developed as vertical mixed use development and that comports with the sector plans uh, goals of compact development pedestrian and transit oriented development that serves metro users and not automobiles the site is one of the few vacant sites within a half mile walking distance 
of the Addison Road Metro Station that can accommodate a full service 40,000 plus square foot grocery store. And given the extreme needs of this community for density, for grocery stores, for quality retail, we simply can't afford to have such a valuable piece of land directly accessible to Metro wasted on surface parking. It's antithetical to the whole land use framework of a, of, of a Metro station area. Next slide, please. And we can actually go to the following one, slide 12. So the next issue is the building siding and the setback uh, issues. As we know, um, ARM standard S3 requires buildings to provide a consistent setback, a continuous building edge, and to be placed within 10 to 15 feet from the right of way line. Um, the ARM sector plan and the subregion four master plan also generally require um, neo-traditional or what we call new urban um, form of, of development. Next slide. Uh, and this is slide 13. New urban forms of development are uh, quite uh, abundant in this area, um, usually near metro stations, sometimes not. I've provided two here, the Pallet and Arch District Hyattsville. It's a building similar in terms of housing units and density uh, to the building proposed here. Um, it has the consistent building edge um, and, the, and it's built right up to the sidewalk as the similar standard in Addison Road requires. Uh, the high and middle school development across from Eastern Market is similar. Consistent building, pulled up to the street. Um, that's the urbanism. Slide 14, please. And the particular developer um, that develops this uh, building is very experienced in developing um, urban transit oriented developments that adhere to the new urbanist um, uh, building form. There's a property on uh, 368 Street near right uh, next to the streetcar line and also the park place at Georgia Avenue Petworth. Next slide. And so the concern uh, is that this proposed building breaks all of those rules. Um, there is no consistent building setback, as Mr. Bishop has acknowledged. There's no continuous building edge, as he acknowledges. Um, the building is set back uh, 50 or more feet from the, from the property line. It's blocked by walls, fences, and surface parking. All of that is against um, traditional, um, neo-traditional, new urbanist building principles, but it's also against the specific standard in the sector plan. And the applicant claims that the WMATA line of influence requires it to design the building this way, but it does not. The WMATA line of influence, uh, which is the line that's marked in yellow on this exhibit, it shows the point that is 25 feet away from the Metro underground tunnel. And that's the point at which Metro determines that there will be no interference with its infrastructure. But if you see the green line below it, um, if you built the building, if you took the edge of that building and just continued it behind the, uh, the WMATA line of influence, you could still achieve a continuous building edge and a consistent setback. Um, and so that is, and, and the same thing on the Addison Road side, instead of blocking the building by surface parking and walls, you bring the building to the sidewalk and then you have a consistent building edge on both street frontages and a consistent setback. Um, and that would be in accordance with the applicable um, standard S3. <clears throat> so the only real um, accommodation that would need to be made is to use the WMATA line of influence as the build to line along the Central Avenue frontage instead of the actual right of way line. And that would, have been, uh, that would enable the developer to avoid um, treading into the influence part um, and also keeping the principle of uh, new urbanist forms of development. Next slide, please. And so basically all we're saying is that 
in this community in the uh, inner beltway and at Addison Road, we want new urban mixed-use development that's the same as anywhere else uh, around the metro station area. We want the same quality. This is a nice building. Nobody is, nobody is contesting that. But it's not the building that meets the new urban design standards called for in the armed sector plan. I, I note on the slide, you know, the slogan we have is Prince George is proud, but we're not Prince George is desperate, so you can't, you should not put any old building um, at a site that requires specific design requirements. This is a mixed use building to be sure. It's a, it's, it, it has apartments to be sure. We need both of those things. But we also need to design the Addison Road uh, Center in a way um, so that future buildings can adhere to a consistent building setback and a continuous street edge. And it starts with the first major development at Addison Road and Central Avenue, which is the prime corner. Um, I have a couple questions um, for you to, <clears throat> before I forget. Um, so, yes, so you're here. So basically, you're talking so far at least. You're talking about the continuous street line consistent with some of the exhibits you just showed us, including Hyattsville and other areas, um, uh, as opposed to the very that Mr. Bishop described. Um, and you're saying that would have been an improvement. You're, you're, not, you're saying it's a nice building and it's, you know, and it's a mixed use and it's vertical, but it's just not what was called for in this area. And the other thing you, you said is, and then of course the parking is um, offensive to you. The parking lot is offensive and you're saying not needed. Um, and that the walls there are, are problematic too because um, it, this building should come to the street line and you don't need these walls. And so I want to make sure I'm keeping up with your issues as set forth in your documents and, and your presentation today. And the other thing you just said is, what I, what I need to get back to is how high are these walls? I mean, Mr. Bishop or, or Mr. Hatcher can answer that. And number two, when you said this is not what we want to see, I want to know who the we is. Uh, the we, the we is, <laughs> the we is, the we is me. Uh, okay. as, as far as um, it's certainly an issue that I've had. Okay. Um, and and when we have talked about you know this this concept of a development um, has been around for a number of years, and I've talked with um, various stakeholders um, that have made public presentations in prior iterations uh, of this development proposal before this board. Um, groups like the Coalition for Smarter Growth, other kind of other kind of stakeholders have have basically um, commented in similar fashion that you know um, new urban forms of development is um, is what's needed here at this corner. But also the we is the community as reflected in the plan itself. The we, the plan, the subregion four plan. The Addison Road sector plans are both community developed plans that say that mixed use, new urban, neo traditional, however you want to describe it, building forms are what is required in the Addison Road Center. So, yes, it's me articulating it now, but the we is the county as approved in the plans, other stakeholders that have made this presentation before. Okay. I object to any representation other than Bradley Hurd speaking for himself. This is Chris Hatcher. Okay, well, I'll... Uh, Mr. Uh, Commission, uh, Madam Chair, I just have a question sure. for, for Mr. Hurd. So, Mr. Hurd, and, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, your objection to the walls is as if that development is blocking it out from the rest of the community and does not allow for the free flow of the community at large to... Uh, frequent this new development um okay. yes generally yeah yes sir that's 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 correct uh, Commissioner the, the the purpose of the of the forum is to to open the buildings up to the street so that they are accessible to um mainly pedestrians metro users and that um you know walking by the building going into the doors the plans kind of spell that out in in some detail, but that, that's the that's the basic principle of, of new urban forms of development is to make the building accessible, not to cars primarily, but to people as they walk along the street. And so walls and fences block that. Okay. 
So while not while not analogous, uh, exactly, it's similar, if you will, to the complaints that were raised when the Census Bureau wanted to put up those chain link fences around around the, the Census Bureau in Suitland. And they wanted barbed wire too. Don't forget that. And they wanted barbed wire. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. night and day. Precisely. Night and okay. day. Those those are two different things, though. One 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 yeah. one is you know is 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 a lack of access maybe to the community, and we can find out about that about these walls and whether they have openings. But the other is just plain. You know, big old walls with with, with, with chain link things and, and barbed wire that has a whole different connotation. Yep, and to the credit of County Executive May, rest in peace, Wayne Curry, who was able to get that changed. Yes, along with Senator Mikulski, I've given both credit yes. for that. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, certainly the, these walls are not these walls are not the, that kind of wall, but the wall still separates people it's uh it's 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 sort of like a low masonry wall with um uh wrought iron topping i believe um above it and i think the wall comes to about four to six feet but it's, it's on the plans and, and okay. staff can confirm okay. um i don't have that at, at my at, at the ready right this second but okay. we can certainly confirm the height of the walls but the point is it blocks people uh it it, it, it separates the building from the street which is the opposite of what um these uh plans call for what 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 the armed sector standard calls for and what new urbanism in general calls for and you, earlier you showed the example of the uh, the hind middle school which i'm familiar with and that's that also has all underground parking doesn't it uh and it does right and that's right across from the uh metro stop at eastern market eastern market mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That's correct. Um, and, and, and it has the Trader Joe's there. I'm sorry. And there's also a Trader Joe's that serves that okay. serves the that that area and matter. Is that right? That, that's correct. There's a grocery store in the building as well as um, other retail uses. That's exactly right. Okay. Thank you. And yes. let me ask this question. Um, and Mr. Hatcher, you can be prepared to address this. How much is the parking, how much do you envision the parking to be at this site versus the cost of parking at the Addison Road Metro? Is that? That's that not for you, that's for, Mr. that's for Mr. Hatcher to answer. But I, you, you don't have uh, to answer it now, okay. 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 Go, uh, go okay. Ahead. I have to look, at this stage I gotta jump in when I came up with my questions, but they're gone. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, All right. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, and, 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 and again, um, Madam Chair, the, you know, my point is um, that the the thing that saves the most money is not to require any of the parking um, and let and let the property, let the residents, uh, they can deal directly with Metro if they want to um, to use that parking garage. Um, many of the residents who will occupy this building, if it's since it's right next to Metro, won't own cars. Um, I mean, I think that's the rationale behind um, the new zoning ordinance, uh, which this planning board is also obviously very familiar. Um, it eliminates parking requirements um, altogether in urban areas such as this. And so yeah, there wouldn't be uh, any particular cost to that in, in, in my estimation, um, at least the cost that the developer would need to bear. So, um, so I, we can move to, um, Slide, uh, slide 18, I guess, if we actually, um, and this may have been addressed by the recent uh, amendment, but I will say one thing, if we can move to slide 18. So um, uh, if I understand Mr. Ha Mr. Hatcher's um, amendment this morning, um, proposed amendment to the zoning use table, uh, the current, let me just say first, back up and say that the current um, zoning requirement, both in um, the armed sector plan as well as the general zoning ordinance for the CSC zone, is that a mixed use building that contains uh, residences has to have the residences above the third floor. This building um, has residences on the first, second, 
and third floors. Um, the the uh, I think Mr. Hatcher's um, proposed amendment um, would allow residential uses on the first, second, and third floor. Um, in previous iterations of this um, development proposal, um, developers were requesting a variation that allows residences above the first floor. In other words, saving that first floor for retail or office uses. Um, and, and in fact, that is the approach um, that's taken in the subregion four plan for store fun frontages, which a, a building fronting on Central Avenue would be, is that it limits the ground floor, the first you know floor, to retail uses. Um, and so I would suggest that uh, to keep with the subregion four plan, um, uh, residences should definitely not be allowed on the first floor of a mixed-use commercial building. Um, uh, and if and, and if the proposal were to include it on floors above the first floor, that would be more in keeping uh, with the subregion four standards as well as um, the actual zoning requirement, which is to encourage mixed vertical mixed use of that of that space. So you're okay with second floor and above? I would be fine with second floor and above, and I think that that's consistent with what is uh, with what has previously been. Okay. Um, Offered as a as a variation to that uh, use table. Um, slide nineteen, please. So the roadway network, um, you yeah, know, the applicant um, contends that the planning board isn't allowed to consider um, comprehensive plan requirements relating to roadways adjacent to the development site. Um, we obviously have a dispute in that, but. In, um, even if the applicant correct, is correct about that, it still wouldn't matter for the following reasons. First, as we, we, we can talk about later, um, the applicant is required to obtain a new preliminary subdivision plan in any of it. So uh, the, all of this development should go for a new preliminary subdivision plan uh, in any event. Second, um, and this is just a, this is just, um, the planning board retains the discretion to deny a DSP on any reasonable ground, including the ground that certain subdivision specific issues need to be reevaluated. The fact of the matter is, this subdivision approval is 14 years old. Um, you know, it was enacted and approved during a time when, let's just say, there was a lot of external factors going on. <laughs> with respect to wait a minute hold up hold up that was in february of 2006 and i assure you there were no nefarious activities at the planning board during that at that time i will tell you that not casting aspersions not casting aspersions on the planning board but okay but i'm just i just want that record to, to be very clear that in february of 2006 none of that was happening okay it is noted and i respect it okay. Okay. um uh, but it so uh and, 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 and third, you know, we, we, we often collect, colloquially refer to detailed site plans and preliminary plan approvals as entitlements, but really the law in Maryland is far different from that. No, no property owner has a vested interest in any development approval until after they commence physical development of the land under a validly issued building permit. And so all of this stuff is potentially up for reevaluations where circumstances warrant. And 14 years ago, before, prior to, you know, two major comprehensive plans covering the area and uh, refined conditions about um, the requirements for mixed-use development and compact blocks and those sort of things are all valid considerations. So uh, with that said, we can move to the next slide. Slide 20, I believe. And uh, the, the particular arm standard, which is P1, requires a couple of relevant things. It requires connecting Zelma Avenue directly to Maryland 214, which is Central Avenue. Now, we're on the one slide back. There we go. Um, and it requires providing safe crossings. <clears throat> this diagram shows that the existing distance between um, 
marks crosswalks. There's the crosswalk at Central and Addison, and the next crosswalk is at Central and the entrance to Addison Station. That's over 900 feet. And what the general plan says is that compact blocks should be typically 150 to 300 feet, no more than 600 feet. The Central Avenue frontage of this parcel A where, where applicants building would be is about 400 feet. And there's the intersection and the, and the sector plan already requires that that be made a full intersection. And so what I'm suggesting is, is that these adjacent roadways need to be made into a full intersection and there needs to be a, a crosswalk placed across Central Avenue at that point. That is, that is what makes the site accessible to pedestrians um, uh, and, and um, both, both the existing pedestrians but also the new pedestrians. I, I make reference in um, the proposed findings based on census data. We're bringing 193 new housing units to this particular one block area. That's gonna bring an additional probably 470 to 520 um, people. Um, and it makes that the existing census block, you know, a very dense place, which is great. Metro needs density, but it also needs pedestrian safety. And how you provide pedestrian safety is to put a crosswalk across a major busy intersection. Next slide, please. The sector plan itself explains what it means by safe crossings. It includes uh, marked crosswalks at all intersections and pedestrian friendly features such as curb bump outs and the like. That's, what's, that's what the sector plan calls for at all intersections. Uh, next slide. I think I got ahead of myself. Yeah, talking about compact blocks. I just talked about that previously, so we can go to slide 23. Sidewalks. Um, this is a picture I took myself years ago. It is up, it is at the corner of Zelma Avenue and Maryland 214. It's it's a actually Maryland 332. It's the, it's the uh, right at the northwest corner of applicants development and it's obviously as you can see during a snowstorm yes couldn't have been um, couldn't have been this you year see, you see i'm sorry so it couldn't have been this year with this climate change but go ahead okay <laughs> <laughs> definitely wasn't this year <laughs> but um you you see here a few things um that'll be relevant for you know for some later things i'll have to say but the sidewalk is directly adjacent as you see to maryland 214 um when it when there's bad weather and there's snow state highway administration shovels all of the snow onto the sidewalk and that makes the only way to get to the metro station safe i mean <laughs> well not safely but the only way to get to the metro station is to come into the street because the sidewalk is blocked uh full of snow but you'll also see there um and I'll, you know when we go to talk about the lighting there are no street lights on this uh particular Central Avenue stretch of the road. So this 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 uh, picture is kind of illustrative of the point I'm trying to make, and we can go to the next slide. We know, we know that the um, the ARM standard P2 requires eight foot wide sidewalks along Central Avenue, five foot wide si sidewalks along the um, that that side of Addison Road South, um, and five foot wide grass planting strips. Uh, you recall earlier when I was um, cross-examining Mr. Bishop on that on the civil site plan, I was asking him what the what the area in the hash box is and what that note meant. And what that note suggests um, uh, to me is that it, it said the note says sidewalk, green space and connection from Addison Road and Maryland 214 within the dashed area to be constructed after the completion of Maryland 214 improvement by Elm Street development under a separate permit number. We don't know anything about the timeline of that, when that's expected, but if, if the suggestion by that note is that this developer does not intend to conduct, I mean, to construct a pedestrian friendly sidewalk until some point 
in the in the undetermined future, that's objectionable. The, the, the sidewalk is shown on the plan, but the commitment to construct it is is in doubt because of that note on the civil plan. That's the that's the substance of my concern with the sidewalks provided on this plan. Um, any questions on that before I move on? I think Should I have up clear though. We had done that at, at first. I think that would have been that would have saved us like fifteen minutes. <laughs> okay, Commissioner. That was Commissioner Dewarner. Commissioner Dewarner. Uh, it seems like um, Commissioner Geraldo. Did you have a question too? Yes, I wanted to know if if, um, if Mr. Herb could just explain briefly what he would propose there in lieu of what's proposed. Uh, the simple fix there, um, Commissioner Duraldo, would be to remove um, that limiting condition and to require um, the construction of the um, of the buffered sidewalk, uh, you know, immediately with, you know, the, the development. Thank you. Uh-huh. Any, any other questions on that? No, apparently not. Okay. Okay. So we can move on to um, slide 26. Let's go one, one more. All right. So the next issue is the requirement um, for ornamental street lighting uh, along the frontage. Um, uh, you see here in the diagram some examples of, of ornamental street lighting. Um, I think that's Arch, Arch District Hyattsville and Riverdale and Noma, I believe, are those or where those pictures are from. But uh, the arm standard, the relevant arm standard, is standard P5, and it requires ornamental pole-mounted street lights and luminaires along all streets in the center. Um, here again, I showed you the picture with the snow and the sidewalk. There are currently no street lights at all on the Central Avenue frontage of this property. And, and along Zelma Avenue and along Addison Road, you have the traditional cobra-headed street lights. Um, this uh, standard P5 imposes a clear requirement for ornamental pole-mounted street lights. Um, they look nice, but they're also more pedestrian friendly because the lighting is lower, closer to the ground and provides um, better visibility when you're walking. Uh, so again, this detailed site plan does not um, does not provide for the street lighting along the relevant streets. It says that it will provide it on the site, but not along the relevant streets. And that's contrary to um, the ARM standard P5. Uh, similarly, and we can go to uh, slide 28, so hop two more. With, uh, with the utility undergrounding, uh, it's the same thing. Standard P6 requires all existing and new utilities to be placed underground. And you have an example of what that looks like in recent um, mixed-use development, both in Prince George and in Prince George's and outside. The uh, first, you have two from different angles of Arts District Hyattsville, where they have undergrounded the utilities. Um, and you see in the distance, there's still some overhead utilities, but not where the new development is. Um, down here in front of us, Boys and Poets, same thing, uh, undergrounded utilities. And that uh, third picture is the backside of the um, High Middle School Development Project at Eastern Market. Um, this, this uh, detailed site plan does not provide for undergrounded utilities along the streets, only on the site. It's the same, it's the same thing as the street lighting. These things are required as part of the plan, and, they, and, and the clear indication, and in fact, I'll represent to you that the <coughs> planning board um, during the first uh, iteration this uh, detailed site plan um, had a lengthy discussion about undergrounding of utilities. Um, staff was clear on its position that the standard required undergrounding utilities along adjacent roadways 
Um, this is one of the this is one of the conditions that somehow, somewhere, for some reason, the district council modified once it got there on its call up review. And this is the kind of this is what I'm saying as far as the um, district council modifications that were, you know, void from the outset and not applicable um, to, to to this uh, development. Um, and we can move to the next slide. So um, uh, here again, uh, the discussion I was trying to have with um, with staff earlier relates to the fact that um, there is no sub there is no provision of the subdivision ordinance, including section 24-108, that exempts these properties from preliminary subdivision approvals. Um, staff mentioned there's a need to consolidate these three separate parcels, parcel A, parcel 87, and lot five into one development site. Um, in addition, lot five is going to dedicate certain land to be used for Zelma Avenue. Um, so it's changing the relationship of the, of the previously planted lot to the street. It's changing the relationship of the lots to each other. Nothing about that um, can you do without first filing a preliminary plan of subdivision. Um, and also to the, to the thing that we're talking about in the next case, the left hand turn access into and out of Addison Road uh, at the site access point is another condition um, that is part of the subdivision condition that needs to be considered at a new preliminary plan. Um, and as we know, uh, from the from the detailed site plan uh, regulations in the zoning ordinance, preliminary plans of subdivisions are supposed to be considered prior to the approval of detailed site plans. So that that is the um, the uh, the concern related to the subdivision ordinance non-compliance. Um, next slide. And so again, those are the eight uh, issues. Uh, that are in dispute. Um, next slide. And so the relief that, uh, that that I'm requesting is to deny this particular detailed site plan, but also to give notice to the applicant of what it needs to do in order to get approval on a site plan. Again, I don't, I, I want to see mixed use compact dense development at this intersection, but I want it to um, comply with the rules. Um, I provided language at pages 26 to 29 of the proposed findings and conclusions that would um, address all of the concerns that I identified in this presentation. Uh, next slide. And with that, um, I am um, ready to answer any additional questions you have. Okay. Um Let's see uh, if the board has any questions. Madam Vice Chair. Uh, hmm. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, I do have, um, first of all, a comment uh, in reference to uh, the Suitland Center. Uh, and someone mentioned that uh, former county executive Wayne Kerr had a great deal to do with that, but I would suggest... And so did a wonderful council member. So did a wonderful former <laughs> council member. <laughs> Initiated that. Yes, yes, thank you. Just for the record. Okay. Uh, but the, the other uh, thing, I have a couple of questions. Vice Chair. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but a couple of questions uh, about, uh, and we can get into that later. I'd like to hear from uh, Mr. Hatchett regarding the sidewalks and the street lights. I, for many years, I lost worked at uh, Central High School and I'm very familiar with that region and uh, some of the needs in that uh, vicinity so I, I'd like to hear some discussion from Mr. Hatcher uh, about uh, his reaction to some of the things around sidewalks and street lights. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's not right at this moment Mr. Hatcher because I want to hear see what all the board members have questions and I and I have a boatload. Okay so um, Commissioner Dorner no, I, I just wish that this had preceded the initial questions. I think Lunch did a uh, very good job in uh, in organizing Mr. Hurd. So thank you for the presentation. This is much cleaner. 
than uh, than the start of the time. Um, and I think you made some some uh, some very pointed um, comments in here that I'm looking for the applicant to address. Commissioner Gerardo. Yes, Madam Chair, uh, I did appreciate the uh, the presentation by Mr. Hurd. He was succinct and pointed out. Uh, a number of concerns that I had when I reviewed uh, the staff report of the plan uh, just initially to me it doesn't seem to be a plan uh, to fit what's contemplated by plan 2035 or even our new uh, new zoning code uh, you know what we're trying to do uh, the past administration and this current administration is interested in developing our metro sites. Uh, and this is clearly a metro site, but we need to make it more urban. Uh, and I don't see how this existing plan, and that's why I'm waiting to hear from Mr. Hatcher, how that fits in with, with the plan 2035 and the new zoning code. Okay, Commissioner, let's, I, I will agree with some of what everyone said. Uh, Commissioner Geraldo, everything except that succinct part. <laughs> okay. Mr. Hurd, you were supposed to laugh at that. Okay. Um, um, Commissioner Washington. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, I too am interested in hearing Mr. Hatcher's feedback uh, and building on Madam Vice Chair, not only lighting and parking, uh, but I would also like to uh, better understand the walls, the fencing uh, that's contemplated around the proposed development. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, and then, um, so that concludes um, the board's um, questions for um, Mr. Hurd at this moment. Um, I, there are some questions I will need for legal counsel, our legal counsel to address. Uh, one of which was um, uh, Mr. Hurd. Um, talked about in terms of the parking lot, parking lot that the ARM Development District Standard 2 prohibits single large surface parking lots. Um, and I don't know if that's true or if that's a segment of the standard. So I, w I do want someone to read the, the standard in its, that particular standard in its entirety. Um, someone asked the question, I think it was Commissioner Geraldo that already asked the question about the metro parking garage, about the 600 empty spaces, and Mr. Hurd, I do believe you said that that um, information came directly from WMATA. Um, uh, yes, ma'am, that's correct. Okay, I too would like to know um, from um, Mr. Hatcher, you, you and your applicant have the burden. I, I will turn to our staff as needed, but you have the burden, so I would like to know about the masonry walls. Um, and if what Mr. Hurd indicated about the 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 mixed use component of it, and the stores being on the and the commercial part being on the lower level, is supposed to invite pedestrians. Oh, let me stop in here and do those walls have openings to allow the pedestrians to have access? So I need to know that, or 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 does the wall do the walls just prohibit that kind of access, and then really rely force you to rely on um, on cars? I'd like to turn to our, uh, for our council, I'm going to get all my questions out. I'd like our council to address the issue of the, of um, post, uh, with the um, decision in the Zimmer case um, about the county council and the limitations on call-ups and that their call-ups are being on the record now. Um, um, did that necessarily make the previous decisions void? Um, and so I'm, I'm going to need uh, Ms. Borden and, and Mr. or Mr. Warner to address that. Um, I'd like to, um, to uh, um, Mr. Hatcher, to, to, for you to address the issue of the varied um, building setback, as Mr. Bishop described it, versus the not uniform um, um, setback as described by Mr. Hurd. Um, and does that in and of itself mean that it's it's not um, consistent with um, Plan 2035, with ARM, and with Sub 4, and and also not consistent with new urbanism. Um, I think I got my answer to the question about who is we, but I, w I would have to. Um, I I understand um, that the we is as Mr. Hurd at this time, although he did reference um, some others in, ter in terms of the Coalition of Smart Growth and some other entities. Um, that that wrote in 
about the need for new urbanism. Well, that may be. I don't know that this is inconsistent with new urbanism, so I'm going to need someone to address that. Um, I need someone to address the issue about the adjacent um, roadways being made into full intersections. I don't know how much is, of that is within our purview. And the same thing with the crosswalk from Zoma to 214, as depicted in um, reference in slide 23. Um, we want to talk about the eight foot wide sidewalk and the, and the ornamental lighting. Um, I, I think I heard that it was you had the ornamental lighting on the site, but it didn't extend beyond the site. Or you could do it on site, and, but it didn't extend beyond. Uh, and also, I want you to, to address the issue of the underground utilities, um, although they may pr be provided on site, but not um, beyond the site. Uh, so those are just some of the questions that I have, and some will be um, addressed with um, by legal. Um, Ms. Madam Chair, yes, I, I'm sorry. I, I just want to. I have another question, but I'll wait till you're done. Okay. Um, um, so one of the things that Mr. Mr. Hurd said, he said that it's yes, it's a nice building. No one can deny it. It is mixed use, um, but that it is just not consistent with the type of development um, that was envisioned by those plans I just enumerated for Addison Road and that the parking lot itself was um, uh, antithetical to, to um, the purpose of this um, you know, t really nice TOD new urbanism um, development there. Um, so those are my things that I would really, really like to address in, a, in addition to those, the function of the walls, the function of the, uh, um, the uh, parking lot, I mean obviously it's for cars, but we, we would anticipate more metro use. Just I just need, and, and how this meets new urbanism and, and com complies with um, the various plans. So those are my issues. And then Commission, Commissioner Geraldo, you had another one? Yeah, I have the one, I, it, with regards to having residences on the first level. Uh, that I would like I would like them to address that. I, I, I don't understand the, the purpose or the need for that, given that it's the mixed use. And, and generally, at least what I've seen in this region, uh, Rockville, Arlington, Alexandria, when they put these buildings up, normally the first and second levels are for businesses, but definitely the first level. So I'd like them to address that as well. Okay. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is David Warner, Principal Counsel. Okay, yeah. I think it would be helpful uh, prior to um, uh, Mr. Hatcher speaking to just address the scope of the board's review uh, for legal purposes um, since <clears throat> we address a lot of different issues in our comments and, and many have been addressed by Mr. Herter. Um, I want to um, remind the board that there are um, certain standards that this DSB must comply with in order for the board to approve it. And there are other issues that have been brought up that um, the board, uh, not, not within the board's um, purview to consider when reviewing a, a detailed site plan. So first of all, um, many of the issues that you've asked questions about regard uh, design standards, either development district standards uh, or site design standards. There are approximately 87 separate standards of design and development that apply when you're reviewing a DSB and a DDOZ. It has been suggested that the technical staff report did not address every one of those 87 standards individually. And of course, um, it's not expected that a technical staff report is going to address every single one in writing. It's already 32 pages long. Um, but they do have to consider every single one of those design standards if it's not a problem meeting the design standards. I don't believe they individually call each one out. Um, 
but most of the issues that you've identified and you have questions about fall within these applicable design standards. I think there's maybe about seven or eight that Mr. Hurd has called out out of the 87. Um, as far as Zimmer goes, um, that decision doesn't bear on your consideration today of this GSP. Uh, we're not a court of law. Uh, we can't uh, declare that uh, decisions of the district council have no uh, authority on us. Um, the uh, decisions of the district council apply in this case where they uh, made changes to the DSP that you're considering. Uh, and then I uh, wanted to make sure it was clear that while Plan 2035 and the uh, Subregion 4 plan, as I said in my memo, um, are not without any um, value and they do serve a purpose, uh, this DSP does not need to comply with the conditions, terms, goals of those two plans. So while there's no problem discussing them, uh, when you make your decision, uh, you can't uh, take those into account when determining if the DSP it can be approved. Are you, let me make sure I'm clear on that. I'm, I want to make sure I'm clear on that, Mr. Warner. Are you saying they're, the, the, they're not controlling their, their are, for instance, the plan 2035 is the general plan. We all know that the general plan is a policy document. It serves as a guide for future development. It does not, they do have value, and it does not mean that we can just willy-nilly ignore it but up to the extent, but each, um, each plan that's approved thereafter, the sector plans, uh, the master plans, the sector plans, and then and these other ap individual applications are refinements. Yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. They are incredibly valuable documents, and they guide planning, absolutely. However, and we refer to them in the, in the uh, staff report uh, to help us inform or to help staff inform their decision making as, um, you know, any other kind of outside document we refer to, whether it's new urbanism or, or some other kind of um, I don't know that we've adopted any new urbanism specifically, but we do rely on other documents uh, that uh, the, um, the county and the, the planning board have um, adopted to inform our review. But, but as far as determining whether a detailed site plan can be approved, we look to what the zoning ordinance provides and requires. And the zoning ordinance does not require compliance with uh, General Plan 2035 or the Subregion 4 plan in order to approve this DSP. Okay. Can you can you read that? Someone read that standard to me. Um, the Armed um, Development District Standard Number Two regarding the single um, large surface parking lot. I think Mr. Yes, Bishop. Yes. Okay. Can you read it? Yes. Uh, this is Deborah Gordon, by the way, Deputy General Counsel. Uh, the standard is on page 177 of the Addison Road Metro Town Center and Vicinity Plan. And it says, uh, it's uh, labeled paragraph F. It says, single large surface parking lots are not permitted, period. Instead, comma, parking shall be provided in smaller defined areas separated by planting mediums, period. That's the entire paragraph of uh, Section F. Okay, thank you for that. Okay. Um, Madam Chair, would you ask President Pete that regarding parking? Ms. Borden? Sure. It says single large surface parking lots are not permitted. Instead, parking shall be provided in smaller defined areas separated by planted medians. Okay. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Um, and the other thing I want to address is, and, and legal can address this too, but I think there was a reference made to the fact that this preliminary plan was 14 years old, and it is, but as of now, preliminary that preliminary plan is still alive and well we can't we can't just ignore that just because it's 14 years old um, 
it, it's that's it's, correct it's still, if i can okay, just okay. uh make one uh clarification for madam chair i'm sorry thank you this is the last time um uh, mr hurt also mentioned a case he mentioned mnc ppc uh versus uh baby mcclosco correct uh community association yeah that case i'm very familiar with that case that case was about a preliminary plan of subdivision and um that's that's the quirk about our our zoning in prince george's county subdivisions are required to conform to the master plan the applicable master plan right that is in the code it's in the subdivision regulations site plans are not site right. plans are very different from from subdivision plans um because they're they're doing different things and site plans are are therefore not subject to master plan conformance the only reason we're even talking about the Addison Road Metro plan is because the, the overlay zone that controls this property was created by that plan within that plan. And that is the only reason we're talking about it because the, the development standards are actually located inside the SMA. And because of that, you have to have conformance with that, with that SMA because it contains the overlay zone that we're talking about that actually controls the land. So the way it works, is the master plan sets up a vision for an area the zoning sets up the regulations for the area and you must comply with the regulations the master plan recommendations are just recommendations that is the way it works that's the way it's always worked and that's the way it works here uh for this particular property thank you um, thank you okay so, so the master, the master plan is, is mandatory. I remember that in the subdivision regs, but it's not for um, a detailed site plan, except that in this particular case, it's subject to the um, development district overlay zone. Right. I have a question for, for Ms. Borden, um, because I, I found Mr. Hurd's testimony to be particularly compelling. Um, I've lived in several places inside of D.C., and, and even now, I'm a block away from the pallet and some of the places that were in the slides. Um, and, and I'm thinking about the foreign based code that we're going to. I don't know how this site necessarily conforms to the zoning regulations. So I want to find out in the, in the staff report where we should be using to, to judge whether or not we, we think it, it does or does not. Because right now, I'm, I'm thinking that this building should be pulled up more towards the, the sight line um, on all sides. We shouldn't have fences in there. The parking, if any, should be in the interior of the building. And it's potentially going to take a, a fairly large redesign of, of the proposal um, to kind of meet those standards in this area to, to kind of quote unquote get it right. Um, I like the, the conceptual drawings that are in the slides that the applicant has presented. I think those, those look good. They're, they look sharp. Um, but there's a number of details that, that are concerning. Um, some of them Mr. Hurd mentioned. Some of them are, are, are even beyond that. So I'm, I'm struggling with this case right now just to find out what is the criteria that we're supposed to be using. If, if we're not supposed to pay as much attention to the master plan, we're supposed to pay attention to the regulations. Can you point us in the staff report where the the criteria are that we should be judging this and, and this is commissioner washington before you respond Ms. borden because i have a similar question when mr warner began his comments earlier he talked about certain things that this board could can and cannot consider as part of this gsp in terms of out of purview uh but I, i'm not clear on what those things are you talked about 87 design and development standards, but I did not hear anything specific with regards to what we can or cannot consider. Thank you. Okay, so- Madam Chair, that's my question as well. Okay, uh, all right, hold on yeah, a second. Uh, basically, we were told what we can't do, but what can we okay, do? Okay, hold on a sec, uh, hold on a second. Okay, because there's a lot on the table right now. So the, I, the next thing I'm gonna suggest is that I know, um, um, I guess Commissioner Washington asked the question of um, Mr. Bishop about what we can do, and I think that's your question as well. Also, and he can talk about that and, and how these things, but also the applicant has a burden here to address some of these questions that we have too. The, the, the this is Commissioner, I just want to be clear. My question is not to Mr. Bishop. Um, okay. It was uh, 
principal counsel Warner. Okay. These were a part of his comments. Okay. I'm not clear true. on what he considers within purview or out of purview. And that and good. And I'll let him and I'll uh, ask him to answer that question for us. But I but I also what I'm trying to get to also is that um, I would also like. Um, Mr. Hatcher has heard, you know, hopefully they've been taking copious notes. We've put a lot on the table and they're going to have um, uh, some explaining to do. Some, so um, I'd like to hear their responses on some of this as well. But okay, but, but Mr. Warner, would, can you address, uh, address Commissioner Washington's question first? Yes, David Warner, Principal Counsel. And I hope I didn't sound like I was saying you couldn't do uh, everything and, and uh, uh, could only do some things. What I meant to um make clear is that everything in the staff report that's before you addresses all of the issues that are uh before you for consideration uh, the first the second page identifies all of the applicable legal documents that are uh, applicable to this dsp review including the arm sector plan and the other documents listed there all of those are within your purview and some of the comments that mr heard addressed are related to issues that you have to review as part of this consideration and that staff is reviewed there are some issues that mr heard addressed that are not relevant to your consideration and uh, there have been a couple comments about the, the new what the new zoning ordinance says or general plan 2035 say that I wanted to just point out are outside of the, the jurisdiction for this particular review but there's plenty that, that is on your plate to review does that make sense uh, well, thank you, uh, mr. Warner uh, I you answered it exactly the way you answered it the first time <laughs> And you also said the second time that there were some things that Mr. Hurd put before us that we should not be considering as part of this DSP. So my question is, what are those things? Well, two answers to that. One, um, the standards that you should be considering start on page 12 of the technical staff report, okay? So those are the standards you should be considering. I don't know that um, I can verbally go through all of Mr. Hurd's testimony and pull the things out that aren't relevant and are relevant um, to your consideration. Um, I think that would be um, unfair uh, to him and you um, if I did that on the fly. But my memorandum that's in the record was intended to identify everything in his substantive um, memo that he submitted so that you would have a clear understanding of what is um, applicable to your decision and what is not. Well, one of the things that might be um, um, the adjacent roadways that need to be made into full intersections, because I don't know that we have the ability to do that. So some My, you know, um, you know, the, the improvements to roadways are something that is analyzed at the time of preliminary plan subdivision. And what is required in terms of those improvements is decided at that time. Um, the issues that you're looking at now are more design related than they come to things like parking and lighting and those kind of issues. But to, even to make the roadways full intersections, that would come from public works and transportation or state highway administration. Well, many of the uh, design improvements that um, uh, Mr. Hurd addressed, such as when are the sidewalks going to be built, uh, why isn't the lighting being put in? Yes, a lot of those are subject, they're outside of the property, that they are subject to the jurisdiction of other agencies. I think that was Commissioner Washington's question. Okay. Okay. Um, well, look, how about this? While you're, you're not here. okay, okay, um, while, while we're doing that, can we, t Mr. Hatcher, let's, can you, you need to respond to some of these things. So tell, whether you have, hopefully heard all of our questions, all of our concerns, our responses. You've heard Mr. Hurd's um, presentation. You've heard our questions. You've heard the areas in which we might possibly be in agreement and the areas where maybe we're not. 
you're on. Uh, Chris Hatcher for the applicant. I'd like to again first thank staff and their dedication on this application and I'd actually like to thank Mr. Hurd. Uh, you know he spent a lot of time and effort on all the materials and it's very clear that he's passionate about uh, this his community and that, and that really that really should be commended. Although we don't obviously have disagreements about um, some of the specific issues that he takes with the building that certainly you know, shouldn't be construed as us um, in any way minimizing his uh, his his his, pa his his very clear passion for his community. And and um, what has been the extent of your communication with each other too? Part, um, okay. Well, what I can tell you is there's been consistent coordination since 2018 um, between my client and and Mr. Hurd. Uh, more recently. Um, after the, the continuance that we granted maybe about a month ago, we've had a series of phone calls. Obviously, due to social distancing, there are no meetings right okay, now. Okay. Um, where, we, where we had pretty, you know, I myself had pretty detailed conversations with Mr. Hurd, which really, um, which really uh, elaborates on, well, explains why I wanted to, to certainly thank him for his time and his effort. Uh, it, it's very clear. Um, that, that he's passionate and and uh, it, it's, it's apparent in the documents that he submitted. Uh, we did uh, collectively have um, a, a conference call where we just where we discussed some issues. Uh, can't can't really go into the details of that because they were framed under uh, confidential for confidential confidentiality purposes. But we have coordinated with him extensively about this um, about this uh, this application this project um, and we, we in no way doubt his, his passion um, about it. Uh, we just we just can't accomplish some of the things that uh, that he wants to be accomplished. A and, and, and B, some of the things he wants accomplished are really are really not really for an individual applicant to handle. Um, some of the things are more appropriate for SHA or DPI or DPW and T. Um, and 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 so, we, we, you know, we're not certainly not minimizing some of the concerns, but we, we, we try to do our best to, to make sure that he's aware of who's in control of those things and, and what we are control, in control of, and, and more specifically, what we believe is relevant for purposes of detailed site plan. Um, one of the things that uh, Mr. Warner said uh, was that there are about 87, 85 plus standards in the development district standard that is in, in this TDOZ that's applicable to this, this site. And I think Mr. Hurd did a good job of elaborating on, on why he believes we think we don't comply with any of them. But just take just a, a, a look at, at page 29 of, of the staff report itemizes the three deep nations that we are requesting. We actually requested four and staff disapproved one of them from those 87. So again, I'm not minimizing those areas where there's some differences between uh, Mr. Hurd and the applicant. I'm just, I'm just showing that to, to convey that to the extent that he doesn't believe that we comply with or that we're breaking all the rules. Um, that isn't necessarily consistent with our, with, with your staff's analysis, with our expert land planners analysis and the materials that we submitted into the record. Um, I think there was a lot of questions. I'm sorry, go ahead. Question that is Commissioner Dorner. Um, so if, if we do look at page 29, A1, the, the building siding line, let's ignore um, Maryland 214 Central Avenue um, and whether or not we want to think about going into the zone of influence or, or around it. I think you should probably get a little bit closer to it, but that's neither here nor there. If you look on the east side of the of the lot, though, where Addison is adjacent to it, why aren't you going up to the sight line there? Because you guys haven't made an attempt to get close to it. Uh, which I think, from from my perspective, like this is what I this is what I do professionally. Like I do urban design and I do real estate stuff like this. And I don't think you guys have gotten close to to what's modern and what what we're trying to do in the county with the, the zoning rewrite and different things. I think there's still a lot left to be done and you can tuck that parking back inside the, the unit if you if you really think you need the parking you can tuck it back in there but move the building envelope closer to the sight line and then 
I think that would be more consistent with, with A1. Ms. Commissioner, right. do you want to watch the hands? Watch the hands. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Hello? Not the antibacterial here. Thank okay. you. Hello? Good. We're here. Um, thank you, Commissioner. I think I think to speak to that directly, I'd like to, to turn to the Torty Gallus. Stephanie from Torty Gallus. Yes, sure, I'm here. Um, yeah, so I think that the the amount of parking that we have on the side there is very minimal. It's in support of the retail, making sure that the retail is successful. I think that the great amount of effort that went into the site plan in terms of creating that active corner with public art and outdoor seating um, adjacent to the retail that's in that setback area um, is all in service of trying to make sure that this retail is successful and leased. And I think that we do not feel that 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 small amount of uh, you know sort of teaser parking that's easy for someone to see from the street um, detracts at all from the overall urban um, urban feel of this mixed use building. I know there is also some existing stormwater management structures that were have been placed in that area that we are working with um, as well. I, mean, I think I would just disagree. This is Commissioner Thorne. I, I would just disagree on, on whether or not it's consistent with the urban feel. You can pull that building up there, get rid of those parking spaces, and put it on the inside. It, I, I have no idea why you want to stick those parking on, on the in front of there and try and claim that that's promoting urbanism. Okay, so. Does that mean, oh, Commissioner Geraldo, we can't hear you. There's something on our end, but he's on the app. Hold on a second. Can, they, can anyone hear me? We can't hear you, Commissioner Geraldo. Commissioner Geraldo, we cannot hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Hold on. Can you have a moment where I have some time? Um, can, can, I, can I be heard? Please let me know if I can be heard. Can you all hear me? So they can't hear me. Can I be heard? A slight outside chance that there could be some weather related issues. Tom Mesog was knocked off. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ago, so but, I, but I want to tell them that. I have I, a way of I, telling I, them. I know, but that, that might be the issue. Is it stormy? How do we let them know that we're experiencing difficulties? Well, that's what I said um, when I was on the app. That's why Commissioner Garabas stopped talking. Yeah, but how do I let the rest of them know? Ryan's checking out. Okay. <laughs> so, is that Ryan saying? Can anyone hear us? Yes. Hello? Yeah, I'd like to. I want to let them know. I'm going to put the sign up saying we're going to take a break while we address this. Ryan, should I get on the app so she can say it there? Uh, say again? You want me to get on the app so she can say it there and everyone can hear it? I can throw a, a message. Yeah, we're going to throw okay. the message up on the Okay. Sure. Just hold tight. They're going to take it. I'm going to I'm going to do a sign. Hold on a second. Yeah, there we go. Can they see me too?
Okay, everybody, I think we're back up and running. If Everyone turn your mics off, though, unless you're speaking. That afforded everyone a little break while we took care of the technology. I think it's been storming outside, so some people got shut down. So let me double check and make sure. Let's see who we have. Okay, we have um, um, Vice Chair Bailey. Can you all hear me? No one can hear me. Hey, Madam Chair. Okay, good. Vice, Vice Chair Bailey. Okay, Commissioner Geraldo, Commissioner Dorner, present, and, and Commissioner Washington. You all can hear me. Present. Can hear you yeah. fine and clear. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Present. Accounted for. Okay. So, Mr. Bishop. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hurd. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Hatcher. Uh oh. Mr. Hatcher. Present. Okay. Do you have who you need with you, Mr. Ferguson? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And and um, everyone else that you had with you, um, let me see who you had. Um, um, Miss um, Miss Farrell. Present. Um, uh, Mr. Patel. Yes, ma'am. Okay, I think was that, and then um, Mr. Schneider. Here, here. Uh, Mr. Barnett Woods. I think he had to get off. Um, Mr. Masog, are you back on? Oh, oh, I'm present, Mr. Barnett Woods. Oh, Barnett Woods. Okay, you're back, Mr. Masog. Yes. Okay. Madam Chair, I'm here. Okay, good. And Ms. Kosak. Present. Everybody's back. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so who? Commissioner Geraldo, he his, yeah, he's. Okay, oh, okay. So Commissioner um, Geraldo was asking some questions, and um, and then we do, and Mr. Hatcher, we needed you to start to address some of these. Um, Correct. You, yeah, you were talking, I think. Right. Right. Well, I was talking. Oh, Mr. Geraldo, I said, okay. I was, uh, I was following up on what uh, Commissioner Dorner uh, had been saying earlier and and commenting on, and Ms. Stephanie, I'm sorry, I didn't get your last name, so apologize. Farrell. I apologize. Farrell. Stephanie. Carol. No, Farrell. F I, as I, a Frank. Okay. I was just. I, I could not agree less with your comment with respect to putting the parking lot and, and seeing how that was fit in with an urban design because I think about the projects, a lot of the recent projects that I've seen in Arlington, Alexandria, uh, Sherlington, Washington, D.C., and Rockville, where they do put the parking lots, they'll usually put them underneath and uh, so I don't see how you view this as being compatible with a transit-oriented uh, development concept. So I think that we, one is we do have a combination of below grade and surface parking. We have definitely done at similar metro-centered sites in Prince George's County with approved DSPs a mixture of uh, below grade or structured, sometimes above grade structured or tuck under and surface parking. We have definitely had um, urban, new urbanists, we are a new urbanist firm, we've been around for 60 years, um, uh, new urbanist centered design that includes surface parking. It is not that you cannot create a new urbanist, active pedestrian mixed use environment and have surface parking. Um, I think the way the way that the building is oriented and where the, the surface parking is located is that's what makes it a more urban um, condition. And I think the amount, the the, the small amount that's um, located in uh, to the side of the building on Addison Road is 
a, a common thing that we deal with all the time, again, when you're in these um, locations that will have both a mix of pedestrians, because we do want to encourage pedestrian um, use of this building and the retail, but we'll also have a high quantity of vehicular traffic. And in order to make the retail successful, um, you want to make it um, easy or clear to vehicular uh, patrons that there is um, parking that they can access. A lot of the locations that you might be thinking of in your mind or that Mr. Mr. Hurd showed have street parking immediately in front of all these retail um, locations. There is no street parking in, in this location. So this is gives that what quote unquote teaser parking that helps make the retail successful and does not, uh, I think, uh, detract from the ability to make it a, a, an urban mixed use building. Well, I'm thinking about what Commissioner Dorner said earlier in terms of orienting the, the parking lot towards the center of the property. And there's prime examples in this region. If you go over to Pentagon City and you go to the where there's a teeter and there's, uh, I think, a DSW and a bunch of stores right up to the sidewalk, and they have parking behind them and you can't see the parking. I, it, to me, just having part a, a large one-acre parking lot right there on, on Addison Road, it, it, it makes it, you know what it makes it look like? Like a shopping center. That's what it makes it look like. But is this going to be a shopping center with, um, with um, a, a residential on the first level also? I mean, this is what I'm trying to... I don't think there should be residential. I understand, person. but that's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking, Mr. Hatcher and and okay. and Ms. Farrell, because I'm trying to understand. Ms. Farrell just said vehicular traffic and pedestrian um, access, and and what about this? Does this wall invite pedestrian access? So I, I, this is Chris Hatcher for the record. I think I think there are two two slightly different discussions going on with respect to the surface parking lots or the, the zones for the surface parking lots. And I think that in staff's, um, to, to speak best about it, if staff's, uh, their PowerPoint could be brought up with the illustrative, we can speak more clearly to that, if that's all right. Okay. PowerPoint. Staff. Um, Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington. And while, while that's being pulled up, I would call my colleagues' attention to the staff report on page 11, uh, section B, specifically where it discusses the setback and kind of the impacts related to the metro tunnel and why the setback is as it is. And then Mr. Hatcher, you know, um, I, I appreciate kind of the general comments, but I think, I know I am, and I believe my colleagues are also looking for a higher degree of specificity with regards to a response to some of these issues. Um, oh, absolutely. And I'm just reminding myself of the tunnel. So there are implications here with regards to why, you know, the, the, the setback is as it is and why the staff is making the determination that they're making, but it's your job respectfully to, to, draw, to lift that out and, and, you know, make those points clearer for us. Understood, Commissioner, and thank you very much. Um, while, while, while that's coming up, I would just like to uh, say a few things about some of the very specific questions that were asked, uh, particularly one question was discussing undergrounding of the utilities. Uh, we are indeed undergrounding the utilities on the site. Um, that's memorialized in condition C1, C1C. Um, where it specifically says we will underground utilities on site and furthermore will contribute to the undergrounding on, on, a, on a more global level. I think, uh, I think Mr. Hearn even indicated that you were um, undergrounding utilities on site. I think he was looking beyond, but yeah. there's still a legal issue there too. But you're going to contribute? Right. Okay. Yeah. Which I, I, I think, excuse me? I, I, I think there is a... Well, uh, hold on a second. Which illustrative are you trying to get to, Mr. Hatcher? We're, lo we're looking here. This, uh, that one right there. Okay, thank you. 
yeah, I think there are legal issues with um, requiring us to do off-site improvements to these infrastructure. I mean, more particularly the, the, the utilities. Um, but even though there are legal hurdles regarding whether the board, in our opinion, whether the board has authority to, to require us to do those off-site improvements, we are clearly willing to proffer that, that amount of funds so that they can be done as other developments along Addison Row or Central Avenue or in proximity to this metro continue to come online. Um, and th this is helpful because I think one of the things that uh, Ms. Borden uh, brought up was the specific standard as it relates to this parking lot, parcel 87. Um, you can see this, this parking lot, and we've done our best to design it, and I think and it's clear that staff agrees, is is indeed breaking up, um, is being broken up into smaller defined areas separated by plantings, which is why you don't necessarily see in our staff and in, in our analysis or in the staff report a deviation from this standard because it was managed um, in such a way to try to, to try to satisfy that standard. But taking a step back, um, that that standard, I, I, the way I always view this, and the way that we're viewing this as potentially as a phase one to a, a larger project, and and coincidentally that parcel 87 could be phase two because it's perfectly rectangular and has that place right there. I think if you look at applicant exhibit three uh, from Iman LLC, you'll specifically see that we only have the ability to land, we only have a land lease for that. He's retained the rights for the air rights specifically so that a vertical building can go up over it. And so to the extent that there are concerns that it, it might give the appearance of a, a commercial shopping strip or, or something like that, I, I think that this is that there hasn't been a lot of new vertical mixed use product in this submarket. I think what we're, what we're trying to do is, is bring vertical mixed use product to the submarket, but we can't bring multiple buildings at one time. Um, and, and candidly, we don't have the authority to. Um, but what we can do is we can bring a, the first, the fir what could be considered a first phase of, of it to try to get to a place where this, this submarket can be to, to see how well uh, the, the units lease up check the absorption to see how well the retail leases up with this teaser with this teaser re with this teaser parking spaces so that that phase two could happen on that parcel 87. I think a lot of people have done a lot of development throughout the county and I've oftentimes found and you can see it in DC that one of the most easy one of the easiest things to redevelop is a surface parking lot. There are no environmental features on it. There are um, that in, in any of the issues that would otherwise be associated with the green field don't don't necessarily exist, and it's and it's already generally been graded. It, it, this is essentially a, a perfect pad for a future building at a later date once there once this market and this plan has been tested and proven to be um, to absorb all this product like we think it is. Because we think it is, we're invested. My client is investing time and money and effort, and they believe in this corner, they believe in this site, and they believe in this plan, and that's why they're that's why they're investing their dollars. Mr. Hatcher, Hatcher, let me stop you for a quick second. So, two things. First of all, I was remiss in not checking to ensure that our legal counsel is back on. Um, uh, Mr. Warner and Ms. Borden. David Warner's here. Deborah's here. Okay, wonderful. Okay, thank you. And then what, what you're saying, Mr. Hatcher, which escaped me before, you're saying that this is not one big parking lot. It is broken into smaller parking lots with, that are separated by medians with landscaping. You're saying it does meet the standard, too? Correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. What, uh, about, what about the lighting? Saying that Sorry, guys. What about the lighting? Um, I'd like to turn to Tori Gallus. Jennifer, can you speak to the lighting? It's Stephanie. Stephanie. So the, the, yeah, so 
the the lighting that's shown on Addison and Central and Selma is the existing street lighting. Any um, lighting that's proposed, you know, any um, additional walkways that are created inside the right of way have been provided with additional new lighting. What kind of additional new lighting? There is a combination of bollards um, at the plazas and the residential entrance that are created off of Central, and then um, you know in the parking lot it would be larger pole lighting. So, is it and building master lighting as well? So no aesthetic pleasing lighting is that what you're saying? No, that's not what I'm saying. The the bollard lighting and the building lighting, um, I think there may be examples in the landscape drawings of those um, are absolutely, you know, a decorative lighting that's provided to activate those areas. When you talk about these parking spaces in the front, how, I mean, uh, uh, the, on this parking lot, how many are we talking about again? Total on surface? Yes. So it's 122 total above grade and 38 below grade, um, but they're broken, like we said, they're broken up into smaller pieces. I believe the part that's on lot five is about 20, you know, there's eight on the side. There's, they are broken up into smaller um, pieces. Madam Chair, this is Andrew yeah. Bishop from okay. uh, 20, 22 of those surface spaces are reserved for the commercial development, which is already being reduced by 50%. And I think there's only 10 spaces on that area of concern on Edison Road. Um, oh, thank you. Okay, one more question for uh, Ms. Farrell. Um, yeah. tell, uh, please explain to me how you said that this invites vehicular um, Access and traffic, and and, verse, and and additionally pedestrian. And tell me how tell me how the pedestrian, how the wall is inviting to the pedestrian um, traffic. Access. Well, I think right, and I think that there's again, as Mr. Hatcher was saying, there's sort of two two things we have to look at on Central Avenue. Um, again, we have created a series of. Um, outdoor spaces and activation through design um, that will encourage pedestrian use, enliven the streetscape, um, and provide a comfortable pedestrian um, experience. There's the corner plaza with a public art feature. It also provides opportunity for um, additional bike parking um, to encourage bike use to this location. That's also shown there. An outdoor seating area for the retail which will, again, help make the retail more viable and activate the street. Um, the main residential entrance and associated bar bike parking at the residential entrance, as well as the residential amenities on the ground floor that are shown right next to the lobby in blue, that's in the yellow. That's all the resident, that's the club room, the fitness room, um, all of those amenities. That's another device we often use in these projects is locating the residential amenities on the ground floor because they are active and they get used at many different times of day um, by the residents. And an outdoor space that's associated um, with that, which again, it provides uh, use of this outdoor area um, by residents and by many different and, and at many different times of the day and in, and in addition to landscaping I think that there is certainly um, nothing you know uh, that's uh, against the principle again the, the principles of new urbanism creating retail plazas creating landscaped areas creating residential active outdoor use spaces those are all in um, in service of of creating that um, uh, active retail frontage. Um, on, on Addison Road, that's where the vehicular entrance will be. Um, and I think that the, the screening that we have in front of the, um, in front of the parking, the, the, the screening that we have in front of the parking, which is, you know, a low wall with some fencing and landscaping, 
I, I don't think that that detracts from the overall, um, again, experience of this as an urban building, but it makes it easier for someone who wants to come to this retail in a car to understand where they need to go. Okay, let me say this. Um, I want to see if the board has any other questions of anyone. And also, um, Mr. Hurd, you have the um, opportunity to, to, um, to um, question yeah, Ms. Farrell, too, if you like. Okay, somebody else is talking. Somebody else is talking. Turn your mics off. Turn mics off. Okay. Um, so if... if um, Madam Chair, this is Chris Hatcher. Yes, okay, hold on a second. So I want to make sure that some... Um, that... Uh, that you know you can you can you can res continue to respond, uh, Mr. Hatcher and, and Mr. Hurd. You'll have the opportunity to talk with uh, to question Ms. Farrell. But what I really want to point out is that pretty soon we're going to have to head towards wrapping this one up. We have another one, and I do want to tell you that this go-to meeting has a finite ending time. There's there's a there's a window period that cannot be extended. So within we're we're going to. Um, wrap this up in about in about hopefully within this hour but if need be there will be another number that's provided because we can no longer proceed on this number because it because the the window that we have will come to an end so we will and, and by 430 we're going to give you the new number um, you know if, if we have to continue on which it looks like we will probably for the next case okay everybody got that Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, thank you. Okay. So, all right. Uh, Mr. Hatcher, you want to continue? Yes. Um, additionally, I know that there were some questions regarding uh, the utility of the, or the usability of the metro, of the metro parking garage across the street. We did um, explore perhaps using some of those parking spaces to fulfill our required parking obligation of 160 spaces. Um, there were there were some some very specific legal issues which sort of prevented us from doing that um, because the, the the zoning ordinance requires um, us to be able to have those spaces in perpetuity if they're provided off site, but WMATA wouldn't necessarily give us a long term lease or anything that would satisfy that legal obligation, and so for purposes of uh, we don't debate that. We, we don't debate about how well or how much that parking garage is utilized. We, we just can't use it to fulfill our required parking obligations on, on this site. Um, additionally, at, at this point, I think um, it might be helpful to have Mr. Ferguson address some of the, the more specific uh, development district standard issues. For, for example, the, the why the, the wall along Addison Road is there and it did, and right. Okay, this is why the uh, wall on Addison Road is there. Okay, Miss, um, Mr. Hatcher, Mr. Um, Hurd does have the right to question Ms. Farrell. Well, let me see if Mr. Hurd, you have any questions. Um, I guess uh, just a couple and, and, and also, <coughs> excuse me, because um, I think everybody's getting a little, um, uh, everybody wondering what the wall looks like and everything else. Um, if, if someone could pull up um, my exhibit 16. It's also on slide 18. Isn't it on slide 18 too? Uh, not the one that I'm trying to get to. Okay. Um, slide, slide 16, I mean exhibit 16. Um, is um, the applicant's landscape plan, and I think it just clearly shows what the wall looks like. Okay. Uh, this is not. This is no, no. This is the exhibit. Um, exhibit sixteen. Well, to the Dropbox folder. That's right. The Dropbox. Okay, so if we could blow that up a little more. Um, if you go to page uh, seven of that exhibit, 
Um, I'm going to be looking at phase seven and eight primarily. Uh, so seven, yeah. Go back up to the. Uh, is that seven? Yeah, right. Keep keep leaving it. <laughs> no, pay seven. There we go. So that wall. Oops. <laughs> he says you keep leaving it. Okay. Five, six. No, stop. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so this wall here on the uh, left, figure five, is, this is the wall that's supposed to be on, on the Central Avenue frontage over there by the housing, is that right? Correct, and that was, there was a comment um, from staff during the SDRC that uh, there being also a concern about noise. So they had asked for a more solid wall at that location in terms of noise. I think that in their last, um, you know, uh, round of comments is provided in the staff report, they've noted that, um, you know, it may be the height of it could be reduced or that it could be a more of a combination of a, a rail and a landscape. Um, but, the, but the noise concern, if I understood it correctly, was that um, you're having these recreational residential areas um, right next to Central Avenue because you have residential uses on the first floor, right? And that's, that's, that's the noise the corner, uh, Principal Council, can I interrupt for a second? You can. Um, staff may want to clarify this, but I believe that the fencing is a requirement imposed by the District Council. Uh, well, respectfully, the district council ordered a wrought iron fence around the whole development. This is my point about the district council's, ex, you know, uh, <laughs> ultra virus action. They want a they want a wrought iron fence around the whole development. That was one of the conditions they imposed. So none of this is in, in compliance with the district council. Um, but the district council didn't have the authority to do it in the first place. So it was void ab initio. It's, 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 it's unlawful. And besides that, though, this is a separate DSP. This is a this is a this is a revised DSP. It's treated like an original DSP. Um, but in any event, so that's the that's the that's the fencing in front. And if you go to page eight. And if we could just magnify that a little bit. Bring that to like 50 or 60, 50 or 75 percent. Okay. Now, yeah, kind of scroll so you can see it over there. I go up, up a little bit, a little to the left, up, up to the right. A little more. Okay, stop, please. Okay. So uh, this is this is the the wall, and it says it, it's a. 30 inch brick wall on top of a go a little over to the left a little bit. 30 inch brick, brick wall and a 42 inch. So it's a six foot high with a wall and a fence. Is that right? Correct. And, okay. and with so, landscaping and you see, in front of it, yeah. And, you, and if, you go, if you go back to the right, you see the perspective of somebody walking along Addison Road and you see how far that is from the building, right? That, 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 that depicts the perspective of a pedestrian walking along Addison Road, correct? That is a section through Addison Road, yes. Okay. It is not a full oh. site section, it is just through that area, correct? So it, it's it's through the it's through the it's through the portion of the site that's blocked by the wall along Addison Road. That's the whole portion of the street, except for the corner, right? Um, and the entrances. Yeah. And the and the car entrance. So 
except for the car entrance and the and the corner of, of of Addison and Central, everything else is blocked by this wall, right? It is not a solid wall. It is a mixture of wall, fencing, and landscaping. It's it's blocked by landscaping and a six foot high structure. Fence. Structure. I mean, he's, okay, okay. We're, we're doing yeah. semantics. It's, he's talking about the height. The height that yeah. that is an yeah. accurate the description of Correct. the height. Yeah. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. So that I think that was the. Um, at, you also said something about. Um, the surface parking being in support of retail, um, but obviously um, uh, street parking could be in support of retail as well. She said there was no street. Correct. Well, there, there, there was no, well, there's nothing there. There's not, there's, there's, no, there's no parking there, but it's not, but the applicant could, could construct street parking and that's indeed one of the, um, one of the alternate methods of, of, of providing parking is to provide street parking. Uh, and, it, and that's what happens at most, um, you know, new urban design places, including there's no street parking, for instance, at the building you designed in front of the, the streetcar on, 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 on uh, H Street. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's no surface parking to attract, uh, you know, retail customers. Is there? There are, there may not be street parking at every location. I don't think that that means that that this street park, this parking is not valid. Okay. Um, and and it, would, it would also be, again, outside the purview of the developer to create okay. street parking. That would okay. be just, just another right. another quick question. They and and, and, and this parking um, is being requested in satisfaction of parking requirements, right? This is not um, optional parking that you're seeking. So this is that right? Correct. So it's 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 not the case that you intend for this this is optional parking that you've just decided to use as a placeholder for a future phase of development. You're seeking this parking lot because you're seeking this to satisfy parking requirements. Correct, we are satisfying the, the zoning requirement. As you know, we do feel like this, the current um, parking requirement for this area is high and that's why we push for the reduction in parking. And there is already a reduction in commercial parking, but this is what is required by zoning, correct? So one option that the planning board has then is to just further reduce the parking requirements so that you don't need the surface parking on, on parcel 87. That's an option, right? I don't think that is no. an option. Yeah, we follow yeah. certain requirements. It's not an arbitrary decision we make. Commissioner Washington speaking. Mr. Well, I, I, I guess you would like to, to respond to the remainder of the questions, hopefully before this, this, uh, um, yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm just clarifying that part of the, uh, part of the, one of the, one of the things that the planning board could do and one option is to decide that the surface parking on that parcel is not needed. Um, particularly given uh, the proximity of the site to Metro. It's already, but they um, didn't, they didn't file, already proposing. They didn't file a, a, a DPLS. The pro, um, well, that, okay, I don't think someone, uh, so what, I what, need legal to address that, but okay. Well, this, this, is, this is what I was gonna say was, it, it, they've actually already proposed that, staff has already proposed a deviation from parking and I'm suggesting that they could just propose a further deviation okay. um, under that same principle. Okay. Okay, let me let And me that's do all the questions I have, okay, good. Stephanie, I'm sorry. Okay. All right, so now we're going back to Mr. Hatcher. I mean, and, and it's important to note that a lot of the, a lot of the, the wall discussion, you, you don't see deviations from the development district standards for us doing that because the walls are actually required as a function when you to, to, to shield the parking. 
that those 10 parking spaces in front of the building, because I think that's what this image is really focusing on, what we don't want is to bring a building with retail, 11,000 square feet at this corner and not be able to find retailers. You can see that up and down Route 1. You can see that in and around um, more so now than before because of pandemic reasons. But you can see that, you know, in Largo Town Center for any number of reasons. What, we, what we're trying to design is a successful vertical mixed-use product with some teaser parking to make sure that the first step out of the block is the most successful step so that we can move on to a later phase or that another developer at another stage can do another building which can equally be successful. I think that there are a lot of things in this plan that are uh, important, but you can't pile everything on one person, on one developer, and certainly not certainly not the first developer out of the box um, to, on, a, on a very prominent corner. Um, again, with that said, I, I would like to, to pass um, to, to Mr. Ferguson to go through some of the more specific development standards, because I think a lot of some of what we're talking about deals with some of these standards, which we aren't requesting deviations from, but okay. uh, because we're not requesting deviations from, we have to do some of these things. All right, let me, let me just say this. We're going to hear um, from Mr. Ferguson, and then we need to be about the business of wrapping this case up. Because we have another one. We're, we're clearly going to have to switch to another line in order to get to the other one. I'd like to be able to wrap this one up if we can. Um, um, I, I, I want to make sure everyone's had the opportunity to say something and present their cases and to ask their questions. Um, but we don't, there has to be some reasonable um, expectation of concluding this matter. So, um, so I'm going to allow Mr. Hatcher to go forward. Um, we'll have to figure out a reasonable time to take the break. We'll figure out what happens with Mr. Ferguson, but maybe as we get to, maybe we resume. Well, let's see what happens first. And I know they're getting the next number, but I'd like to wrap up one before we break, if we can, before we get to the next. M Madam Chair, this yes. is Commissioner Giroir. I just have a question with regards to the standards on page 11. And, who, who, um, who are you asking? Who, who, who? Well, I mean, I want to I could ask staff, I could ask Mr. Hatcher, but I want to know, number one, do you have uh, anything from WMATA that addresses the issue of uh, uh, the setback or using the, uh, the the line of influence. Did they give you something writing that says you cannot build up to this uh, to this line? Up to which line? Up to the the line of influence for Wamada. Because the issue is is the issue the issue that I have is the setback that's being proposed up from 12 to 60 feet from the right of way, as opposed to putting the building up to the uh, up to uh, the closest line in the street. Mm -hmm. The question was for Mr. Hatcher whether or not the developer had something from Met from Wamada that says where they could limit where they could begin the building. But the Hatcher not yeah. Yeah, I believe that dream is online. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Um, thank you for allowing me to answer that question. So the the question is not, I don't, well, the answer is not whether uh, we have the right to build over a uh, Wamata tunnel because uh, developments all over the region are actually built on top of developments at times. The question becomes a matter of cost. Oh. It is significantly exorbitant to build first near a WMATA tunnel, and then if you build on top of a WMATA tunnel, you really have to have a project where your rent will support that. So if you look in Prince George's County where the residential rents are an average of, call it $1.50 to $2.50 a square foot, 
as opposed to in the district where residential rents are going for four dollars a square foot or three fifty or five dollars a square foot that rent offset the cost that developers uh have to pay in order to build directly on top of Wamada uh, uh, tunnel or in the zone of influence and that's why you see a lot of developers in the suburban markets similar to where this parcel is located in the uh, Capitol Heights market uh, staying away from the zone of influence. There's already review process from a permit standpoint that Wamada has to issue because we're near the zone of influence but if we build on top of the zone of influence or build on top of the tunnel specifically, you can add five million dollars easy to this project, which is one reason why this project took so long. When we looked at the project, we had three or four major regional general contractors work with us over a two-year period with Tordy Dallas to look at how the project could go forward from a cost-effective standpoint, and that's why we continue to work with the planning board staff and reduce the amount of underground parking because this project cannot move forward if, from a cost prohibitive standpoint if we have to build on top of the tunnel. If we have to build on the tunnel, no way this project, this three acre parcel will be left vacant for a long time to come. Sir, did you identify yourself for the record? I didn't hear it. I apologize. This is Omar Kareem with uh, 6301 Central Avenue, LLC. Thank you. And Madam Chair, if I could follow up with, with Omar Kareem, this is Brad Hurd. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so, so, but nobody's talking about building on top of the Wamata Tunnel, and nobody's talking about building near the tunnel. We're talking about that line of influence is, uh, is 25 feet away from the tunnel. Um, and it's the line that WMATA, um has provided that that says that they don't need to get involved with your project if it's behind the line of influence. Isn't that right? No, that's not. No, that's not correct at all. You, you're 100 percent uh, wrong with that. We do have to get have WMATA review our plan, even though we're away from the zone of influence um, with respect to what people know what the zone of influence is. Um, uh, I, I also didn't say that we were, um, would be building over it. You, all developers want to stay as far away from the zone of influence as possible because it makes it exorbitantly more expensive. Um, we want to keep this project reasonable. We want to keep the pricing uh, affordable to the residents of Prince George's County where many of us um, on the call, including myself as a resident of Prince George's County, we don't want to make this project prohibitive. Um, um, secondly, the project would not be cost, uh, we couldn't build this project if we were even near the zone of influence. And so that's why the first thing we did when we um, uh, purchased this project and took, you know, uh, began working on it was to eliminate the a parking that was on uh, Central Avenue. It was a small parking lot there. We didn't think that was appropriate. We wanted to make it a more urban feel. But the second thing that we simultaneously looked at is to ensure that we stayed away from that zone of influence. And Torty Gallus, um, the third thing we did was, or simultaneously hired Torty Gallus, who has uh, probably more TLD experience in working with WMATA than uh, many, many other design firms in this region. and. Um, they can tell you, and, and it's what we're saying today is that um, from a cost standpoint, we cannot get near the zone of influence for this project would be cost prohibitive, just as we can't build uh, any more parking spaces uh, underground because it would be cost prohibitive. And hopefully, after we spend a significant amount of money to redevelop this project or to redevelop the site, and we are successful with leasing up. There'll be other parcels adjacent to this, as we talked about earlier, and uh, all along uh, Central Avenue, who will, um, other developers will be able to invest in the submarket and, and make this a truly wonderful uh, destination, um, add to the wonderful destination that um, this submarket is. 
Well, it's uh, it's, it's kind of hard to to without without you know figures in front of us. It's kind of hard to determine the the, um, the relative expense of developing you know at or twenty feet behind the zone of influence. I, I, I don't think that's a okay. yeah. I, I appreciate your thought, but I'm trying to make a point here. Um, the the point of the zone of influence, um, and we and, and this is an issue. I mean, if the applicant that has the burden of proof, but the, the zone of influence um, is a line that's 25 feet away from the from the tunnel. Um, it's covered extensively in the WMATA adjacent development manual. Um, you know, if there's a witness from WMATA that can speak to it more appropriately, then that might be helpful as well. But it's it, it's. I mean, Mr. Kareem has already said that um, people routinely build transit oriented developments on top of the Wamata tunnel. And so I, but I also uh, say I also yeah. say that I, I also said to be clear that it's not happening in Prince George's County because it's well, called no, for the rent. Prince George's what, County what, right now. I'm sorry. All right, hold on a second. I cannot have people in stop. We cannot have people I'll interrupting each me. other. Okay. So who I don't if someone can finish I, I did Okay. Um, I didn't. I don't. I don't have a further question for Mr. Kareem. Mr. Kareem, were you cut off? Did you finish answering? Matt, yeah. Wait, Mr. hold Kareem. on a second. Hold on a second, Commissioner. Okay, um, Mr. Kareem, did you finish your response? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner Geraldo. So, Mr. Kareem, do you have anything in writing from Wamada? that says that if you build next to the uh, the line of influence that it's going to cost x amount of dollars I, i'm having a hard time if you're not over the tunnel but you're just by the line of uh, the, the line of influence where does the cost come from that they have to review it um, this, this adjacent manual that mr heard referenced is a extremely complex manual and it requires all type of coordination with WMATA uh, it, the prior to a building permit being issued to the developer or general contractor. And so we've been working with WMATA. Um, we are have been awarded development sites by WMATA in the past. We have worked with their construction division and we are very familiar with the adjacent manual that um, Mr. Hurd reference and from a cost standpoint we, we began talking to our general contractors um, everybody it, it is well known in the construction industry in this region that uh, if you have to even work with WMATA it's a couple of million dollars number one construction costs are a couple of million dollars just off the break uh, secondly commissioner the, the time that it takes for WMATA to review um, your drawings and coordination, that can add a year to your development project. And if you have carrying costs, if you own the land or um, are paying for other costs, that can just drag out a project um, even longer. And, um, you know, Stephanie Farrell from Torty Gallus is on the line. She could probably attest to um, the difficulty that developers have when they have to deal with WMATA. They deal with WMATA um, in a jurisdiction like the district, for example, or in other, you know, or uh, populations or areas where you can uh, charge a lot more rent, and that becomes the offset. In the uh, suburban, more suburban areas, like we're talking about with this site, developers stay and general contractors stay way far away from having to even deal with WMATA. For example, I think Mr. Hatcher talked about our discussion, even leasing parking spaces. We were willing to, you know, we had a number of conversations with the Metro Authority about leasing parking spaces, and um, it became, um, and that's just leasing parking spaces, and that became a, uh, a, pretty, a pretty insurmountable um, ordeal. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right, Mr. Hatcher. 
Are you done? And, and, and I need to, pretty soon, in about 10 minutes, I'm going to provide this number, but I sure would like to wrap this up. Okay. Mr. Hatcher. Okay. I, I would just like to, to offer Mr. Ferguson. Okay. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, Mr. Hatcher asked me to speak to, to, uh, to some of the standards. So the first one, uh, standard S2 parking area standard D requires screening of parking areas from the adjoining right of way with the masonry wall. That, that has been the, the, the subject of, of uh, discussion. I think it serves a purpose for the real lot, for the rear uh, lot. I think it serves actually much less of a purpose for the 10 spaces we're talking about um, next, to, next to the retail space. And I will, I will echo, by the way, Ms. Farrell's comments. Um, I know Commissioner Dorder is very familiar with the Route 1 corridor. Think about projects like the Enclave at the end of Greenbelt Road which has ground floor retail and it does have surface parking and it's sort of on top of its garage behind it but the retail there has remained empty for more than a decade uh, even down at the university uh, view and the and the varsity right next to 30,000 um, students they've had a continuous turnover of, of spaces there Looney's Grill I think is the only one that's a continuous tenant because there's no visible parking. When we talk about this as an urban area, we're speaking aspirationally. Uh, if you look at a, at a wide aerial of, of uh, centered on this site, you'll see that the nearest multifamily are two small, um, two small uh, complexes at the entrance to Peppermill Village, approximately a half mile east. You have to go almost a mile down to Ronald Road on Addison Road before you get any more. And if you just look at the site, you've got commercial development along Route 1, everything else is single-family dwellings. And so when you have an area that has such an actual low development or dwelling unit density, as this one does, to, to provide retail that doesn't have some uh, acknowledgement of the vehicular traffic that's actually going to drive its success is... is uh, it's just not reasonable. You, you commissioners have a balancing act to perform here. Um, there are standards like the, the, the wall that we look at and say, does it make sense for these 10 spaces up here? It might be better if you said, we want to modify the standard for those 10 spaces and remove that wall so that there's less of an obstruction, even a visual obstruction in between the sidewalk on Addison Road and the retail spaces. Um, you know, as far as the other the other standard regarding um, building siting, so Mr. Hurd has said repeatedly that the standards require a uniform, um, you know, a uniform conformance to the build to line. That's actually not correct. The standards aren't specific at all. Uh, standard S3C says a front build to line between 10 and 15 feet from the right of way shall be established for office, retail, commercial, and institutional buildings, which run on the 214 Madison Road. Staff has pretty consistently said, this is a retail commercial building because there aren't any standards that directly apply to mixed-use buildings in the, in the Addison Road DDOC. That was one of the very earliest DDOs that was, that was created, and I don't know that it was as artfully drafted as some of the more recent ones. But it doesn't say what a build-to line is. Certainly, there are many parts of this building that do conform to that standard. Um, and there are parts that, as we've been discussing at length, do not. But nowhere does it say there has to be a continuity. So features of this building which make it more attractive, which, which implement other parts of the standard to emphasize the corner and to uh, emphasize the primary entrance on Central Road are articulated with projections in the building. And that, that's wholly appropriate and not, um, you know, not, not in conformance with the provision that the whole building has to be jammed right up to the, uh, right the build-to line. Those variations make for a better building. Um, so I, I do think you have to look can you, can you a little bit broader. Can you repeat that again why it can't be right up to the build-to line? 
I'm not sure I understood. Yes, Commissioner. Well, I, I didn't say it couldn't. I said it's better if it doesn't. Why? So there are there are there are conditions. Uh, excuse me, conditions. There are standards um, for for building articulation. There are 87. I did go through every one of them in my report, but I don't remember right now where they all are. And I don't want to waste your time by flipping through them to find them. But there are safe. There are standards that require articulation of primary entrance. This really nice architecture does that with projections that modify how much of that building, um, you know, varies from its from its principal length. It projects at the building corners to emphasize the corners, which is a requirement of another standard. And again, as Mr. Hatcher said, this is why you don't see more modifications to the standard because of those 87, this development conforms to at least 84 of them. I would even contend, staff does agree, but I would contend that because a substantive, but certainly not all, of the building, particularly along Zelma and the western edge of, of Central Avenue, conforms to the Build 2 line, that it meets the standard as it would in the new zoning ordinance. The new zoning ordinance only addresses, it defines build two lines and it says a certain percentage of the building's width has to be met along the build two line and that, and that percentage isn't even 100, it varies depending on, on the zone in the new ordinance. Now that's not legally relevant here, but it is relevant to the extent of what should you be expecting this applicant to do. And that's why when we go through all of these standards, whether it's the standards for this wall that we put in, that uh, would it be better if it weren't? Maybe. Um, or even the standards for, um, for conformance to the build two line. Rather than being doctrinaire and rigorous and just saying these are the words, it has to be that way, whether it makes this building better or not, I think it's short-sighted. I think one thing that would not be possible if there was a really rigorous conformance to the, to the letter of the law is the plaza that's in front of the commercial areas, which really, really livens up that corner and will draw activity, not just to this site, but to the metro station. I think just from an urban design standpoint, that's, that's a really, really strong feature that this modification from the standard enables. So. I think you as planning board members, you do have a tough task in front of you because there are a lot of good ideas, but it's, I think, less useful to be doctrinaire and more useful to look at, okay, this is the first multifamily building within a half a mile of the, uh, of the metro. We want this retail to be viable. How can we accomplish that? Can we sacrifice our principles for 10 parking spaces? That's, that's what's before you. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Does the board have any questions of Mr. Ferguson? Madam Vice Chair. Excuse me. Uh, my name is... Hello. Hello? Hello. I'm um, Irina Pariatka. I'm a landscape architect. I just wanted to know that there is actually no wall right next to the 10, um, 10 parking spaces. Well, the, the proposed wall and fencing um, is shown uh, right next to the large parking lot uh, along Edison Road and along Zelma Avenue. But um, on Edison Road, when there is a, uh, is it, uh, the 10 parking spaces we're talking about, we're only showing landscape screening and not the fencing and wall. Then Mr. Hatcher should ask for a modification. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at that. Uh, Ella, she, she was not next, Jane, who is, who is I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand. She did identify herself. She's not on my list. She's an architect, I think. Okay. Okay. I'm an architect. architect. What's, and tell me your name. Irina Korepsky. Okay. okay. And you are with whom? Are you part of the... Carvalho and Good. Carvalho and Good. Okay, it's on here. If, if you look at the rendering, the thick black line represents the wall. Oh, so you're in this. We and have you signed up for 12. Okay, we do have you sign up on the next case. Okay. 
Okay, got it. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. If we look at the wall, what? So if you see the, uh, the black line represents the wall uh, and the fence on top of it. And the, the wall and fence uh, is going uh, along Edison Road and along Delma Avenue, only one uh, around the large parking lot, but not at the uh, area where we have 10 parking spots. Where we have, uh, right next to retail, we have a 10 parking spots, and it, it doesn't have a wall in the fence, just some landscaping for screening. Okay. Um, does the board have, and let me stop for a second because does the, let me find out if the board, the planning board members have any questions of Mr. Ferguson uh, at this particular time or Ms. Uh, Koretsky. Okay. Um, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, I, I don't have any questions, but there's been a lot of discussion about a wall and, uh, if you're familiar with that area, I really do think there is a need for a wall in that particular uh, location. Uh, may not have to be that high, but definitely a wall along that line. I don't have a question. Okay. Commissioner Washington. Uh, no questions, Madam Chair, but I also concur with Madam Vice Chair's comments. Okay. Commissioner Geraldo. Uh, no, I have no further questions. Commissioner Dorner. No, okay, um, uh, Mr. Hurd, you had the opportunity to ask some questions. Let's uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair, I don't have any questions for these two. Thank you. Okay, at this point, um, we're, unless the board has any questions of anyone, Mr. Hatcher, you can go forward with, with your summation and then we are going to call for a vote. Got it? Understood. Thank you, Madam Everybody's Chair. had the opportunity to, te to testify. Everybody's had the opportunity to ask questions. The board's had opportunities to ask questions. The board still has opportunities to ask questions. But, um, Mr. Hatcher, you are on with your summation. I, I think a lot of things have been said through the course of this hearing, so I'm not going to belabor this because I know we have another matter right after it. Okay. But I would again like to thank the, the board and the staff for working with the applicant on this application. Uh, I think this is a critical corner, and I think this is the, the, a great first step, a great, uh, an incredibly great first step in order to activate this metro station and this site. And and what we're proposing in will in no way hinder further development along Addison and in this area to 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 redevelop perhaps a surface parking lot as 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 there is information in the record to to support that. Mm -hmm. And additionally, I think that the those 10 parking spaces, which we're only really talking about 10 parking spaces in front of in front of the commercial is, is necessary in order to make sure that that commercial remains viable so that as the next project comes on, they understand that this is a this is a sub market that can support that degree of commercial and more commercial. Uh, we've gone through each and every one of your questions um, and certainly willing to respond to any more that you have. But with that said, I would rely back on what I said um, in, in the beginning and respectfully request that the planning board uh, as part that the planning board adopt the findings of the facts and conclusion of law as outlined in the staff report uh, and uh, make the recommendation to the council to permit residential uh, units on the first, second, and third floor. Okay, let me let me. Um, Madam Chair, hold yes. on. A, hold on. A Madam second. Chair, yes. Hold on. Can you hold on one you second? Did ask the, the question. I'm sorry, but did we reference the letter from the city of Capitol Heights? We did. We did. It's, it, we have okay. a letter of approval. Okay. It's been Thank entered you. into the record. It is applicant's exhibit number. I gave it a number here. Four. It's applicant's exhibit okay. number four. Thank you. Um, the other thing I'd like to do is. Um, uh, I'm going to ask our board. I'm not a motion maker, so so I don't know who's going to make a motion, and 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 uh, and I don't know whether you need time or not. But um, we've heard a lot today. We may agree with the staff recommendation. We may ag agree um, with some of the um, change. You know, we may have some alterations. I don't know. I don't know who's going to make the motion, but.
Well, what, no, no, hold on. no, hold on, hold on. What I want to say, though, I want to get um, Ms. Borden and Mr. Warner, because one of the things I read was that um, that we cannot, our, our request that if we go with the staff recommendation, that we have our own findings, which if our findings happen to coincide with the, our staff's findings, then that is fine for uh, legally, I believe, to adopt our findings of staff as set forth in the staff report, if that's the way the motion is going. If we have a different motion, then we can make our own findings. If we have, if we partially support the applicant's findings and partially support Mr. Hurd's findings, I think we can do it that way. But I wanted to address the legal issue that was raised by Mr. Hurd in terms of adopting the findings of, of, of staff and, and, and um, so, Mr. Warner, Mr. Warner or Ms. Borden? Madam Chair, this yes. is Deborah Borden, Deputy General Counsel. I just want to I want to touch on that and and one other item, okay. uh, but it's all a, a, a matter of uh, your, your your authority to approve a site plan. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, your findings are your own. Your findings can be based on what staff has developed in their staff report. It can be partially based on that. It can be based on entirely what's happened here today at, at the hearing and everything in the record. Uh, you're the board, you're the decision maker. It's, it's up to the motion maker to identify uh, if, if they choose to um, which uh, findings they agree with staff on and which findings they don't and to identify new findings that will be um, put into the resolution of approval. Um, the other issue that I wanted to touch on is that Mr. Hurd had, had made a, uh, an argument that this board could simply decide to deny the site plan. And um, that's pretty difficult, actually, because a site plan is a plan of physical development. And that means that if you don't like something, or if you think that something, some aspect of the plan does not meet a particular finding, then you have to address it. You can't just deny the plan. You have to address it. You have to say, well, if you do X, Y, and Z, then the plan will be in conformance and we can approve it and that, and, and that will be a condition of approval. Um, you can't just deny it, and that's in accordance with, with uh, a case Sheets v. Frederick City, and it's a it's a pretty great case because it is a site plan case, and it and it talks about how because site plans are physical plans of development, they're not subject to visioning like a like a master plan would have it be subject to a vision. This is our vision. No, it's a it's a physical plan. It's the parking spaces are here, the building is there, the drive aisle is there. If you think something doesn't comply or co comport to the standards, then have them move it, okay? But you can't then just deny the plan unless literally there is no way to physically come into compliance. And that's a very rare thing. I'm not suggesting it never happens, but it's very rare. So for the motion maker, if you have a, a particular issue that you want to call out or that you want to discuss before you make your motion, I would encourage you to do that so that you can uh, uh, describe a motion that we can then turn into a resolution with, a, with the appropriate conditions and the appropriate findings that will match up. Um, and let's see, I think that was all that I wanted to make sure that I got on the record. Thank but you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, and Ms. Borden, and a resolution, whatever our resolution is, whatever the motion is, our resolution um, is the embodiment of our decision and that is voted on and if the planning board agrees with the resolution as we ha we always get it in advance we get to review it and if we agree with the resolution that uh, those are th that is our, those are our findings as set forth in the um, um, the actual vote prior to the resolution and 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 um, a and then uh, later as embodied in the resolution so that is a manifestation of our decision and our That's rationale right. for the decision I just want to make sure that's really clear. Okay. And now, Commissioner Washington, I th think you may have had a question or something. Uh, well, I was prepared to make a motion, Madam Chair, if you're ready for that. Okay. I'm ready. Uh, but before making the motion, let me uh, just, just offer a couple of comments. Um, the first being to thank everyone. Um, 
It has been a long afternoon. Uh, and Mr. Hurd, I'd like to also express my thanks to you for a very thoughtful and detailed presentation. Um, and in, in addition to the applicant um, uh, and his team, um, but I'm familiar, I'm very familiar with this area. And, and I just wanted to highlight a couple of things which, which are informing uh, the motion I'm about to make. And the first is that, you know, this particular area would greatly benefit from this project. For anyone who's familiar with it, uh, you know, I spend a good deal of time up and down 214, you know, back and forth to the airport and, and in other places. Um, and I want to thank the applicant for uh, making kind of an initial investment in this, in this area. Um, from my perspective, the applicant and his team and colleagues have addressed uh, the concerns that were expressed not only by me, but I, I think my fellow um, board colleagues as well. Um, and I take to heart uh, the comments that were made with regards to just the pure economics. You know, and, and, and it was referenced with regards to the line of influence and the metro tunnel and just how exorbitant the cost would be to get to a build to line. And I'm not that, um, I don't highly favor a build to line and I'm not um, opposed to the setback. And I'll tell you why, because I do believe that the court, the courtyard, the proposed courtyard is a very strong feature especially when I think about the art that we saw as part of the overall presentation. Uh, and I would, would, would ask my colleagues to, to, to be mindful or reminded of uh, various places in Washington, D.C. where they have that kind of art. And it has invited a lot of pedestrian traffic uh, as well as um, conversation. And then finally, before making the motion, um, I don't think we can let the perfect get in the way of the good. And it sounds like we're trying to be perfect, um, but I do believe that this is a good application. And so with that, Madam Chair, I move that we, and oh, and also, I would like to thank our legal counsel, uh, Mr. Warner uh, and Ms. Borden, um, for their comments throughout, uh, through, throughout the conversation, and Mr. Bishop, you as well. Um, and so with that, Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the findings of staff and approve the alternative development district standards as outlined in staff's uh, technical report A1, 2, and 3. Uh, I also recommend that we disapprove the alternative development district standard uh, as outlined in uh, the technical staff report uh, B1 and approve DSP-06001-03 and TCP2-013-20 along with the associated conditions as outlined in staff's report. And Madam Chair, I would further recommend um, uh, to the district council approval of an amendment to the use table in the 2000 approved sector plan and sectional map amendment for the Addison Road Metro Town Center and vicinity as amended to allow dwelling units on all floors of a building containing commercial uses. Four more stories in height in accordance with section 27548 26 B one B of the zoning ordinance. Um, and that's the motion. And with regards to the use table modification, um, I know some of my colleagues and others have commented uh, with regards to first floor residential mixed with retail. Um, but I'm very familiar with, with treatment such as that uh, around the country. I, I kept trying to think of one example here in the region, but could not. Um, and quite frankly, it, you know, it, it has worked very well uh, in other places. So long motion, but that's it, Madam Chair. We, and I second Dr. Bailey. Okay. We have a motion by Commissioner Washington, second by Madam Vice Chair Bailey. Um, is there discussion? Under discussion, um, I'll just put it out there because I'm going to vote against the motion. Um, I think there's still some, some aspects of the plan that, that need to be changed. Um, I don't think it, it requires a denial of the DSP. Um, I think it just requires a, a slight, some slight tweaks to some of the recommendations um, from staff. 
Um, and and I'm, I'm very familiar with these kinds of developments. I, if I was sitting on my rooftop right now, I could see the pallet. And if I was on the other side of the building, I could see the Yes Market and the Busboy and Poets that are used in some of these cases or some of the slides that we've talked about. Um, one of the problems that I have is that I'm, and I'm not trying to let details weigh me to, to go against this case or anything, um, but I do believe that it's, it's the applicant's burden of proof to, to convince us on stuff. Um, and I think it was just as they posed the questions of are we willing to, to kind of let go of the first multifamily building within a half mile of the metro for 10 parking spaces, um, I think you can turn that question on, on itself and say, are you willing to risk this entire project by the bad location of 10 parking spaces? And I think the answer that the applicant chose today was yes. Um, I, in, in an alternative motion, if this doesn't pass, that, that I, I don't mind making, um, or somebody else can, can make it and, and I would support it, I think that this building does need to actually go up to Addison Road. Um, and, and that's specifically on the um, S3, the building uh, siding and setback standard C. Um, I think we need to alter that to bring this up to that, that level. And you can tuck those parking spaces back behind that building. I say that, and I know it's successful because I live about a one and a half to two minute walk away from um, guests and, and best bo bus boys that have exactly that. They have parking on the street that's very limited to run in really quickly, but then they have a parking lot almost identical to how this is, um, back behind the site that they might one day build on top of, and they have parking tucked behind the building where the Yes supermarket is for people to go into. And there's, there's no confusion on the Route 1 quarter that there's a parking lot behind that building. So I, I don't think any of those points were, were necessarily um, going to receive much weight from me in terms of the, the, the points that are raised. And especially since the metro is across the street from where that parking is. That, that just really bothers me of not tucking it back in there. And in further support of this kind of a project, I would be totally fine with them mixing some of the parking spaces or if they think it's totally necessary having them but they need to have underground adding on an additional floor to, to the height of the building if that were possible. I, I would be entirely supportive of, of that to increase the density to make sure that this retail is successful um, and that, that the rest of the building is as well. I also don't think that we should be having the, the, the residential on that first floor. I think we should try and dedicate that to the retail space um, to try and, and, and have that be um, successful there as well. So I'm, I'm going to vote against this. Um, particular motion, and we'll see how it, how it comes out. Let me see. If, thank you, um, Commissioner Dwarner. Let me see if there's any other discussion. Um, um, Commissioner Geraldo, do you have any discussion? Yes, I, I support uh, Commissioner Dorner's comments. Uh, obviously, I want I want this area developed. I, I, I just get tired of hearing, "Well, we just can't do it in Prince George's, but it could be done everywhere else." And it's, it's just, and or this is going to be the first project in this area, so we got to make sure it's going to be successful. Well, the success comes in proper marketing. Uh, I don't think you should have residences on the first floor. Uh, I, too, would agree with letting the building go up another two or three floors and increase the density there. And and to re and get rid of some of those, get rid of some of that parking to support the retail and the commercial. So I'm I'm not convinced that they could not build it up to the line of influence. The building up to the line of influence by mere saying, "Well, you just uh, every contractor told me they have the burden of proof." I mean, they could have at the very least presented us with a letter and said, "Look, if you wanted to do this, it would cost this," or it would take this much longer time. Nothing. It's all hearsay. Uh, so I support Commissioner Dorn. I'm going to vote no against this, but I, I do want the project. I just think that it can be tweaked better and that we're just, we're just accepting less because it's in Prince George's. So I see where this is going. Okay. So um, is there any additional discussion? I would like to say... <coughs> Madam Chair. Yes. I, I just want to, to go on the record to say I'm not voting to get something less, uh, uh, and I, I'm not voting for something less. Uh, this is a region that I live in, and uh, this is a project that I think that, is, that uh, the community deserves. And I also know that I would not suggest that 
the uh, people walk from that metro across that street, uh, Central Avenue and the other street that borders that. I mean, it's it's a dangerous way to be crossing. I support 100% this project. Yes, there was a tweet that could be made, but also I know that a lot of the people who frequent this area and live in that area will be senior citizens. And so to have them walking from some distance to get to some place is just not, not what I think we should be doing and, and making sure that we house them in the same place where they can walk, work and shop and do all the things that are necessary. Uh, this is a project I think maybe there are some things that could be tweaked just a tad bit, but I certainly do support it. And it's something that I look forward to having in that spot from the time that I was on the council many years ago. And we've, it's taken us this long to get to an idea of a thought. I don't think it's less than. I think it's something that we can watch and watch it develop. And it's a starter for other things that would benefit that particular community, especially we're looking at young people coming back to that area. But at, the, at this present time, we certainly do have a lot of older citizens living in that community. Okay, I just want to say one thing, and I guess our attorneys better be ready and familiar with Robert's rules, because um, I'm looking at Mr. Hurd's um, PowerPoint, specifically um, uh, 14, slide 14 and slide uh, 13 and 14 and, and uh, with regard to the setback and I can live with the varied setback because it doesn't mean new urbanism doesn't necessarily mean that this is the only way to have the, the setback that it's got to be uniform so I can live with the varied setback and I can live with a lot of it and, and in some instances I do think what has been proposed is better I can even live with the 10 parking spaces the thing I'm having a problem with is the um, first floor uh, residential and I, I, I would like to see um, the, the, the residential um, confined to, the, I can deal with second floor, that's fine, but I, I, that's where I'm having an issue. So, okay, Matt? Yes, yes? Deborah Gordon, what I would suggest is that the motion maker agree to remove that portion of the motion and that you have a separate motion and a separate vote on that particular uh, recommendation because it's a recommendation to amend the use table um, that would go to the district council that you have a separate vote on that particular recommendation okay I was gonna okay. that was one way of doing it I was thinking of a substitute motion entirely or see how the motion maker and seconder if they were amenable to that well either either way okay. but I think if you do two motions that might actually be cleaner okay so Okay. Um, motion maker, Commissioner Washington. We well, I'm I'm happy with withdraw withdrawing uh, the recommendation to district council from my motion, and the rest of the motion stands. Seconder. I agree. Is that what we're saying? I thought there was only one portion that we are recommending. Yeah, only the. Are you use table i'm i'm saying that i concur with council just to remove the um right exactly and the rest that, of the motion that second floor that yeah okay i agree okay so the motion maker and the seconder um agree to the motion as presented by commissioner washington with the uh, removing the portion of the recommendation to the district council to amend the use table okay so that is the motion that's on the table now We've, is there any additional discussion? All Madam Chair? Yes? This is Chris Hatcher. Okay. Just just to help uh, help with the board, that the grade drops towards the back of the, uh, of the site. So if you take a look at the grading plans, functionally, because the garage is tucked under the building, functionally, it's good, those units are going to be a little bit higher. Okay. Than well, the grid. All right. Well, right now, that's a separate motion. So, at this point, okay. You mean the units on the first floor? That's what you're saying. Correct. Okay. So we'll. Okay. Well, right now we have one motion on the table. All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. Oh well, let me start, Madam Vice Chair. Good aye. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Um, Commissioner Dorner. No. Commissioner Geraldo. No. Okay, the motion carries 3-2. Okay, now, 
Commissioner Washington, you want to make your other motion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Well, I move. well, hold on a second. Before you make your other motion, did you want to? Uh, I mean, Miss Miss. Excuse me. I'm I'm sorry. I didn't hear you. I'm trying to figure out what's happening here. I'm sorry. I heard you say but I didn't know you voted. Yes, it was two, th uh, three. It was three, two. So that meant me, obviously. Yeah, that meant me. Yeah, but 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 that's the way Roberts rules you. I'm, I'm the tiebreaker. Okay. Um, so, um, Mr. Hatcher, you're trying to make a point about the grade. I mean, is that something you emphasized in, during this presentation that I missed a lot? Uh, it's certainly in the, the plans that are submitted, but it certainly wasn't specifically discussed. But towards the back of the property, the grade sort of, it goes, if you take a look at the grading plan, so when you're looking up at the building on, on Zelma, it's gonna, you're going to be looking at that garage. It's not going to appear as if it's on the ground floor from, from back there. Okay, thank you. Does, does the board have any questions? Is there a motion? Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, um, and I move that we recommend to district council approval of an amendment to the use table in the 2000 approved sector plan and sectional map amendment for the Addison Road Metro Town Center and vicinity as amended to allow dwelling units on all floors of a building containing commercial uses. Four more stories in height in accordance with section 275486B1B of the zoning ordinance. We have a motion. Is there a, is there a second? That Commissioner, um, uh, Vice Chair Bailey seconded. Is there discussion? All in favor of the motion indicate by saying aye. Oh, well, excuse aye. me, Madam Vice Chair. Excuse me, Madam Vice Chair. Aye. It's an aye. So, Madam Vice Chair. Aye. Commissioner Washington. Aye. Commissioner Dorner. No. Commissioner Geraldo. No. Um, the motion fails. I vote no. Motion fails. Is there a substitute motion? Sorry, as a, as a question of clarification from legal, what is, is there a building height limit in this area where we would not allow um, the building to go above six stories? I and believe the building height, I'm sorry, I believe the building height limit is 10 stories. Okay. Okay, so I'll make, I guess, a subsequent motion allowing, um, well, no, I, I never mind. I, I think that they can, if they can build up to 10 stories, they don't need to even do it on the second story if they don't want to, so I'm not going to make a motion for that. Well, let me ask this. Right now, the, the use table, let me get clarification. Right now, the use table allows the residential where? It only... Mark Ferguson, Madam Chair, on, on the fourth floor only. Okay. I, I mean, I would move, well, I can't make a motion. Uh, okay. Excuse me, Chair. I'm sorry, David Warner, Principal Counsel. Staff, can you clarify that? I, I thought that it had since been amended to allow for a residential on the second and third floors. <clears throat> this is Andrew Bishop. I believe you're correct, Mr. Warner, the second floor. Um, Mr. Hatcher, is that accurate? I think there's enough evidence in the record that would suggest that that is accurate. However, I think in an abundance of caution, as I said earlier, uh, we would request that the planning board, if it won't allow units on the first floor, which appears to have failed in the first vote, to at least clarify that you are recommending units on the second floor so that if and when this goes to the district council, it's, it's clear in the record about, um, about, about where your position is on that. Well. I don't have a problem. The first motion failed. I don't have a problem with it on the second floor. That's a compromise, um, and, and 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 it allows all that whole first floor for retail. But I'm not a motion maker. So I'll, I'll just make a motion to adopt essentially the language of Commissioner Washington before, but in, instead of not having it on the first floor, to allow it on the second floor upward. And then I would also ask that, that staff include that um, in the, the staff report because it's it's not quite obvious on, on page 11. I think this would fall under B1. 
um, if you if you go to the DSP criteria that we're looking at, and um, I think it was page 11. It, yeah, page 11 talks about um, V1 height scale and massing standard. Um, I think we should probably include something in there to to allow or to, to say that we would encourage the residential from the second floor up. Um, and then also, um, it, there, there is some language in that part C that says the proposed building exceeds the maximum height of four stories. So I, I would like that to be clarified um, in the staff report because I would be supportive, like I mentioned earlier, for this to go upwards. Um, I'm totally supportive of that around Metro. If you wanted to do it more than six stories and then we're gonna go up to the 10 if that's the actual limit, um, I would be fine with that um, and and allowing that to happen. That's why I voted against the first motion because I would like this, the building envelope to go up to the street and then you could tuck the parking in behind there and I'm fine with the trade-off being a higher building height or anything like that to make the profits work. I think that's how you come up with better developments in this county. Um, but for this particular that motion, go ahead and clarify the residential is on the second floor and upwards. Um, and then clarify that in the findings within the staff report. And then also put in there something about we would also be supportive of, um, or staff would be supportive of going up to the maximum um, within that area beyond the six stories up to 10. Madam Chair. Yes. Uh, this, is, this is David Warner again, Principal Counsel. Uh, the re reason I brought that up is that the staff report says on page 10 that when you amended GSP 06001, one that you approved an amendment to the list of allowed uses to permit dwelling units above the first floor of a building containing commercial uses and the district council affirmed that that's why I brought that up so you may have already done so but staff can confirm that so you're saying that this motion may not have been necessary well, that's just what the staff report says I did okay. not see what okay you that's fine okay that's fine but report. okay well that's fine all right um, we have a motion. Let me just say this. Um, some of that could have been addressed. Some of what, what Commissioner Dwarner um, could have addressed, wanted to be addressed, could have been addressed via um, a continuance to, to look into some of these other matters. We didn't have that request. Um, um, so here, so we are where we are right now. Um, but you know, and, and your motion was a little bit longer, Commissioner Dwarner. Is, let me find out if there's a second. I'll second it. Okay, seconded by Commissioner Geraldo. I just want to make sure I'm really clear on this because all, all I really wanted to do was support um, res, residential from the second floor up. Yeah, and, and I, I definitely want to send that signal, but if I don't want the district council to come back and say that this building has to be limited at six stories. Okay, I, that's fine. If, if it's allowed to go up to 10, I want I would I would like the applicant to have that ability to do that if, if they if they can. Okay, so you're I just agree, providing the option. I okay. Agree with that. I agree with that as as what well, as well, uh, Madam Chair. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? All in favor of the motion, indicate by saying aye. Uh, Ma Madam Vice aye. Chair, Madam Vice aye. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, that was aye. Aye. Okay, uh, Commissioner Washington. Yes. Commissioner Washington. Yeah, uh, no, I don't support it. Okay, Commissioner Geraldo. I support it. Aye. Okay, Commissioner Dorner. Aye. Uh, and I vote aye. Uh, so that's four one. Motion carries four one. All right. Now is the time we we have like five minutes or, or less than ten minutes to spare. We have to go to our new number. Okay, I'm going to make sure that every does every. I'm going to go through everyone on this next case to make sure that you have the number. It's pretty much the same people, I think. Um, except for Mr. Severs, I am present. And Ms. Connor, you you have the new number. I do. Okay, Ms. Mr. Hatcher. Present. Uh, you, but you have the new number, Mr. Schneider. Mr. Schneider, and maybe okay, Mr. Masog. Yes, I have it. Okay, Mr. Cook. Mr. Cook. Mr. Koretsky. I mean, it's Ms. Koretsky, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know. I don't have Stephanie Farrell. I don't know if she, if they're on the second case, too, or, or, or Jignesh uh, Patel. Um, Mr. Ferguson, I guess. And then um, um, I, think that con I think that concludes the applicants, people. Mr. Hurd? 
Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Yes, Madam Chair, I have the new number. Okay. So can we take a break before we go to the new number? Can, can we resume at like at at um, in twenty minutes, um, five forty? Okay. I'm good. Does that work for everybody? Okay. Thank yes, that's good. Yes. Thank you. Yes, okay. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. Is back in session. Make sure your mics are off. I'm going to check and make sure we have all the participants. So is everyone hearing that echo? Okay. I'm going to go with, go down the list. Tom Severs. Present. Sherry Connor. Present. Chris Hatcher. Chris Hatcher. Present. Okay. Um, um, I don't know if Chuck Schneider's on. Chuck Schneider. Tom Mason. Present. Thank you. Glenn Cook. He's, he's having some technical issues with his phone. Um, I have him on my cell phone, and I can certainly bring my receiver up to his phone. Okay, that's, that's Mr. Hatch, Mr. Hatcher. Okay, all right. Yeah, Mr. Um, Chris Hatcher, yes. Okay. Um, is it Irina uh, Koretsky? Um, m m Mr. Um, Hatcher, are any of your other folks from item uh, 11 on this case as well? Anyone whose name I did not call, Mr. Ferguson? Stephanie Farrell is here. Okay. Okay. Well, you definitely are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Ferguson? Mr. Ferguson? Is he needed, Mr. Hatcher? Likely not. No, ma'am. Okay. So that's, that's all for your team? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. Um, Mr. Hurd? Uh, yes, good evening. Okay, I'm good, here. Thank you. Good evening. Okay. Um, uh, David Warner? I'm here, Madam Chair. Thank you. Ms. Borden? Deborah's here. Okay. And we have the um, planning director. Okay, we're good to go. All right, Mr. Sievers. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. Oh, I'm Madam sorry. Chair. Wait a minute. I'm oh. sorry. I want to make sure I talk about the evidence that's in here. Um, we we also have the evidence from um, some of these the items that we were were submitted into the record for item 11 were also submitted into the record for item 12, and they include um, um, Mr. Mr. Hurd's letter of April 1st, 2020. Also, the um, the the letter from David Warner to the um, chair regarding um, um, 4-8-2020. Um, it's a legal memoranda. We have three letters of support. The letter from Capitol Heights, uh, dated February 20, 2020, and the February 27, 2020 letter of support from IRHSCA. And the petition of support, again, I will tell you that petition were only accepted into the record whatever, for whatever limited value it may have. It seems like some people are in support, which is fine, but we are not going to let the number of people signed up on there influence us in any way. That is um, deemed um, acting by plebiscite, and plebiscite um, is not permissible in, in these administrative hearings. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry. Now, um, if we can go ahead, that'd be great. Okay, thank Mr. you. Uh, okay. I was going to make reference to those Okay. anyways. Uh, so, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I am Thomas Sievers, Senior Planner with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. Before starting, staff would like to point out two additional items of backup submitted, one being a letter of opposition from Mr. Bradley Hurd dated April 1st, 2020, and the other being letters of support submitted by the applicant. These items were received prior to 10 a.m. yesterday. They were entered into the record and published online for viewing by the public. 
It is also noted that two additional letters and an email of opposition dated December 21st, 2019 and January 10th, 2020 and January 11th, 2020 were submitted by Mr. Bradley Hurd prior to the publishing of the staff report and are also included in the backup, which is published online. Item number 12 on the agenda is a reconsideration hearing of the merits for Commons at Addison Road Metro, parcel A, 4 dash 05068. The subject request is for the reconsideration of condition 17B of PGCPB resolution number 06-37, which is related to the denial of a left turn to and from the site along Addison Road. Slide two, please. Uh, the site is located in the western part of Prince George's County within planning area 75A and Council District 7. Slide three, please. More specifically, the site is located in the southwest quadrant of the intersection of MD 214, Central Avenue, and Addison Road. Slide four, please. The subject site is located in the commercial shopping center CSC zone. Slide five. The aerial photograph shows the subject site and surrounding properties and roadways. Slide six. The site map shows that the topography on the site gradually slopes to the north. Next slide, uh, number seven. The master plan right of way map shows the master plan arterial roadways in the 214 and Addison Road above the site. Slide eight, please. The preliminary plan of subdivision 4 0506H shows the approval consisting of one parcel. A variation for direct access to an arterial roadway was granted via PPS 4 0506H to allow right in, right out access to Addison Road. Given the reconsideration request, additional queuing to the site is now proposed from Addison Road. A revised variation request for access from Addison Road has been supplied as part of the reconsideration. Uh, next slide, number nine. The conceptual layout submitted uh, at the uh, of the preliminary plan of subdivision shows the proposed building and internal circulation of the site with access occurring at Zelma Avenue at the west side of the property and Addison Road at the east side. The applicant requests a reconsideration of condition 17B, which limited access to Addison Road and prohibited any left turn access to and from the site, which the applicant claims was made an error, citing that recommendations for access provided by the Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation and the State Highway Administration at the time of review of the preliminary plan of subdivision only specified that a left turn from the site to Addison Road should be denied. Okay, Mr. Severs, Mr. Yes, Severs, can you stop for a moment? Um, I, I think we, we heard something. I, I need to make sure that one of our commissioners um, can hear. We um, Someone here notified us. Okay. So just just hold tight for a minute, okay? Okay. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Madam Chair, uh, yes. he's he logged off and is going to log back in. Okay. This is Commissioner you. Washington. Okay, so just give him you. a couple of minutes. Thank I think. you. He just got back. I don't know if you want to check to see okay, his audio. Can, can we see? Um, cause that, because he's apparently he's talking via this um, website to our, our technician, and they're notifying us that he's trying to get back on. Okay. So, Commissioner Dorner, can you hear yet? Yep, I got okay. audio back now. Okay, Thanks. thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so, Mr. Sievers, um, well, did you hear any of his presentation? Okay. All right, that, Mr. Sievers, he, he hadn't covered very much. So, Mr. Sievers, can you just start again? I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, would you like me to start on the conceptual layout? No, I want you to go back because Commissioner Dorner did not hear the, your presentation. Oh, okay, the, the whole thing. Okay. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the board. For the record, I am Tom Sievers, Senior Planner with the Subdivision and Zoning Section. 
Before starting, staff would like to point out two additional items of backup submitted, one being a letter of opposition from Mr. Bradley Hurd, dated April 1st, 2020. You know what, Mr. Seamers, I didn't mean that part, just with the substance. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, I'll go from preliminary plan. If we can go to number eight, please. That is the meat of this. Thank you. Uh, slide eight, the preliminary plan of subdivision 4-05068 shows the approval consisting of one parcel. A variation for direct access to an arterial roadway was granted via PPS 4-05068 to allow right-in, right-out access to Addison Road. Given the reconsideration request, additional queuing to the site is now proposed from Addison Road. A revised variation request for access from Addison Road has been supplied as part of the reconsideration. Next slide, number eight, or nine. Uh, the conceptual layout submitted uh, shows preliminary plan of, or, uh, of preliminary plan of subdivision shows the proposed building and internal circulation of the site with access occurring at Zelma Avenue at the west side of the property and Addison Road at the east side. The applicant requests a reconsideration of condition 17B, which limited access to Addison Road and prohibited any left turn access to and from the site, which the applicant claims was made in error, citing that recommendations for access provided by the Prince George's County Department of Public Works and Transportation and the State Highway Administration at the time of review of the preliminary plan of subdivision only specified that a left turn from the site to Addison Road should be denied. Those memorandums are provided in the backup to this reconsideration along with two supplemental traffic analyses as supporting evidence for the request. Staff found that the applicant's request is justified and that there would be no detrimental impacts from the proposed access. It should also be noted that approval of this request will have no effect on the proposed DSP because queuing from Addison Road to allow left turn movement into the site occurs within the public right of way. Subdivision and zoning staff recommends that the planning board adopt the findings and approve the reconsideration of condition 17B as found in resolution PGC PB number 06-37 for the commons at Addison Road Metro Parcel A 4-05068, subject to the revised condition contained in the staff report. This concludes staff's presentation. Okay, let me see if there's any questions of Mr. Sievers at this time. Uh, Madam Vice Chair? No questions at this time. Commissioner Dorner? No, ma'am. Commissioner Washington? No questions. Uh, Commissioner Geraldo? I have none. Mr. Hurd? No questions. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm with Mr. Hatcher? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Your case. Uh, Let's, okay. For the record, my name is Chris Hatcher with Lurch Early and Brewery here in back the applicant, 6301 Central Avenue. I'd, again, uh, similar to the DSP, I'd like to thank staff uh, as well as. We'll get into it. Okay. As some, well somebody's as, microphone uh, is still on. Holders that have been that have been involved through this process. Um, you know, it's been uh, quite exciting to try to bring this, this vertical mixed-use building to this location. Uh, as stated by staff, on January 9, the board granted the waiver of the rules and reconsideration uh, in an effort to bolster uh, that record, uh, which you did grant. We did provide some supplemental information. Uh, unless the board has some specific questions about that supplemental information, I think we just uh, focus on the substance of the matter. Uh, I'd like to focus on the substance, and you have. I, I would like for you to address your. Um, yeah, yeah. You you made your request um, for reconsideration, and uh, and and, and you, your grounds. You had fraud, mistake. Uh, not fraud, but you had mistake and inadvertence, I believe. Um, another good cause. Another good cause. Yeah. Okay. So if you can if you can continue with the substance, it's your it's your burden. Right. So the applicant's team has coordinated with both SHA and DPI uh, about this possible left turn lane from Addison onto Parcel A, uh, particularly through its transportation engineer. Uh, the traffic group uh, did an, uh, a queuing analysis and a median study and submitted those documents into the to the to the regulating agencies. I believe both those analysis were reviewed. Um, uh, well, were submitted into the record as well as reviewed by DPI and SHA. And based on that analysis, SHA and DPI both submitted letters 
which are also included into this record, uh, saying in one instance that they saw no issue with it, and the other instance that they, uh, through the approval of the stormwater, the, to one of the concept plans that they did indeed approve it. Um, all this relevant information is contained in the backup, but we are certainly willing uh, to uh, elaborate on it um, if, if necessary. Uh, overall, with that, uh, the applicant requests that this variation um, be approved concurrently with this reconsideration request, um, and the and the applicant respectfully requests that the planning board adopt the findings of facts and the conclusions of law and approve this re reconsideration of the planning board and amend findings nine, nine and thirteen in condition seventeen B. I, I want to know if Glenn is available. Uh, Glenn, are you? Can you? Can you speak? Um, I'm here. Okay, Mr. Cook. Um, so, do you, do you have a specific question for him, or you just want him to to provide his testimony? Uh, I I want him to provide the test. I want him to to the extent that he thinks it's necessary, elaborate on the testimony that he submitted into the record okay. as justification um, for in support of this. And, and, and some of the process that you went through and, and the ultimately the findings. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. This is Glenn Cook with the traffic group. And as Mr. Backer said, we, we conducted a study to determine the concern about the access from Addison Road was that cars that were trying to make a left into our site would block the northbound traffic along Addison Road that was turning onto Maryland 214. So we conducted traffic counts of the traffic out there. We did queuing studies to see how far the cars queued up at Maryland 214. And what we found was that the queues waiting to turn left on the Maryland 214 would not block this entrance. There are two left turns out there today, two left turn lanes. So what we did was we shortened the one left turn lane so that we would be able to create a left turn into our entrance. And what the number showed was we could get the left turn lane into our site and it would not impact the northbound queuing along Addison Road. And the benefit to having that entrance is if there was not a left turn into the site from northbound Addison Road, people would either have to go up to the 214 intersection and make a U-turn, which isn't recommended, or they would have to make a left on 214, circle around the block, and come in from the, Zel the Selma entrance. And at that time, we had had some discussions with the neighbors, and they were concerned about the amount of traffic that they would be getting on Selma. So we explored, we did, a, did the study, submitted it to DPI and to the State Highway Administration, and they both concurred with our findings that they had no problems with the left turn into our site. They did not want a left turn out of the site, and we agreed with them on that, but they had no problem whatsoever with the left turn into our site. So, I guess that's basically what we've done, and the fact that we've got concurrence from the public agencies. Okay. Um, um, thank you, Mr. Cook. Um, is that it for you, Mr. Hatcher, right now? Uh, I guess, Madam Chair, and just to, to say that that directly goes to a few of the required findings associated with the variation petition that's contained in the record. Um, I, yeah. All of our comments related to that are already contained in the letter, but we are okay. certainly uh, we okay. There some there's some. Everybody else needs to turn their mic off. I'm sorry that you just checked. Is, is that Whitney? Uh huh. Miss Chellis. Miss Chellis. 
We need other people to turn their mics off. Okay. Who's that? I think they're. Oh. I think they're. I think they have another meeting or something. Whitney. Whitney. Thank you. Okay. Can we go, Mr. Hatcher? Yes, Madam Chair. Okay. So that that was pretty much it for you at this time. Yes, Madam Chair. Okay, um, Mr. Masov, did you have anything to add for us? Actually, Madam Chair, uh, Tom Masov of Transportation Planning Section, I do need to remark that uh, adding this left turn into the site would not result in inadequate operations at the uh, intersection of Maryland 214 and Addison Road. Uh, we did include that analysis in our recommendation. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Masog. Um, uh, does the board have any questions uh, of Mr. Cook or Mr. Masog? Vice Chair Bailey? No, not at this time. Commissioner Washington? Not at this time, Madam Chair. Commissioner Dorner? No, ma'am. Commissioner Geraldo? Nothing right now, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Mr. Hurd, do you have any questions? Uh, I don't have questions for um, those two witnesses. I, I obviously have a presentation, but oh, okay. I'm not there yet. Okay, all right. Not a, not a, not a PowerPoint, just, just remarks. Okay. All right. So if if they're, if they're if you're finished with your case, your presentation, Mr. Hatcher. Okay, Mr. Hurd. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening again, Thanks. Bradley Hurd, for the record. Um, uh, essentially, um, so what we have here is um, the reconsideration for uh, one condition in this uh, subdivision plan regarding <coughs> turning in and out of the uh, Addison Road access point. Um, so that's the condition that uh, the applicant wants to have reconsidered. Um, I think it's fairly apparent from the previous uh, case that there are several other conditions regarding subdivision matters that I would like um, to have reconsidered as well. Um, but the problem is this reconsideration petition is coming 14 years and not 14 days um, after the decision, uh, which is the time frame that's required under the planning board's rules of procedure. So I don't have a quarrel with um, the substantive testimony raised, and had it been raised within 14 days of the planning board's subdivision decision in 2006, it might be relevant uh, for purposes of reconsideration. So with that being said, the um, concerns that I have uh, in opposition to this um, preliminary reconsideration, preliminary plan reconsideration, are all basically set out in my January 11th, 2020 correspondence, um, which was in the backup materials but they're really just four simple points. I'll go through them quickly because that's really all I have to say uh, regarding this subdivision matter. The first is um, that the, the board's rules require the reconsideration to be brought um, by the applicant. The applicant was not a party of record to the originary, uh, the original preliminary plan proceeding, therefore has no standing to request reconsideration of the 2006 decision. The second point is that this request, as I said before, is being submitted 14 years and not 14 days after the planning board's final decision. Uh, the planning board's rules of procedure require reconsiderations to occur within 14 days of the decision. Um, and uh, according to binding um, Maryland case law, um, the uh, procedural regulations relating to reconsideration in a contested case at least cannot be waived 
suspended or disregarded. And that case is MNC PPC versus Friendship Heights, 57 Maryland at 69. That's a 1983 case. And at least as, um, as recently as this morning, it was still a good case law in Maryland. Um, the third point is that this petition, this reconsideration is based on matter and materials and traffic studies and conclusions that were not in the record in connection with the original preliminary plan proceeding 14 years ago. These are new studies, uh, newly reconsidered facts, all of which are outside of the record um, that was developed in an administrative case. So these are all inappropriate for reconsideration. And finally, as a practical matter, uh, the preliminary plan in 2006 has been superseded because there is a final subdivision plat filed in the land records of Prince George's County. Um, uh, so that subdivision plat is the document. And if you want to you want to reconsider a final subdivision, a platted subdivision, you need to file a resubdivision petition. Resubdivision petitions um, are filed routinely just to remove a condition in a platted plan. This is no different. Um, so that's the substance of the legal argument. The implications of the argument, as I stated before, um, in the other case, there are a lot of things that have occurred over the past 14 years that are worthy of reconsideration in the context of the subdivision plan. Um, this uh, one left-hand turn issue that the developer wants to reconsider is perhaps one of the things that needs to be considered, but there is a million others, like the connection to Zelma Avenue, um, to Central Avenue, the street lighting, um, all of the stuff that we talked about before. Okay. So it has practical implications, but there's a legal barrier to this planning board considering a reconsideration 14 years after the preliminary plan has been decided. And uh, that's the substance of my of my argument, and I'd be happy to answer questions if you have any in that regard. I do have a question for you. So typically, there um, typically we try to do our uh, reconsiderations closer in time when when that happens, because based on a mistake or some fraud, mistake, surprise, inadvertence, or other uh, or other good cause. Every now and then, something happens and and um, that causes someone not to be able or an applicant to not to be able to live up to a condition so my question for you is sometimes a, a condition of the preliminary plan is the applicant must make a certain transportation improvement um, and then some years down the road the state highway administration um, determines that's not the where this road is going to go or uh, and and therefore the applicant is stuck with a condition that they cannot live up to what would you do in that situation when, if the person came in for reconsideration 12 years down the road when the State Highway Administration changed um, their route? I think if um, the State Highway, I, I think the principle, Madam Chair, um, is unfortunately a hard and fast principle to the extent that it's a contested case. I mean, if there's nobody on the other side um, who's raising an issue with regard to the reconsideration, I guess it's kind of like a tree falling in the forest. Nobody is really there to, <laughs> to see a problem with it. And I understand that those kind of things probably happen they with some degree of regularity uh, before the board. Um, but there is, there is um, as I so said, binding case law to the effect that the planning board is not permitted in a contested case to consider, um, to, to alter its procedural regulations because they have they have, and the rationale for that is clear, and it's clear even in this case, they have real-world consequences to an opposing party. Um, and you, and were, you, were you an opposing party in, in, in um, 2006? I'm sorry? Were you an opposing party in 2006? Uh, no, I was not, but that's, that's, I didn't even live in Maryland in 2006, okay. to be honest, Madam Chair. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so, I mean, this is, this is part of the problem. I mean, this, you know, 
all all during the last um, detailed site plan hearing, you know, I hear from legal and from the applicant, um, some members of the board that we're just not allowed to think about these things because they're subdivision matters. Um, and the subdivision decision is 14 years old. And now 14 years later, the applicant wants to consider one tiny thing in the subdivision. Um, but there's other things that are relevant for reconsideration and other things um, uh, that have taken place in the intervening years that deserve to be considered in the context of the subdivision plan. And so it's just, it, it's a matter of fairness to all sides. It's a matter of practicality because again, this particular applicant did not own the property 14 years ago. Um, it wasn't even in legal existence in Maryland 14 years ago. Um, this is a this is a property owner who's you know subsequent to the transaction that is bound just like everybody else is um, by the previous subdivision um, determination to the extent it's relevant. Mike, so I. I heard so that's, that's I, I heard those things, but you said, in so much of the case law, um, MNC PPC versus Prenship Heights, um, that you can't reconsider um, um, beyond the 14 days, particularly in a contested case. So this is reconsider reconsidering a plan that was approved in to, in, in the contested in in 20 in 2006, and I was wondering about the contested case in 2006. Um, and number one, number two. I understand your arguments. I wrote them down here, and plus you you are you detailed them, so I'm o I'm okay with that. And I'll have counsel address them. Um, but I do think there are some situations that come to light later, and and, and I think in in the in the question, the hypothetical I asked you, because we do see that from time to time, where an app when, where a preliminary plan was approved, and subsequently um, something happens that makes fulfilling one condition or two conditions an impossibility through no fault of their own. And I, I do think in that situation we, we would be allowed to reconsider, but I'll turn to our counsel to address some of these issues and whether the fact that there's a, a, a different applicant in this case um, and whether the, pe uh, the preliminary plan of subdivision was superseded by the final plat and with, if we have the ability to consider reconsider um, um, beyond the 14 days and um, also I wanted to find out from you it sounds to me like you don't really have that your your objection is procedural that it's not the substance of this one condition 17 is that correct um, I guess uh, I guess it's more fair to say I'm agnostic on uh, the left-hand turn issue um, uh, as, as long as it could be done Safely, I'm more um, concerned with, you know, like how else we would treat that um, that drive-in location. For instance, should there be a crosswalk there, um, along with the along with the turning uh, point, so that so that somebody could uh, cross the street at that point. Um, particularly if they're using the metro garage across the street, um, there should be a crosswalk there too. I mean, things like that. I'm more concerned about. I'm agnostic if the turn into there could be done safely. Um, uh, you know, it, it may be something that's worthy of reconsideration, but again, if, you know, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. You need to reconsider a, a variety of things with regards to this preliminary plan. Okay. Mr. Warner or Ms. Uh, or Ms. Bert Borden? Uh, yes. Madam Chair, David Warner, Principal Counsel. Unless Deborah is chiming in, but either one of us can answer this question. She can... Uh, add anything that I don't touch upon but um, so the first of all the board has already uh, suspended the rules and granted the reconsideration so there's no discussion before you tonight about whether um, there can be a reconsideration or not you're at the point of discussing the substantive issue whether um, you want to grant this change to the preliminary plan okay Ms. Ms. Borden can you elaborate Yes. Um, so uh, I believe Mr. Herbert argued that um, because it's been 14 years, that somehow has some bearing on this. And unfortunately, it really doesn't because the rules of procedure are very clear that you can suspend your rules um, 
for uh, showing a good cause, which you already have, and that you can decide to do a reconsideration. Um, while this doesn't happen every day, it does happen. And this is not the first and probably won't be the last time that the board does this because because of the, you know, what happened in 2006, the, the housing crash, the district council has extended a lot of preliminary plans um, over these intervening years, over the, this last 10 or so years. So we have a lot of preliminary plans that are relatively old, um, but that are still in play. And there's really nothing we can do about that. That you know, it's the law. The, the district council made that decision, and so now we have all these preliminary plans that have not been built out yet because of various issues, you know, market issues as well as economic issues. And we have people who are still trying to build these projects, um, but they need to make adjustments. And and in this case, the adjustment is being made pursuant to what the applicant is is claiming is a mistake. That, that there was never any support in the original record to have a prohibition for both the right in, I'm sorry, the left out of the site as well as the left into the site. They, they're making that argument. That is the substance of the argument, and that's the reason why they've, they've done another traffic study. That's the reason why they've reached out to the operating agencies to get their take on it. This is not unusual. This happens, uh, and part of the reason that it's happening fairly regularly um, these days is because of the age of these preliminary plans. They have been extended and extended and extended again, and it's a bit unusual, but it is what it is. We don't have any control over that. So uh, the case that Mr. Hurd has cited is uh, the Friendship Heights case, and that's a... Um, while this is a preliminary plan of subdivision, the Friendship Heights case is actually a site plan, and it's not a reconsideration issue uh, in that case. The, the case is about uh, basically a site plan that showed a ring road that neighbors didn't want going through their neighborhood. And they were fighting over uh, whether they had standing um, to make their argument and whether there was jurisdiction uh, for the, the court to hear their appeal. Uh, that was, th this case has nothing to do with that case. Uh, we're talking about a subdivision here. We're talking about a reconsideration of a single condition of a subdivision. Thank you, Ms. Gordon. I, I, hold on one second. I just, I just want to say something to Mr. Hurd. Um, Mr. Hurd, um, I understand your uh, argument about the, particularly about the 14 years. As Ms. Borden indicated, the council has extended these these uh, preliminary, the life of preliminary plans. They had a finite life, but they have been extended and extended, um, largely due to the uh, crash earlier, uh, the, the economic downturn starting in 2008. Um, but I w would agree with you. The further in removed in time we are from the action. Um, Typically, we wouldn't want to uh, reconsider unless there's some good reason or a good cause, and and because um, we shouldn't do it willy nilly. I believe I, I concur with you on that, and I believe that we shouldn't do it willy nilly. Uh, there has to be some some plausible reason, and in this case, as Ms. Borden indicated, we have something that is removed in time, which is sometimes uncomfortable for us. Um, but we do have a reason here that a mistake was made. Um, and and uh, and then you have the um, the agencies in question, the State Highway Administration and the Department of Public Works, indicating that that um, that this is an appropriate um, um, turn at this point, and and we don't know where that why that prohibition was there. Um, I do want Ms. Borden to address the issue of um, the applicant having no standing, and that and and. Um, and the, and and the being superseded by the final plat. And, and Madam Chair, I did have a couple of rebuttal points, just when whenever the appropriate time. Is. Sure, sure. Okay, Miss Borden. Yes, and to that point, um, the applicant is always referred to in in all of our application materials, in all of our approvals, as the applicant, their heirs, successors, and and assigned. And assigned. That is a major, major part of having a development approval because if it only applies 
to the specific individual or entity who actually at that moment is 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 going forward with the applicant with the application then basically all they have to do is sell the project to somebody else and all of our conditions of approval would go away well obviously that's not the way it works <laughs> and so anytime an applicant comes to us for any kind of development approval it's always the applicant their heirs successors and assigns that are subject to the conditions of the approval and that that get the benefit of the approval as well okay uh, mr. Hurd uh, yes you may go ahead okay just a couple of quick points um, and I made uh, the first of these points in my um, December 21st letter 2019 but the, um, with respect to the timing of the reconsideration decision um, I did not even learn uh, that the reconsideration matter was before the board until after the board had made the decision because I did not get notice of, uh, of, the, of the petition. And the response I got back from Ms. Connor was that, uh, well, you weren't a party of record to the original proceeding, even though I was obviously a party of record um, to this uh, site plan case. Um, and that is when I initially uh, pointed out to, um, to Ms. Connor uh, that uh, nobody was nobody involved in this was a party of record. As I said, uh, Banneker Ventures was not uh, was not a party of record. Um, I mean, they're still sending these notices to Dr. Bay, uh, who was the party of record at the time. Um, but they, you know, so so if if Banneker Ventures can make the argument, um, then the party, you know, the party record issue and the notice issue is a, is, a, is an issue. Um, but secondly. Um, just to, to clarify, to give you a pinpoint site to that Friendship Height case, uh, the pinpoint is at pages 80 to 81 of that case, and it specifically addresses um, um, the ability of the board. And the case involves, by the way, this very agency. Uh, so uh, it, it is about the ability of the board to waive, suspend, or disregard their procedural regulations. So I think it's directly applicable um, to the matter. But again, I don't want to belabor the point. This is strictly um, a legal opposition to this proceeding. Um, I think a meritorious one. Um, but the board is obviously um, has, has the matter before it. OK. Um, thank you, Mr. Hearn. Um, um, I don't know if Ms. Borden, if you have anything to say in response or Mr. Warner, and, and then also we'll turn to Mr. Hatcher. David Warner, Principal Counsel. Um, with regard to the, the question of notice, I'll just um, note for the record that uh, Mr. Hurd's December 21st letter was part of the record on January 9th. And that um, my understanding is he became a person of record in this subdivision matter on January 13th. Okay. So he would not have been entitled to notice uh, under the board's procedures. Okay. Uh, Ms. Borden, did you have anything to add? Uh, I was just looking at the case. And again, you know, you have to be sort of careful when you're, when you're citing cases because, you know, the, the issue that they were discussing on page 80 to 81 was that they, you know, one of the parties was arguing they didn't need to have a hearing. And and this is not this case. I mean, this does, it doesn't apply. And of course, I'm very familiar with the case. I, I am familiar with all of the cases that we have where the commission was a party. And I, I don't really see how this case is, is saying that we um, can't follow our own rules of procedure that allow you to, sp to suspend the rules. Um, in order to have to handle a, a, a reconsideration, um, yeah, I mean, it, because, you know, it's just it, I do believe that the, the the facts in the case that that Mr. Hurd is citing are quite different from the facts in this case. They were trying to um, suspend rules without having any sort of 
uh, ability in their rules of procedure to do so. This is baked into our rules of procedure, and we're simply following them. So I, I don't agree that this is any big problem, and I don't agree that this case applies to this situation. Okay, um, Ms. Mr. Hatcher. Uh, Chris Hatcher, for the record, I, I don't think I can elaborate more on this than Mr. Warner and Mrs. Borden have already done. I will say that, um, you know, the DPI is supportive, substantively DPI is supportive, SHA is supportive. We have traffic analysis that, that say there's no harm. Uh, even, even Mr. Hurd is agnostic, uh, and we just respectfully request that the, uh, that the board adopt the findings of fact and conclusions of law and approve the reconsideration of the planning board and amend findings 9 and 13 in condition 17B and approve the amended variation petition. Okay. Um, okay. Does the board have any questions of anyone? Madam Vice Chair? No question at this time. Um, Commissioner Washington? No questions, Madam Chair. Commissioner Dorner? Yeah, I have a legal clarification question. Um, so who, who does have standing? I, obviously the applicant or their heirs. Um, but does anyone who's not directly related to the, the parcel have um, standing to actually ask for reconsideration? I, my, my hunch is that, yeah, the applicant, their heirs, and then parties of record in the original case. But if you become a party of record in subsequent cases in, in years later, does that allow you to have reconsideration standing and to call up the um, parts of the case in, in, from prior years? Commissioner Dorn, this is Jacob Borden. Um, the, the, the people who can ask for reconsideration um, include the staff, the commissioners, and the applicant. That's it. The parties of record are entitled to notice of it. They are not entitled to request a reconsideration. Um, they're, they're simply entitled to, to, to be aware of it. Um, yeah, but, it, but the, the, um, the appellate rights and um, those rights go to aggrieved parties only, so you have to be within sight, sound, or smell of the project in order to appeal either a, a preliminary plan or a site plan. So, you know, those rights are, are separate from getting notice. You know, you, you, the, the bar is very low for the right to get notice. You just have to raise your hand and you can get notice of something. Um, but then appealing something, you really have to be an aggrieved party and that has a legal definition. Um, and then the reconsideration issue uh, for our for purposes of our rules is, is limited to staff and commissioners and the applicant. Okay. Hold on. Uh, Hold on. Somebody's correcting me. Hold on. Let me see yeah. if I'm I'm correct. Let me go to the policy and make sure that I'm correct about that. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Okay, we're going to check on that. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Okay, meanwhile, I'm not, can I, Commissioner Geraldo, do you have any questions? No questions. Okay, uh, I just want to make sure, and also it seems like somebody else's mic was on. While we're, um, I guess I, when I entertain, when we have a motion, I, I do have some comments. Okay, I stand corrected. It is, uh, the reconsideration may be requested, it says, and I'm reading it yes. uh, directly from our rules of procedure, yes. a request to reconsider decision of the planning board may be made by a party of record within 14 calendar days after the date of notice of the final decision. And then... Um, That's what I wanted to get at, as a party of, uh, so any party of record. Can party of record, yes, yes. I stand correct. And we, and we have had that. And also the board can, uh, the board member can do it. Right, and then so it also has voted with the majority. the staff member or planning board... Uh, Person who voted in the, in the majority, who voted with the majority. Exactly. Right. 
Okay, Mark. thank you. Okay. Um, Dan, please. I'd like to, thank you. I'd like to entertain a motion, please. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Washington, uh, and I move that we adopt the analysis, findings, and recommendations presented by staff and, improve, and approve the reconsideration of preliminary plan 4 05068, uh, also related to uh, PGCPV resolution number 06 37 to amend finding 9 and 13 uh, as set forth in the transportation planning memorandum dated uh, March 16, 2020 and condition 17B as outlined in staff's report. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Com uh, Vice second. Chair Bailey. Commissioner Washington made the motion seconded by Vice Chair Bailey. Under discussion, um, I, there's some things I have to say here. Mr. Hurd, you made a, a statement earlier um, that perhaps we're not used to this type of extensive opposition. And while it is not um, a regular thing, um, we do have it, and, 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 and um, we do have it a lot, and, it, and it's, um, you're right. Uh, it, it's your right to do so. And, um, and I, I want to say that your presentations today were thorough and clearly um, passionate, and, and your presentation, along with the, the applicants, everybody has handled themselves professionally and passionately, um, and we've had a, a, in this particular case, somebody's mic is on, we have a successor applicant and a successor attorney um, in this particular case. Uh, so um, the reason I bring up ha having a successor attorney in particular is that um, I'm asking, and I'm sure our board will concur, um, depending on how this motion goes, but regardless, that you do have an, a, 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 a person here who's clearly passionate, knowledgeable, and professional in, in his presentation. Um, while we are in this COVID environment where we can't have meetings, you did say you had conference calls, but I'm going to ask that that communication continue because I, some of this there may have been some give and t or, or there may have been an opportunity for more give and take, particularly on item 11. Um, and, and I just would ask that you stay stay in touch, uh, Mr. Hatcher. We've had you before us. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know how long you've been involved in this case, but it really is good to have good communications with the uh, um, the people, the citizenry who live in the area, and and who have expressed concerns the way Mr. Hurd has. So I would ask that no matter what, that you continue to c engage. Um, even though you were the successor attorney, and continue to engage both uh, um, as passionately as professionally as you both have today. Um, and I, I think that's pretty much all I had to say about that. So we have a motion and a second. Um, is there discussion? Is there discussion? Madam Chair, under discussion? Yes, go ahead. Okay, uh, I would also like to uh, thank Mr. Hurt for, for coming and participating and spending the day with us. <laughs> uh, it, is really <laughs> it is really because of citizens like him that we can do our job and, and his conversation, his, his information makes us better and enhances everything that we have to do. So I really do appreciate him coming today. Thank you. Uh, is, is there any additional mm -hmm. discussion? I just want to extend my, my uh, well wishes to both Mr. Hatcher and Mr. Hurd, for uh, both of whom did uh, excellent presentations. And it says, Commissioner Bailey said, it does make our job uh, easier, uh, makes us think longer and harder, and to try to reach the best decision for the residents. Thank you. And I don't, I, I would agree, except for I don't think it necessarily makes our job easier, but it makes us. Um, delve deeper, and 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 definitely, definitely not easy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but but expand our horizons and consider all, um, lots of different points of view. So I think it's it's extraordinarily helpful. So we we're thankful for that. But but the communication must continue. Um, so Mr. Hurd, Madam I, Chair, yes, Mr. Satcher, this is what happens when two Morehouse men disagree. Oh, that's what happens. Okay. Okay, uh, I didn't know that. Okay, 
Um, <laughs> Too soon. So, um, well put. Uh, but this is, um, we want citizen input, and this is advocacy and citizen input and citizen engagement at its best. So I do want to say congratulations and thank you to, to both of you as we wrap up this very long day. But I do want to say thank you so much. And um, as we, I'll call for the um, vote and then I have one closing comment. So um, um, if there was no additional discussion, um, Madam Vice Chair. I vote aye. Commissioner Washington. I vote aye and I also would like to associate myself with the comments made by my fellow commissioners. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Dorner? Aye, and definitely did on that as well. Um, Commissioner Geraldo? Aye. Um, thank you. The ayes have it. 5-0. Um, okay. Now, um, we've all had a long day. Um, it is imperative that in this particular environment that we take care of ourselves. I'm sure this has been somewhat stressful, particularly trying to do things virtually. It's hard. And it's hard for some of us who are not as tech savvy as others. I will. Re I'm referring to myself. I'm not calling any names. Amen. <laughs> That's amen. Uh, um, I, and so it's all the. Mo I just want to close with saying, thank you to everyone, to our to our uh, participants today, all of our participants today, all of our applicants today, all of our citizens today, all of our planning department today. Our, our chairman's office that I was remiss in and not acknowledging our chairman's office is working so very hard today, uh, not today, but throughout this process. Our um, our tech our tech folks and and Kenny who stepped up and Ryan who's working so very hard for us. Uh, all of us, thank you all for your flexibility, your patience, um, and continuing to propel Prince George's County forward. And I only ask that you stay safe, stay hopeful, stay positive, and we will get through this COVID-19 crisis. Planning board is adjourned. Praise it. Thank you. Thank you.